Good morning, everyone. I'm just gonna do a quick roll call to make sure I know which board members are on. Uh, currently, I have President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, Justin Rice, Dr. Crockett, Hans Dieter Close, and Matt Mason. Are there any other board members on? Presently, you do have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Ashley. All right, so with that, I think I know we're about probably, oh, there we go, 9 a.m. Okay, so we'll, we will go ahead and get started. All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and if we could have the official roll call, please. President Lee. Here. Vice President Kluf. Here. Superintendent Hoffman. Here. Dr. Crockett? Here. Mr. Mason? Present. Ms. Wright? Mr. Swanson? Just got here. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Mr. Ms. Yana? I'm here. President Lee, you have a call. Thank you. Um, and just a few housekeeping rules um, regarding virtual meetings. Board members, please stay muted. And after each agenda item, we will allow for an open discussion and dialogue first. And then Ashley may go through roll, roll call to see if any member has an additional comment or question if needed to ensure each board member is heard. Also, uh, don't forget to please state your name before you speak. Charters on the agenda, please stay muted until the item is considered. We will ask if the charter is available. And if so, the charter can unmute themselves at that time. And the general public is viewing the meeting meeting via a live stream. And so with that, we will go into our superintendent's report. Superintendent Hoffman. President Lee, good morning, everyone. First and early, happy holidays to everyone. I wanna first take a moment to acknowledge the different native lands that we occupy today. My own home sits on them and Hohokam lands. The last few weeks have been incredibly challenging for our schools and communities. As our COVID cases have increased rapidly, this has meant more sense of life in our communities. And unfortunately, this has had a significant impact on our schools while many are making the very difficult choice to return to distance and hybrid learning. Since schools are using different learning models based on their levels of community spread, ADE has collaborated with the county superintendents, the charter board, charter to develop a statewide tracker that identifies which learning model is being used for each school um, distance or in-person instructional models. And it's important to note that by hybrid, we mean that there is any combination of distance or in-person learning and that, um, that all the data on this tracker report may not be 100% complete. The tracker can be found on our ADE COVID-19 website. If your school is not listed or listed incorrectly, the tracker is updated once a month and ADE has been working with stakeholders to collect the next round of data. So please look for updates from the Charter Association and the Charter School Board. I thank all of our schools, all of our educators and community members for, community, for continuing to implement COVID-19 mitigation strategies on school campuses, as well as enforcing the strategies like wearing a mask and social distancing. I know it's not been easy, but it takes all of us working together. Finally, as communities continue to increase, I schools to share the 19 testing locations and quarantine recommendations with families. This information can be found on the Arizona Department of Health Services website. To share a bit of good news, we have something positive to share during these difficult times. Um, as you know, many of our families are engaging in distance learning using virtual or online learning methods. 
And so many of our families are relying on having internet at home. And we know that the digital divide issues have been quite severe here in Arizona, uh, but very thankful that we were able to announce last week a, a new partnership with Cox Communications. Um, Cox promptly responded to our requests to provide low-income families with higher internet speeds via their Connect to Compete program. So this started this past Friday. Um, Cox doubled internet speeds for the program for the remainder of this year. Uh, so this will fulfill our families' needs uh, during this incredibly difficult time. One way to know if a family qualifies for the Compete program is whether they qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, so we, I know in speaking with school leaders that they have made sure that they have internet access. Um, so this, this helps with, with having more adequate internet speeds because we know our, our students are engaging in video coding videos and materials and, and we want them to have that opportunity to engage with their, with their peers and teachers. For families that qualify to compete plan, they can sign up through their phone or um, computer through the website cox.com forward slash C2C. And so any eligible participants who sign up before um, December 31st can receive two months of free service and then they would pay $9.95 a month going forward. So again, it's just really nice to, to take a step in the right direction as we address um, the issues of making sure all of our students can access adequate internet from home. Uh, another announcement is around our virtual job fair. Um, we know this has been a challenging year for our educator workforce. And in addition to the teacher shortage that we've been facing, we know that we have lost many more educators um, due to COVID-19. And um, for those who decided to, to not continue with teaching this year. And um, so we are we in ADE are very committed and prioritized the, with helping our schools with recruitment and retention of our educators. And one way that we do that is through our annual job fair. And this year, the job fair will be virtual. Registration for schools who are interested in participating and looking to hire um, can now register. So you can visit our events page of our ADE website to find more information. I also wanted to provide some updates from yesterday's State Board of Education meeting. Um, this is just a brief update that yesterday, the State Board of Ed approved a resolution which is regarding our state assessments and accountability system. Ultimately, these decisions around assessments will be influenced by policy decision changes from the state legislature or the U.S. education or the new um, president-elect Biden's administration. But the State Board of Education, we've uh, voted unanimously to pass this resolution, uh, which I wanted to highlight the following that um, the support of the resolution, which states that, the, that we prioritize for the state to administer the statewide assessment to all students in the 2021, collect achievement data from the 2021 year, and appropriately report achievement data for the 2021 school year and that the state should not award for the 2021 school year. So while there are still many unknowns about the spring semester and the future of state residents, um, this position has importance that we value putting the data and we consider this to be like, like baseline data in ways that should not be punitive for educators or schools. And additionally, the state board also voted to expand the window for administering the statewide assessment by two weeks. So the new testing window is from April 5th to May 14th um, for grades, uh, for fourth grade through high school grades. Um, the reporting, the reporting back of the scores for these grades will be delayed by two weeks because of the delay, the delay in the testing window. Um, and then for third grade, these, the third grade students would be um, administered during the first couple of weeks of the testing window because there is still a state reporting mandate to have those results by May 5th. So I'm sure there'll be more information um, in the next couple of months. We wanted to make sure that we were doing everything we could, um, our work in ADE, education, to make sure that, that this is, um, the testing window is more flexible and 
um, and really thinking about how the, the next couple of months will continue to be unpredictable. So we just wanted to be prepared for that. So we will continue to stay tuned about the direct legislature and also the direction of the federal government. Thank you, Superintendent Hoffman. I appreciate you um, and that report and just everything that you guys have been doing to support schools and, um, you know, get stuff done quickly. So appreciate that. Um, board members, any questions for the superintendent? Okay. Um, if not, then moving on to the executive director's report. Ashley. Good morning, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and board members. Uh, the only update I have for you for ongoing board actions is that during our last board meeting on November 20th, the board did issue a notice of intent to revoke. And at this time, with regard to uh, Pinnacle Education Kino, we have legal counsel who has already submitted the request for a hearing set before the Office of Administrative Hearings. And we will continue to keep you apprised of that ongoing action. All right, thank you. Okay, up next we have A for Arizona. A for Arizona, um, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself at this time, I believe it's Emily Gullickson. Hi, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman and members of the board. My name is Emily Ann Gullickson. I'm the founder and CEO of A for Arizona. And we are so grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. And Superintendent Hoffman, we're grateful you get to enjoy a second round of our spotlights building off of yesterday's features at the State Board of Education. So here at A for Arizona, we believe that no child should have to wait for a school and a classroom that matches their full potential, which we know is even more urgent uh, this school year. And so our expansion and innovation fund provides seed funding for schools and innovative partnerships to reimagine models and better serve more students in their communities. So together, we're really working on sparking a new generation of innovative and collaborative educational opportunities for students, especially low-income students that are already increasingly in demand by Arizona families. Given obviously the rapidly changing conditions of the school year, Governor Ducey was one of the first governors to use Federal CARES Act GEARS funding by leveraging $1 million to fuel innovation in partnership with our expansion and innovation fund. And after the success of our first round of microgrants from this summer, the governor provided an additional 500,000 in GEARS funding in October to support more public small learning communities through our uh, expansion and innovation fund. So we awarded microgrants this summer for 18 community driven proposals throughout five different counties to help Arizona's most vulnerable students and those students in areas that were really hit hardest by COVID-19 to ensure that students had access to an excellent education this school year. And we have had the potential to reach more than 20,000 public school students within this grant cycle. So we're honored to showcase uh, three of these amazing grant recipients today with your board, um, all public charter schools within the ASBCS portfolio. And we're gonna begin first with a talented high school leader, Dr. Carrie Clark, the founder and executive uh, director of Madison Highland Prep and Highland Prep. Thank you, Emily Ann. Good morning, Madam Board President, members of the board and Superintendent Hoffman. The current pandemic has definitely impacted instruction for our learning communities at Madison Highland Prep and Highland Prep Surprise. Fortunately, the expansion and innovation fund grant has enabled us to navigate this crisis with a unique instructional model that I'm happy to share with you today. First, a little bit of, about both of our schools. Madison Highland Prep is a high title one STEM college preparatory school located in central Phoenix. We serve 467 students from grades nine through 12. We're located within the Madison Elementary School District and have a partnership with the district. Highland Prep opened its doors in 2014 and serves a similar population in surprise. Highland Prep has 436 9th through 12th grade students and they have their first senior class this May. Last March, when both schools were forced to go online, we're able to transition from in-person to daily live streamed instruction pretty seamlessly. Our students were already equipped with one-to-one -one technology we utilize digital curriculum resources, and all functions of the school were driven through Canvas, our chosen learning management system. Soon after, we realized that we were gonna to have to figure out how to teach our students who would eventually return to school and to the classroom. And we knew that the, the only way we could execute a hybrid 
was that our teachers would have to teach students both at home and in the classroom at the same time. Throughout the spring, we strategized and I was fortunate to participate in a group of school leaders through A is for Arizona, where we shared ideas, identified possible solutions. When we found out about the expansion and innovation grant opportunity, we were pretty close to having figured out what we wanted to do in terms of how we were gonna deliver our instructional model. The innovation grant was key in helping our schools purchase resources that otherwise would have been a stretch. At the beginning of this school year, we established an enhanced virtual learning environment with increased bandwidth to ensure reliable live stream instruction for every classroom. We had a new virtual server to ensure predictable software access for our school's diverse STEM curriculum. Thanks to the innovation grant, we purchased technology that resulted in our teachers utilizing the Zoom platform for video communication and cutting edge swivel technology for live streaming instruction for each class. Our teachers also use a wireless Mimeo tablet to send information directly to each student's home computer and each classroom's LCD projector simultaneously. This combined technique is highly engaging. The swivel setup has been ex exceptionally helpful in helping our teachers deliver high quality hybrid instruction. For anyone not familiar with the technology, the swivel CX robot rotates to follow the teacher wherever the teacher goes, up and down, left and right. It connects to the multiple markers for audio throughout the room, and it uses a tethered iPad for live streaming. It's easy for teachers to set up and operate on a daily part of their class. We're also able to switch our school's engineering and AutoCAD programs from desktop to web-based versions that enable our students to design 3D models from home and send them to our 3D printers at school. Teachers also send out hands-on tactile resource packets for students participating from home to retrieve from our front office. This uh, may include VEX robotic parts, uh, balsa wood for engineering and architecture, graphs uh, and uh, art supplies. As far as academic progress goes, both schools are within one to 4% of the previous school year's first quarter ELA math and science benchmark data. And we are well on our way for 100% for your college and university acceptance at both campuses. Through the Innovation Fund grant, we are also part of a remote live instruction cohort with three other school systems with diverse models, all working on honing the best practices for better student engagement and student outcomes with remote and hybrid students. We meet once a month to share data, identify what's working, and troubleshoot gaps or uh, identify areas to improve. We continue to gather data, and we look forward to sharing our findings to the support and development of best practices and for others to scale. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anju Mahit, Superintendent of Self-Development Academies. Thank you, Dr. Clark. And good morning, uh, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and members of the board and guests. Thank you for giving Self-Development Academy this opportunity to share with you a unique initiative that was made possible through a grant from A4 Arizona Innovation Fund microgrant. Based on best practices, Self-Development Academy Phoenix, a K through eight school, was established in 2015, purposefully to serve the underserved population of Phoenix. Over 95% of our population qualify for free and reduced price meal, 92% of our population are minority, and a majority of them are Hispanics, and about 40% of our students are English language learners. Low-income students often have numerous significant gaps in their academic performance. Tragically, these disadvantaged students have suffered disproportionately due to COVID-19 and school closures. To address this issue, Self-Development Academy Phoenix has partnered with safe satellite sites and created learning paths where students can participate for free in our online program. We provide student hyper-personalized remote learning and instruction, which includes a specialized assessment program that identifies, targets, and closes academic gaps. During this initial phase, we have partnered with existing childcare to host our newly created learning paths to provide about 40 students a safe place and instructional support during distance learning. As part of the grant, the program also provides training for those individuals who are overseeing the long distance or on a remote learning. And thus, we make this remote, remote learning experience more effective. The second phase of this grant will begin when the school resumes in January. 
with the help of our A for Arizona micro grant, we'll be able to include about 290 students in these learning parts, providing instructional support before and after school when students resume in-person instruction. By opening satellite, satellite sites and learning parts, Self-Development Academy Phoenix addresses the needs of the whole child, academic needs, social and emotional needs, and physical needs. By having small groups of about eight students, we are addressing and making it available for students to interact with their teachers and fellow students. You may wonder, how are we doing? Thus far, we have partnered with three child care centers who qualify for our uh, standards requirement. And beginning with one center at a time, we are providing staff training, access to SDS curriculum, and the supplies, including headphones and supplies for arts and science projects. There are currently 16 students enrolled. Eight of them belong to Self-Development Academy, while other students are uh, in other schools, neighborhood schools. We anticipate that another 20 students will participate in mid-January as we resume in January. Our goal is to include any Arizona student who needs a safe, and supportive learning environment, and not just those limited to Self-Development Academy. Along with satellite sites, we are gearing up to open learning pods in vacant commercial buildings and utilizing unused spaces available at our two campuses, Self-Development Phoenix and Self-Development Glendale. We have learned that innovative programs such as the one we are implementing by definition are unknown. With unknown needs require unknown hours and above that go above and beyond a regular work day. Good things may be fast, but the right thing will provide the highest justice for the underserved. Not that we have known variables, the mood is sanguine, exactly because the solution now shines like hope. Quarter three is when we when the real work begins. Thank you, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, Charter School Board members, and a special thank you to A for Arizona and Emily Ann for making it happen for the underserved population of Arizona. Now I turn this to Jessica to spotlight the amazing work underway in Maryville. Thank you. My name is Jessica Makowski and I am the principal at Western School of Science and Technology. Western School of Science and Technology serves over 500 students in grades seven through 12. Um, we are located in the low income West Phoenix neighborhood of Maryvale. And we have for the past three years had 100% of our seniors graduating on time with post-secondary outcomes. And there was no way we were gonna let this pandemic slow us down. When our students left for spring break last year, I don't think any of us would have predicted that they wouldn't be back on our campus yet. And during that time, our students have become caregivers They've become classroom aides to their younger siblings who are doing their online learning right beside them. And some of them have taken on full-time employment to help out their families. With this new context, we knew we needed to adjust our strategy to continue to meet our goals. Core value, uh, one of our core values at Western is innovation. And we knew our students needed not only a safe space during the day, but a safe space to work in the evenings and on the weekends. And we also wanted to lean into the needs of our community. You cannot transform the educational outcomes of an entire community by yourself. We needed to work together. So we wanted an initiative that we could start that included our neighboring schools, our alumni who are off at college and now coming home to work remotely as well, and our family members. The A for Arizona Innovation Grant has allowed us to offer two opportunities for our students, our alumni, and our community to come together and take on this pandemic as one. The first is Warrior Lab. Warrior Lab is a safe space for students, alumni, and families to come and work in the evenings. They can either come in and use our facility like a library, access to the internet and computers, a safe, warm place that is quiet and easy to work in, or they have access to our tutors. We have two tutors on site at all times who are there to help not only our current students, but our alumni who are reapplying for FAFSA and struggling to keep up with their uh, instruction. 
One of our students, seventh grader Estrella says, Weir Lab has helped me a lot. I have better grades, I've improved skills, and it makes everything a lot less overwhelming. And I think that is a great thing to hear from our students. Our second initiative that uh, the Avery Arizona Innovation Grant allowed us to pursue was Western Plug. This provides access to free, reliable Wi-Fi for all Maryvale students. In the beginning, we reached out to Maryvale High School, Maryvale Preparatory, Sunset Elementary, and other surrounding neighboring schools, offering these services to their students. We provided social media packets, and we are continue to reach out uh, in the upcoming semester to make sure that those resources are available to all. Now, we're not done. The innovation continues. In the upcoming semester, we're going to add a virtual component to our tutoring for our Warrior Lab. As the COVID numbers continue to increase in Maryvale, some of our students are quarantined at home, but still require that additional help in the evenings. We're also gonna add a cool outdoor space to Western Plug for students to come, enjoy, maybe get out of their cars and still access the internet. The grant and these resources have already helped Western to continue to meet our mission. Just yesterday, I heard that our seniors have already received over $600,000 worth of scholarships, and we are excited to see what they continue to do. For um, A for Arizona, we thank you so much for this opportunity. President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and board members, Thank you for allowing us to present, and we would like to offer uh, this time for any questions that you might have for us. Board members, are there any questions? Well, I know I don't have any questions, but wow, <laughs> you guys, um, this is exactly why we have charter schools, um, the innovation, the constantly pursuing, you know, student success and, and family success and alumni success um, is, is incredible. You know, if this pandemic has, has done one good thing, it's been that I really, I truly believe that has sparked um, even more innovation than, than what we've seen in, in years past. And so thank you for staying committed. Just all, you know, all of you, thank you for staying committed to families. Thank you for staying committed to your students, to your staff. Um, it's, it's really just incredible what you guys are doing and it's incredible to just be a part of, be a part of it and hear about it. So thank you so much guys. All right. And so with that, um, we will move on to um, call to the public and we actually received no public comments um, that were submitted or any requests to speak. And so we will move on to um, item H, the consent agenda. Um, is there anybody who needs to uh, take anything, remove anything from the consent agenda or recuse yourself? Okay, if not, is there a motion? President Lee, this is Hans. I move to approve consent agenda, consent agenda items H1, 2, and 3. Thank you, Hans. Is there a second? Second, Carol Crockett. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. And with the roll call, please. Mr. President Aye. Superintendent Hoffman? Aye. Dr. Crockett? Aye. Mr. Mason. Aye. Ms. Trace. Ms. Trace. Mr. Swan. Aye. Mr. Trace. Ms. Yana? Aye. President Lee? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Okay, going to charter amendments. It looks like we have um, just one. And uh, Rachel, you're up. <laughs> Good morning, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and members of the board. Heritage Academy Levine, Inc. has submitted an amendment request to increase the grades served from 712 to 612 for fiscal year 2022. The posted board materials indicate that the charter holder is in financial intervention. 
However, since the posting of the board materials, the charter holder has submitted its fiscal year 2020 audit, and it is now rated as being in good standing on the updated financial dashboard, and the charter holder meets the financial performance expectations at this time. However, the charter holder still does not meet the staff recommendation criteria because it is only at 74% of its current enrollment cap. It should be noted that the charter holder was before the board for an enrollment cap increase from 650 to 750 in September of 2020. I'm available for any questions if you have them. Board members, any questions for Rachel? Okay, if not, is there a representative from Heritage Academy Levine on the line? Hi, President so Lee. Uh, yes, go for it. Yep, you're doing great, sorry. You, you can hear me okay? <laughs> yes. Hey, thanks for having me, President Lee, members of the board. Um, I, I'm not going to restate uh, what was presented for you. Thank you for your service. And uh, looking forward to um, adding a, a sixth grade. This is, this is a community where we were invited to come in. There was a need for um, additional schools. And uh, we were happy to meet that need. And so just as we were invited initially, we've been asked by our families to add this particular grade. So this is really a response. Uh, to the families that we serve and, and we're looking forward uh, to serving them in this capacity. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, uh, but again, uh, thank you again for considering this today. Thanks. And can you just state your name for the record real fast? I'm not sure if uh, we got that. Uh, yes, my name is Jared Taylor. I'm the Perfect. charter representative for Heritage Academy Levine. Thank you so much for doing that. Okay, so um, it's my understanding that it looks like you are green or you would be green if we were re to redo the recommendation now for the financial piece and that you would have met that benchmark for enrollment if we compared it to your original um, enrollment cap of, uh, I believe it was 650 uh, from September. Is that is that correct? correct? You would have been within the 85%, yeah. Um, board members, I don't have any questions. Um, do you have any, does anybody else have any questions? And if not, is there a motion? President Lee, this is Hans. I move based on the information. Okay. I move based on the information contained in the board materials and presented today to approve the request to increase the grade level served by Heritage Academy Levine, incorporated from grades seven through twelve to grades six through twelve, beginning in fiscal year twenty twenty two. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Carol Crockett. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. With the roll call, please. Thanks, President. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Mr. Mason. Aye. Ms. Rice. Mr. Swanson. Aye. Ms. Yana. Aye. President Lee. Aye. Motion passes again. Thank you for being here. Thank you, President. All right. <laughs> okay. Looks like we have one charter renewal of Sage Academy Inc. and presentation by Rachel. Sage Academy Inc. submitted a charter renewal application package on June 24th of 2020 to continue operation of its single school, Sage Academy. Sage Academy serves grades K through 8 in Phoenix with a current enrollment cap of 280. As part of the renewal process, staff conducted a desk review of Sage Academy on November 13th of 2020. During the academic systems review, specific areas of the charter contract are reviewed to ensure a charter holder is in compliance. The only compliance issue that was that one set of governing board meeting minutes were not in compliance with open meeting law. The charter holder's dashboard was marked and it was advised to ensure that future meeting minutes are in compliance with all provisions of open meeting law. The charter holder currently meets the board's operational and financial performance expectations. The charter holder does not meet the board's academic performance expectations due to receiving a D letter grade in fiscal year 2019. I'm available for any questions if you have them. Okay, board members, any questions for Rachel? Okay, if not, is there a representative from Sage Academy? Um, if so, could you please unmute yourself at this time and state your name for the record and any comments you'd like to make? Good morning, my name is Nancy Weber. I am the representative of Sage Academy. Good morning, Madam President and board members. I would first like to thank you to speak on behalf of Sage Academy. Representing Sage Academy today are Lenny Letcher, charter holder, Lynette Letcher, 
charter holder, Alicia Roach, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction, and myself, Neely Weber, the Academic Director. I've had the privilege of being the Academic Director at Sage Academy for the last six years. Sage Academy is a small charter school located, located in Phoenix, Arizona at 25th Avenue and Peoria, which is adjacent to the I-17 and what was formerly known as Metro Town Center. We currently have an enrollment of 174 students, K-8, with a total of 82% of students who qualify for free, free and reduced lunch. At Sage Academy, we live out our mission every day as we strive to challenge each student to learn, grow, and excel in character, knowledge, wisdom, and life. As the board is aware, in 2019, Sage Academy was reclassified from a B to a D letter grade. And so I am here today to provide context to the reclassification along with, pro with provide the board the measures that Sage Academy has taken since the spring of 2000, 2019 to ensure student growth and achievement occurs at Sage Academy. In March of 2018, Sage Academy relocated to our current campus approximately seven miles away from our original site. The 2018-2019 school year proved to be a transition year due to the higher teacher and student turnover, mainly due to the relocating of our campus, as well as the expansion of enrollment with additional classrooms and new teachers. Nonetheless, after the results of the spring 2019 state assessments, the site leadership and staff understood the decrease in student achievement must be appropriately addressed. This led to site leadership with the, with the support of staff and outside consultants to deeply analyze the data to identify both root causes and action steps to ensure there was an increase in student achievement during the next school year. During the analyst, it was determined there was a need to create more supports for creating equity in our underperforming subgroup, as well as additional support for staff development. Site leadership and staff implemented action steps during the summer of 2019 as well as the 2019-2020 school, school year. These action steps included classroom academic interventions, summer school, community partnerships to provide one-to-one -one tutoring, addition of an academic interventionist to provide intensive academic interventions, educational consulting, and instructional coaching. However, due to the global pandemic of COVID-19, the results of our efforts could not, be, could not fully come to fruition. Nonetheless, site, liber, site leadership and staff have continued to strive to provide rigorous and equitable instruction that supports the full development and ever-changing needs of the students with implementation of system, systematic programs, policies, and instructional support grounded in the framework of the continuous improvement cycle. This also includes identifying new barriers of distance learning, as well as emotional and, and mental fatigue for staff, students, and families because of the pandemic and matching them with support and appropriate solutions. As a result, the site leadership and staff continue to create favors solutions to support students during the 2020-21 school year. Additional action steps that have been implemented this school year include the revision of curriculum implementation and review systems, creation of teacher mentor for new staff, the addition to new site leadership with the director of curriculum instruction, the implementation of professional learning communities grounded by in DeVore's four essential questions and the creation of teacher-led school improvement committee. However, we know that none of these systems and programs would not be successful if it wasn't for the heart and the passion of those behind them. At Sage Academy, we continue to strive to create a culture where students and staff can thrive while supporting themselves and each other to be successful in these unpresented times. I thank President Lee and the board once again for your time and consideration to allow us to continue to do what we believe is so true. Every child deserves the best education and it is our purpose in life to intentionally and positively impact the students, parents, community of Sage Academy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board members, are there any questions? Um, I just have uh, a question. So. What are you guys, obviously with the, it sounds like you guys, uh, the, the data dropped the year that you guys moved sites. Is that, is that correct? I believe that's what you stated. Yeah. Okay. And it, 
And then if so, so now with the pandemic happening, we're seeing students obviously from last year have huge instructional gaps. And then this year we believe, you know, there could be large instructional gaps as well. Um, what, is, what is your model right now to, um, you know, to kind of close those achievement gaps? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, hello, my name is Alicia Roach. I am the director of curriculum and instruction uh, here at Sage Academy. Um, and one of our goals for um, decreasing that achievement gap was a very balanced approach. Um, we went and one of the things with me coming into this new role was for us to um, do a, a deep alignment of all of our systems and plan that includes our literacy plan along with our, um, our integrated action plan and also our uh, balanced assessment plan. Um, we're very data driven and that is one of the biggest shifts that we are taking um, to have that approach where we have implemented the continuous improvement cycle, not only at the big, um, the higher uh, level at the district level, but also into the classroom where we are incorporating a um, MTSS and starting from uh, our tier one in the classroom and having the teachers implement a framework of reteach and enrich to not only decrease that achievement gap, but we know a lot of the times what happens is maybe our students that are achieving, we're not getting, we tend to unfortunately, okay, they're great, let's go ahead and let's focus on the struggling ones. With our model that we have put into place with a reteach and enrich, we're ensuring that all students are not only um, growing and uh, um, meeting mastery, but also those students that are at mastery are able to get that enrichment and dive deeper into um, the standards and to that content knowledge. President Lee. Yes. Well, Crockett, I wonder if I could um, ask a more clarifying question. Um, so I understand what you're doing, but how are the students doing compared to um, the D grade now. Does that make sense? In other words, um, you've implemented some great strategies to improve the academics, but, but how are they doing now from 2019? Yes, so we have um, implemented with a uh, part of our assessment plan. We also use Galileo assessment. We are currently in our benchmark two. Um, this week is our week of assessing. So as we look at that, we're hoping to see those positive trends for our math and reading uh, to increase. Um, and we're gonna do that comparison of where our students left off um, with the benchmark to where they are now. Thank you. And did you guys use Galileo last year? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we did. And what were you, well, I get last year was the pandemic and this is, so I think maybe some of the concerns, at least I'll, I'll say my concerns is, you know, is obviously the academic achievement. Um, now I will say this, something that I appreciated about your school and that I always look at sometimes when we have, especially when we have an anomaly, which I would call these, this drop, but you know, hopefully and appears to be an anomaly um, in, in achievement. What I like to look at is that, um, are those proficiency scores. And I was highly impressed that, you know, your proficiency scores seem to increase um, significantly, both in ELA, math, and, um, you know, all schools overall. So, so I appreciate that. And I think what's tough is, is to, to come here and, and maybe um, penalize you on data, on, you know, the, on non-current data. And then because due to a pandemic, you guys not being able to say, yeah, well, this is what we did. And here's the results of everything that we did, I think is not, you know, is not equitable for you guys. And, and so um, while, you know, my recommendation would be to approve this, I, I do just, um, you know, we, my hope is, is that when things eventually go back to, you know, quote unquote normal, that we, that we can see, you know, all the results of, of your guys' hard work and just to keep focusing on that academic achievement, you know, for your students and teacher retention, things like that. So, um, so thank you, you know, for those responses. Board members, are there any other questions? And if not, is there a motion? President Lee, could I ask a Oh, please, yeah. Um, President Lee, remember, uh, I was just, I had a clarifying question. I heard you mention the, the reteach and enrich model, which 
is actually music to my ears. I'm very familiar with that model from working in Vail. And so I would just want to clarify, were you saying that that's new? Is that something new you're implementing this year or was that something you had in place before? So this was something um, that we have as we continue to do our analysis um, and look at how we can create equity for our students. Um, when we went through that process over the summer, one of the things that we um, realized was our students that are on grade level, we're not necessarily giving them that enrichment piece. Um, and also that if because of a lot of our students with that COVID slide, we understand that they may have that significant gap as well and may need that reteach integrated in that tier one instruction. And so it is something that we um, have implemented this school year. Okay, great. I, I, I'm just very happy to have because um, I, I think that it's a strategy for looking at the data, kind of grouping and pre-grouping students because every, every student has strengths and weaknesses. So if you're looking at that on a more regular, even daily basis, I, I think that's a really strong strategy. So I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any other questions? President okay. Lee, sorry. This yes. is more of a comment and um, nice work, Sage, on all the reporting you did, but just uh, this is overall overall comment, and I hope the superintendent hears this, is that um, we really need to continue to have school letter grades. And I hear that, I've been hearing things about pulling back from that for, I know we have this year, and then I've heard even maybe pulling back farther for more years, and we really need to be able to assess how our schools are doing as charters grow in size, we need to be very vigilant on how they're performing and taking care of our kids. So that's just a comment, not really to Sage at all, but overall, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Okay, then with that, there's any other questions or comments? Is yeah, there a motion? Is, oh, yes. Hans. I'll make a motion. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank all the board members for their comments. And I do hope that the letter grade uh, with Sage Academy is, a, is an anomaly. But having commented on that, I move based on a review of the information provided by the representatives of the charter holder and the contents of the application package to approve the charter renewal application package and grant the renewal contract with Sage Academy Incorporated. Second. Is there a second? Thank you. Dr. Crockett, thank you. All right, if we could do the roll call. Hi. Superintendent Hi. Hi. Mr. Mason. Hi. Ms. Rick. Apologies for my previous uh, audio issues. Apparently I was having emotional difficulties. Um, I. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Swanson? Aye. Ms. Yana? President Lee? Aye. Motion passes unit. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Up next, um, we are on to compliance matters. And it looks like um, we have painted desert. Uh, demonstration Projects, Inc. up, and we have a, a presentation by Joanna first. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and board members. Today, you will be exercising your authority as outlined in the board's operational performance framework pursuant to statute and regulation. If the board determines a charter holder does not meet the board's minimum operational performance expectations, it shall consider the charter holder's noncompliance and may subject the charter holder to additional charter oversight as outlined in Article 6, including issuing a notice of intent to revoke the charter contract. The charter holder being considered at this board meeting has received an overall rating for fiscal year 2020 of does not meet the board's operational performance standard. Due to having at least six of the nine operational performance framework measures being rated does not meet standard. On May 13, 2020, board staff conducted an interval desk review of Star Academy 
operated by Painted Desert Demonstration Projects Incorporated. The school serves students in grades K through eight and is located 25 miles east of Flagstaff near the southwest corner of the Navajo Nation. The purpose of the visit was to conduct the charter's five-year interval review. During the site visit, several compliance issues were identified, resulting in the charter holder failing to meet the minimum operational performance expectations in fiscal year 2020. Several of the issues identified deficiencies in maintaining alignment with the charter's mission statement and instructional days. Outside of the issues identified during the interval desk review, the charter holder was also out of compliance due to findings from the fiscal year 2019 audit, which included a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements, not reporting absences to the Arizona Department of Education, appropriate fingerprinting, and timely submission of the annual financial report for fiscal year 2018 and 2019. The charter representative and board member, Mark Sorensen, is here to address the board and or answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And before we turn it over to the charter, are there any uh, board members, are there any questions for Joanna? Okay. If not, then is uh, the representative from Painted Desert Demonstration Projects, Inc., if you could please unmute yourself, state your name to, for the record, and maybe address some of the, the items that were just, just discussed, please. Good morning, President Lee. Uh, my name is Mark Sorensen. I am the co-founder and the uh, charter hold, holder for Painted Desert Demonstration Projects, also known as Star School. Uh, I'd like to um, thank the members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and President Lee for giving us this opportunity. I uh, would like to give you a brief uh, picture of uh, who we are. So, <clears throat> As Ms. Medina mentioned, we are located on the edge, southwestern edge of the Navajo Nation. 99% of our student population uh, is Native American. We are also unique in that we are off-grid and solar powered. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, when we were confronted with the pandemic, uh, we surveyed our parents and found that 70% uh, of them lacked adequate internet access. So the school provided them with hotspots <clears throat> to all our families. And we found that still 10% of our families did not have electricity at home. So because of our um, experience with being solar powered, we were able to provide solar power boxes to those families so that they had access to the internet and lights that they could operate uh, so the kids could do their homework. Um, currently 96% of our students are attending daily our, our uh, online instruction. We're very proud of that. We're proud of being a, a school serving native kids that it has a B uh, letter grade. And uh, we, I'd like to mention before I turn it over to our administrative team to address the individual items um, I'd like to say that uh, for a number of years, we've been in existence for 21 years now. We've had clean audits all the way through. And uh, <clears throat> in uh, 2019, we were informed that the auditor that we had was being removed from uh, consideration uh, as an auditor uh, for charter schools. And so we... Um, we ended up with a new uh, auditing team that were very, very thorough and uh, came in and, and uh, looked not only at our current year, but at previous years. So um, we were surprised actually to see uh, some of these things and we have since corrected every one of the items. So at this point, I'd like to ask Nicole Burkhart <clears throat> who's part of our administrative team at the school to describe our responses to every one of the items uh, that was raised in the audit. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Nicole Burkhart. Um, I, uh, at the STAR School, working as part of the um, leadership team here at the school. Um, as Dr. Sorensen said, um, 
we're very proud of what we've been able to do with our students uh, during the pandemic. Um, we started out during the emergency closure with paper packets and food deliveries and have managed um, because of uh, insight from Dr. Sorensen and, and other leaders who started preparing immediately for a more longer term situation, um, have been able to secure internet access for um, all of our students, devices, um, along with solar power to be able to, to maintain those devices during school. And we're able to have 96% average daily attendance, which is um, pretty phenomenal, particularly for how rural um, uh, all of our students are and so we're very very proud of what we've been able to do um, in the in the pandemic times where everything is quite different and incredibly challenging for our, our families. Um, looking at the uh, specific um, issues that have come up, um, uh, looking at our um, operational performance, there are a number of um, items uh, instructional days and in our mission statement where um, what we had in our records didn't match what was on record with the charter board. And so those items um, have now been through the amendment request process and have been approved. Um, and now um, we've been through some training to know how that process works and how to verify that information on our own in advance on an ongoing basis so that we can um, be on top of it as we go uh, through each year. Um, a number of items came up because of uh, the auditing situation uh, or came up through the auditing situation that Dr. Sorensen described. Um, one of the items uh, with the audit opinion and the disclaimer had to do with a lack of a fixed asset listing and depreciation schedule. Um, that was in part um, our previous auditors kept uh, that information and we weren't able to obtain it from them. Um, and now that's been corrected, we have, we have it on file and our business specialist um, has that going uh, on an ongoing basis as, as it should be. And so those practices are in place and the corrective action has been submitted as it was required. Um, the difference in attendance reporting um, through the auditing process we discovered um, a, a problem with our student information system and the way it was reporting to the state. Um, it was sending reports uh, on a regular basis, um, but the reports weren't containing the right information. So we've been working with our um, student information system uh, to make sure that we have all of um, the setup in place. And we've also done training with that and have learned that there's an annual training in July to ensure that everything is set at the start of the school year. So we will participate in that on a yearly basis to make sure that the problem doesn't come up again. Um, with fingerprinting, um, the, the issue with fingerprinting was with, um, uh, with some expired fingerprints with board members. Um, and uh, the understanding at the time was a misunderstanding about uh, the requirement for those um, members of our school community and the fingerprint requiring requirements. So all, all employees and all um, board members are now part of our regular review of um, fingerprint clearance and um, their expiration and making sure that they are up to date. <clears throat> um, let's see. Um, one of the other pieces was transparency and operations and board alignment. Um, it was discovered that um, what was on file with the ACC didn't align with what was on file with the charter board. Um, and there were a number of difficulties with the, um, the process for changing that. And so we've had some training in how to make that happen and how to monitor that on an ongoing basis so that we can make sure everything is in alignment as it should be going forward. Um, uh, finally, the last piece was a late submission of the annual financial report and um, that um, came about because uh, the duties um, were reassigned and um, 
the there's been new training in place to make sure that all of the the dates and um, deadlines are met and they have been met since then. Um, so going through piece by piece, those are the the issues that have come up with the on the operational performance dashboard and um, how we have provided training and have new practices in place to make sure that they are not repeated in the future. Thank you for that. Um, so just a question then, who, who's in charge of kind of your overall compliance for, do you have one person that's in charge of compliance? Is it broken up? How, how, does, how does, your, does your team manage that? Um, we have a, a, a new structure for that. We, we have a leadership team um, that has uh, three members who oversee all of those processes and then a broader um, group that includes our business specialists so that we are all uh, part of the, the, the group looking into um, all of the compliance pieces um, so that we have more than just one set of eyes on it. And those, you said that there's kind of three people who who are in charge of compliance and what exactly are their roles and, and kind of background um, in regards to school compliance? Uh, so I'm one of the, the people on the leadership team there. Um, I function as assistant principal in my role. Um, and I've, uh, last year was, um, brought into being part of the auditing process and um, being part of that compliance oversight. Um, we have two other members um, who are part of the leadership team. Um, one who is partly a teacher and partly part of administration and oversees a number of um, grants and special projects. Um, and then a, a third member of our leadership team um, is our special education um, coordinator um, and also uh, functions uh, as sort of staff and parent um, point person, um, similar to how um, a, a principal might do um, generally, um, but she has that has that role. Um, and then in our broader group, uh, as I mentioned, one of the members is our business specialist, and so she um, knows all of the. Um, accounting practices and keeps all of the budgets and all of those pieces. And is your business specialist new, a new person, a new hire, or um, they were here before? Um, she's been here for a number of years, but her roles have been um, evolving and responsibilities have been being added to, to her plate um, in, in the most recent years. Okay. So it seems like um, there's a lot of people doing a little bit of compliance, um, you know, and that, that can just be a lot that, that compliance can definitely be overwhelming for children. So what you guys talked about setting some plans in place. So, um, I guess what, how do you plan on training everybody moving forward or staying up to date? Or, I mean, is there one person that's kind of in charge of attending all the trainings? Cause I, I just don't know how you are a teacher, you know, but then attend all the compliance trainings that you need to and get all the updates and things like that. What's, what's your plan with that moving forward? Um, I don't think that we've spoken exactly specifically because the leadership structure is still fairly new in this way. And so we're developing that. Um, it's uh, mostly um, our business specialist um, and, and I who have been through a lot of the trainings. Um, and then we have regular meetings um, all together so that we can share information and keep everyone up to speed about um, new guidelines and deadlines and, and things like that. Okay. Board members, um, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So I, I don't know, you know, where other board members are at. Um, personally, I'm still, I'm still a little nervous um, just by your answers that I think that there's still a lot of work to do to ensure that you're not back before us. You know, I think you guys really need a solid structure and really need, you know, one person that 
has true ownership over the compliance and staying up to date because it can it can be overwhelming. I know that it sounds like um, I that you guys have everything, you know, that was of concern, rectified, um, and that you are creating a plan, right, to, to do that. So, so I do appreciate that. So um, I don't know, I, I personally don't think closure is um, the route that I would go. That being said, I, I do think that a consent agreement, um, you know, is, is appropriate and what we've done kind of historically in matters like this. Um, Board members, I don't know if you have any other thoughts or questions, um, or if not, we could do a motion and see where everybody's at. President Lee, this is Hans. Yes. I'm somewhat familiar with the school. I think they're doing uh, a commendable job with the students academically. I do think the compliance issues are something that have to be um, certainly addressed. I think it would be appropriate to um, develop a consent agreement with the charter holder. So unless there are any other questions, I'm willing to make that motion. Great, if you could make the motion, Hans, thanks. thanks. Okay. I move to find that Painted Desert Demonstration Projects Incorporated here and, here and after referred to in this motion as the charter holder has failed to meet the operational performance expectations set forth in the board's operational performance framework and has violated its charter contract in state and federal law. These failures and violations provide a sufficient basis to issue a notice of intent to revoke the charter holder's contract. However, the board is authorized to exercise its legal discretion with regard to actions taken against a charter holder that is not in compliance with its charter, other obligations to the board and state and federal law. In an effort to bring the charter holder into compliance, the board directs staff to work with legal counsel to, do, to develop a consent agreement that addresses the charter holder's non-compliance with the board's operational performance expectations, its charter and state and federal law. The board further directs staff to bring the consent agreement back to the board for consideration at a subsequent board meeting. If the charter holder chooses not to accept the terms of the consent agreement developed by board staff, then it is the board's decision that the charter holder be placed on a future agenda for a motion to issue a notice of intent to revoke the charter holder's charter contract for the reasons already specified. All right, thank you. Is there a second? This is Justin, I second. Thank you, Justin. And with the roll call, please. Vice President Cloak. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Just for a second to make a, a comment that I want to echo what I said, that I also have some familiarity with the school as I was able to do a virtual visit earlier this year. And I do think it's very important what the school has been able to accomplish, especially with the digital divide and just, you know, hearing without electricity at home and how you've been able to overcome that is truly phenomenal. Um, so I, um, I really hope you all can get the compliance issues figured out so we don't have to see you in front of the board again. And um, but just want to thank you for, for, for serving our students um, that I know, I know how challenging that must be. So um, I also support this. My, my vote is aye. Dr. Pocket. Um, I also have a comment. I um, well, I'll, I'm going to vote aye for this motion. I I do am very impressed that you worked very hard to try to address this. I think that's very important, and um, I echo uh, Superintendent Hoffman. Thank you. Ms. Rice. Ms. Reyes? Aye. Mr. Swanson? Aye. Mr. Twist? Mr. Twist? Sorry, it was muted. Aye. Ms. Yana? Aye. President Lee? Um, and I am going to vote aye. And just a real quick, or I'm going to make my comment first. So you can't cut me off, Alexis. But um, and, and then I'll vote. But I just want to say, I just want to echo what the fellow board members say is we are, 
um, we can see that what you're doing, you know, for students is working. And I mean, your face scores, everything you talked about is just so needed and, and again, innovative and impressive. And so we hope that the next time, you know, we see you up here is for, to share more amazing things that you guys are doing um, and that you guys just, you know, get that compliance piece done. So, so, so you're, so you're not here again, but with that, I. Great. Thank you guys. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thank you. Keep it up. That, that 96% attendance rate, I don't know board members, but um, is extremely, as someone who works at a charter school, is extremely impressive, um, both in a regular world, but then also in COVID, it's, it's even more impressive. So anyway, great job. Okay. So going on to the next item, it looks like we have Shanto up next and a presentation by, by Andrea. Good morning, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and members of the board. In January 2017, the board entered into a consent agreement with Shanto Governing Board of Education, Inc., due in part to the fiscal years 2012 through 2015 audits finding Shanto not reconciling draws from the self-insurance fund to insurance claims reports. Due to the repeated non-compliance, this issue was considered a serious impact finding under the board's audit matrix and administrative rules. Under the consent agreement, Shanto agreed to ensure it establishes and maintains proper internal controls for the self-insurance fund. Compliance would be monitored through the fiscal years 2017 through 2021 audits. Failure to comply with the consent agreement's terms could result in the board holding a hearing and ultimately in Shanto's charter contract being revoked and the charter contract being terminated. Shanto's fiscal years 2017 and 2018 audits demonstrated compliance with the consent agreement's terms and conditions. Based on the fiscal year 2019 audit, Shanto has failed to maintain proper internal controls for its self-insurance fund as required by the consent agreement. In accordance with the board's audit matrix and administrative rules, board staff notified Shanto in May 2020 that a corrective action plan or cap must be submitted. Based on the audit cap, board staff informed Shanto in October that it appeared Shanto may have taken steps in fiscal year 2020 to resolve the audit finding and provided options for how to proceed since compliance with the consent agreement is based on conclusions reached by Shanto's auditor. Shanto engaged its auditor to complete a subsequent review to determine for fiscal year 2020 and the first three months of fiscal year 2021, whether Shanto had reconciled weekly claim reports to the individual eligible member claims. The auditor's report noted that for 25 of the 65 weeks reviewed, there was no evidence of review or approval noted to support the review and approval by someone at Shanto. This result means the finding will likely be repeated in Shanto's fiscal year 2020 audit. Board staff asked, excuse me, asked Shanto to request from the auditor and to provide to the board a list of the specific weeks for which no evidence of review was noted. Shanto provided the list and an explanation to assist in clarifying the reasons for the missing weeks. This information was included in the meeting materials as Appendix E. Today, the board could proceed to a hearing under the consent agreement or could take other actions as it deems appropriate. I am available for questions and so are representatives from the school. Thank you, Andrea. Board members, are there any questions for Andrea before we turn it over to the charter? Okay, and it sounds like we have a represent, uh, representative for Shanto. If you could please uh, unmute yourself at this time, state your name for the record, and um, if you have a response, that would be great. Hello, hello. my name is Cheryl Graham, charter holder, representative of Shanto Governing Board of Education. Ms. Wakaku, our interim superintendent, We'll be addressing any questions you may have today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, do you just have a, I mean, I, so I guess just to start off, um, if you could maybe address Some of the some of the issues and sorry I, I broke up a little bit so I guess I didn't hear did you say that you'd be responding or you have someone else that you're wanting to introduce yes our school um hi I mean our school district interim superintendent will be addressing the questions you have 
um, she has more information. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And so is the superintendent here? Yes. Good morning, um, board members. Um, my name is Melanie Diwakaku. I am the interim superintendent for Shanto Prep School at this time. Um, I would like to address the issues that have been um, presented. Um, it's been a very tough um, couple of months for us here at Shanto. Um, we've we had a, our superintendent resign in the midst of the um, pandemic at the beginning of April. Um, I myself became or was appointed by our governing board, the Shanto governing board as the interim superintendent during this time and still currently. Um, at the time of the um, transition of when our superintendent resigned, we were at a stay at home order that was provided by the Navajo Nation. And we have been currently now in a stay at home order as well. Anyways, during that time, I did present a, le a letter. I'm not sure if you all have that letter on hand, but I did identify, I did get the weeks the 25 weeks that were identified as not being um, reviewed and verified. I did um, look at the weeks. I did look back at our um, human um, resources. Um, our human resources director is, was responsible for um, verifying and um, reviewing our weekly claims. So I did go back um, possibly trying to figure out um, maybe what could have happened. And also just to make note, um, Shanto Preparatory School is currently um, advertising for an HR director. So we did kind of have our HI, HR director available here and there since the pandemic um, due to um, medical reasons. And there was a transition as well at the beginning of 1920 of our HR director. So we did have an HR director leaving. We had one come in and we just had some weeks there that I feel may have been overlooked. Um, I myself didn't realize, I mean, if I had known during the time we could have had a second person um, looking and reviewing these as well. But when I reached out at the beginning of September, after knowing that our HR director was not returning, I reached out to the summit claims and then realized that a lot of the previous administrators that were at Shanto were still on the list to receive these weekly claims. So it's like they were being emailed out, but because these individuals didn't work for Shanto, they weren't getting the emails. So I had to change all of that in the beginning, end of August, early September. And so now I look at the claims, I review them, I verify them with our, um, our business office um, staff there. So ever since I have... Um, been put in the system to look and verify weekly claims. They've been ongoing and they will continue to be ongoing. Um, I know I was also the one that wrote the corrective action plan. And I do want to thank Andrea for assisting us in creating that plan because that was kind of in the middle of when our superintendent left and I came in and um, a lot of these corrective action plans needed to be written um, during that time. So I did get um, some help from um, Andrea on that as far as the corrective action plan and trying to keep up with that. And um, we had to make a decision if we were gonna do the, our, our audit or the um, agreed upon procedures. So um, the letter is attached, it does identify the 25 weeks and there's an explanation explanation there as to why 
Um, the claims weren't um, looked at. Um, again, that's the best um, as far as going back, trying to figure out what may have happened without having our HR person in the office. So um, I'm hoping this will assist in um, clarifying the reasons of our missing um, weekly claims. As I mentioned before, since the beginning of September, they have been completed every week since then. So um, are, if there are any questions, I am able to answer them. So I'll, down bottom line, we're now getting things um, in control of things now. We are understanding the different processes we have now, I think, gained access to a lot of the systems that we needed to. It just took a while because we had to go some, like for the charter representative, we had to go through having board meetings, um, getting it board approved. And with that, we had to get signatures and due to the pandemic, it was very rare. It's very rare now still that we're able to obtain signatures from our board members. Um, we are currently shelter in place. We are all remote working home remotely. Um, as you all know, the Navajo Nation has made um, national news as far as our growing numbers. So we are all being safe at home and still continuing to ensure that our day-to-day -day operations of our school are occurring with what limited access that we have to our buildings. And again, and as um, mentioned before, we as well are very rural. So Wi-Fi is um, a challenge to us and our students. So even us as employees. So whenever we um, are able to get on Wi-Fi, we are sending things and getting things done. Some of us have also um, taken, um, gone off from Shanto even to the local um, towns just so we're able to stay in a hotel to get good Wi-Fi when we do need, know that we something needs to be sent. So just want to add that. And if there are any questions, um, feel free to ask. Thank you so much for that. So yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, this is Mary Ellen Lee, sorry. So what, um, I guess, you know, you guys were here in 2017 um, and already on a consent agreement. And, you know, since then you've kind of, you've had some issues. And so I guess, you know, and in, in, in 2000, 2017, there wasn't a pandemic there, there weren't, you know, the same kind of factors that there are now. And my fear is that, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, there already is going to be a red on your dashboard next year or for um, FY20. Um, and I guess what exactly, you know, what did you guys do in 2017 to get you not to be here again? And then how, why did that fail? Because you're here again. And what are you going to do to not be here again? If we, um, you know, allow you to stay on the consent agreement. Okay, I do not know what happened in 2017. And, and in 2017, I was the, um, the SPED director for the district. So I am not sure. And that was something um, um, Ms. Cheryl Grass and I, Ms. Grass is the high school principal up at the, um, the high school right now, and this was a discussion, a discussion we had yesterday was um, needing to look back at all the reports, all the things that have been submitted prior to us coming into this position, these positions to better understand what has happened in the past. So I know she has, um, she was now has access, I guess it's to the dashboard or something where um, the reports are uploaded. So I'm not sure if that's where we can find the previous reports that have been submitted, but we do need to do some research because honestly, I don't know what was presented in 2017. So that would sure. um, be something that we would need to um, research. And I know we are, um, 
currently, you know, like I said, we're got the, we, the weekly claims, we have other, um, we've had our financial, our ladies in the business office as well, um, looking at other things with the charter. So we are looking at what we have and we are trying to make the adjustments necessary to keep us in compliance. And so, I mean, that's the best we can do. And so, like I said, we're trying to figure out what was the history uh, with Shanto Prep, the high school, so that we can better understand and that will help us um, in creating our plan that's needed to ensure everything is in compliance. So who, who will be in charge of your compliance matters moving forward? of staying on top of compliance for your school? Mm, myself and Ms. Grass, like um, I did mention, we are um, advertising for a HR director. We are also advertising for a business manager at this time. And what will be the role of the business manager? To assist us in ensuring that our, our weekly claims are, are being paid to make sure that they're aligning with what is on our weekly claims, like I had mentioned before, sitting, I currently sit down with the um, person that is overseeing the business office. And that's how we review and clarify the weekly claims and make sure there's the, um, the alignment um, that's going on, ensuring what we have on the weekly claims is what we're paying out. Sure. So talk to me, um, the students that attend your school, how, how far do they have to drive to get to your school? We have several of them that are from an hour to an hour and a half. Um, last, we have even still, we have our buses going out that have Wi Fi. We still have students that are traveling anywhere from 10 to 15 miles just to get to the Wi Fi on the buses. Um, we had snow over the past couple of days, so that makes it even more challenging. But right, right now, due to the stay at home order, um, our buses are not going out just right. because of the face to face um, that, that happens when we do have our buses going out. So it's been a challenge, but we've been, a lot of our lessons are um, asynchronous. So we do have our lessons that are put on flash drives and um, our students are able to put their flash drive in and um, get their lessons that are downloaded on the um, flash drive. Right, so just as far as like in a, in a typical year, so not a pandemic year, what, what percent approximately of your population has to travel, you know, more than 30 minutes to get to your, to your school site? President Lee, this is Hans. Yeah. Yeah. If, I could, if I could add on to that question, um, I'd like to just to, just to create a, uh, an idea of the, the situation the school's in. If the students did not attend Shanto, if Shanto was not there, what are the alternatives? Like, where are the other closest schools? How far away are they? The closest school would be Page which is like an hour away would be Kayanta, which is also an hour away would be Tuba city, which is about an hour away too. So we're kind of like in the middle of um, the outs, the middle of what other public schools are around us. It will be about an hour away. And, but students are, are, traveling 30 minutes to an hour to get to you, correct? Yes, that's by bus. Right. Okay. Um, board members, I'm, and, and Hans, I don't, I don't know if you um, have any additional thoughts, but I, I'm oh, having hey, a, a Mary, yeah, how, please. How many real, just, just to keep with this real quickly, how many students yeah. um, live in proximity to the school within say um, 15, 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes. How many, what percent of the student population lives around the school?
Do y'all know? Grass. Hello, this is Cheryl. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. This is yep. Cheryl Grass. Yes. Um, I would say about 80% of our students reside within 15 minutes. So Shanto um, services students in the Shanto community, which is right here, and also in the Kaibato area, which is about 30 minutes. Inscription House, which is about 20 minutes, and Navajo Mountain, which is about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on um, the, the road conditions, and um, students in the Black Mesa area, which is another 45 minutes, um, and as well as Red Lake Tonalia, which is about 30 minutes. Um, so Shanto Charter School, I mean, Shanto Technology High School services students from those areas and communities. So I wanna say about 80% of our students are within a 30 minute driving distance of our school. And um, I wanna say about 80% of our students this year have come from our K-8 um, school just below. And, they, um, and this was the needs of the community and desire of the community to establish a school here in this area. And um, within the recent years, I know the numbers this year, the numbers have grown and, um, and parents have been sending their students to our school this year. So we appreciate that and, um, and value their, their trust in putting their students at our school, so. President Lee. Yes. Superintendent Hoffman, please. Thank you. Um, I have a little bit more information around the background of, of um, the superintendent who's, sorry, I missed your, your name, but um, superintendent who's the interim super, superintendent who's on the call with us, because it sounds like you are taking on a lot of responsibility for, for lifting the school up and getting everything into order. So if you, can you just share with us a little more about your background? Do you have experience leading a school um, in this way? Okay, um, I'm not sure I understand. Can you rephrase your question? I'm sorry. Just what's your background? I'm just wondering, what, like, what did you do before? Oh, you okay, I, um, I was the um, SPED director for maybe, well, oh my God, probably about four, four or five years. Within that time, I was kind of placed around the district as um, interim um, principal, kind of filled in where the, um, where the district needed me to fill, fill in. Prior to interim um, superintendent, I was the K-8 principal for two years. Um, we've had a turnover um, as far as superintendents for several, for a couple of years now. And so each time one came in, they had their own vision of what they wanted Shanto to be. So at one point I was principal for both the high school and the K-8. So I've served many different roles here at Shanto. Um, so I actually was the K-8 principal and was appointed to the, um, um, so the interim superintendent just this past um, last school year in April. And so I've been with Shanto. This is going on like my 10th year. So prior to that, I was a teacher here down in Phoenix for the Deer Valley School District for about 10 years. I was a special education teacher down in the valley and I had moved back home. And so that's how I ended up in Shanto. And um, within that time received my um, principal um, certification and just move forward from there. So I've been at Shanto for a little, going on almost 10 years as well. I really and appreciate, I'm sorry if I could just follow up with a, a follow-up question. Um, I, yeah, I really appreciate that and your dedication to your community. And um, do you have any insight? So since you're the interim, that just makes me a little worried if there could be another change in leadership after all the work you're putting in as superintendent. So do you, do you or anyone on the, um, do you or Cheryl have any insight on just the, the future 
plan for a leader in terms of determining the more long-term plan for having either you or someone else as the superintendent? Like when would that decision be made? Oh, um, and I know that's something we um, also um, look at and have on our, I guess like almost like the back burner too, because then I don't know where the, where we would, where, what direction that we're going to go with that. Um, we're hoping that, um, um, I, I mean, we're hoping that there's not that much of a turnover. And I, I mean, even if we do get someone um, coming in, I, I will probably still provide a lot of the um, assistance in it and understanding, you know, ensuring that things are still being taken care of during um, if we do have a transition. And that was, and just to go back a little, as I mentioned before, Ms. Grass, we do have her as our charter representative. And I know it was asked um, of us of why um, maybe we had Ms. Grass, the principal, the charter representative. And basically it's, it's because she's, um, not in a position of an interim position yet, because then if anything, if we all went back, those of us at Shanto that are in these um, positions temporary, if we all went back, Miss Grass would still be in her same position. And it just, and she's from the community. So we, her outlook for her is a lot better than I guess ours if, we get put back into our original positions. I get put back as the K-8 principal and that's a grant school, a Navajo Nation grant school. So it wouldn't really, I wouldn't really have that much of a connection back with the charter to where Ms. Grass would. But um, I do understand the public system, public school system a lot and along with the BIE and the um, tribal school and Ms. Grass and I have learned a lot within these past <laughs> five months, as I mentioned, just doing a lot of researching, trying to ensure that we're on top of things. Um, but as far as the outlook, I can't really say what's going to happen and are we would like things to remain the same. We would like things to function how they are because we are just getting back the foundation and trying to build back up again. And it is a challenge trying to regroup everybody and get going again. And during this pandemic, all the challenges that we're facing, it's, it's a lot of work. And we do, like everyone else, we're working endless hours trying to meet the needs, especially of our students, trying to meet the needs for our parents and as well ensuring that everybody is safe. I'd like to add to that. Um, may I speak? Um, I think the reason why the, our school governing board chose not to hire a new superintendent in the midst of COVID is because there has been so much turnover in leadership. Um, therefore, Ms. Dewakaku has been in a leadership position at the school for a number of years in order for us to continue to move forward on our school integrated action plans um, at the high school and the elementary, Ms. Dewakaku would be in support of the interim principal and she would be in support of me and um, help us move forward in those initiatives. Um, yes, she is correct. She is consistently turning over a new rock and learning new things and new situations that we have to address. Um, I started back in the, um, January as a new principal, but like Mr. Wakaku said, I am from this community. I've been in this district for 14 years. So I've had um, the luxury to see things from afar, but now I'm in the midst of it. We're just learning together. And um, as things arise, we just try to take care of it. And I think one of our goals in um, our school integrated action plan and even on our in our district plan is to build a capacity with the staff because since there has been such a high turnover in our district and in neighboring schools around us, we see the need to build a capacity within despite the titles because something may happen and we do not want the school to be in a situation where 
it's consistently in non-compliance. We, we want our students, we want our school, our students and the goals that we have in place to move forward despite who is, um, who is the superintendent or who is a principal. So we, we see it as a need and Mr. Wakaku is supporting me trying to like, this is, this is how you do it. This is how you submit your report. This is what it looks like because she is very abreast on ADE um, guidelines and things on the instructional matter as far as a principal. But now being in the superintendent role, this is throwing her a curveball and she's running as she's going through this process with it. So we recognize this is a need, but I think, I believe the, the hope of the board was no more change. Let's, let's get our bearings and let's start moving forward and implement these plans because um, there's been too much change and we can't move forward with that. Especially when the community students and staff are like, who's going to be the new, who's going to be the new, let's just keep moving forward with the staff we have. So, thank you. And can I ask, I just wanna ask a clarifying question. The K-8 is a BIE school, which doesn't fall under the same compliance requirements. Is that, is that correct? Like, like that a charter school or a different public school would, would, would fall under? Yes, they are um, what is called like a, um, a grant school, I believe, controlled school. So they do not fall under the same um, requirements as um, the, the charter would be. And I guess that's kind of where um, my strength is, is um, knowing the, um, the state side of it. And also I've taught and understand the um, BIE tribally controlled school um, um, things too, as well. So I, they are totally different. I mean, not totally, totally different, but they are different in their ways. Right. And so do you have any leadership? Um, so as like a principal or over compliance over a school that um, is like a, is a non BIE school. So, um, so not the K-8, but um, I know you said you've been a teacher for a long time. You were a special education teacher kind of at a district or public school. Um, but do you have any kind of compliance or leadership experience in a um, non-BIE school? Um, not in a non-BIE school. This is this year or when I was at the high school, as I mentioned before, I was overseeing the high school for a very short time. Mm -hmm. I did begin the process at the beginning of that school year with the um, comprehensive needs assessment, with the root cause analysis that with the fishbone, I did get them on um, right. that staff um, at the beginning stages of that. So I learned that whole process as well. Um, when I was up at the high school, got them started on that. And so um, I, I do a lot of reading and that's how I learn a lot of researching and just reaching out to the ADE resources, the people that are there that have assisted myself and Miss Grass um, in a lot of things. So we're not per se, I guess, um, individuals that will sit and wait. We reach out to our resources. And um, I know sometimes we may call, maybe call too much, but <laughs> we do mm -hmm. get our questions answered. We do make sure, and we're both the type of individuals that are like, you know, are you sure this is how it should be? Are you, you know, we're constantly following up on what sure. we have sent. So, um, but learning and moving along, um, I do, as Ms. Grass um, mentioned, I do assist her in a lot of things and she does assist me in a lot of things too. So we're there helping each other, the support, being support. I'm trying to be as supportive as I can to the administrators because I see that need and that's what we're doing. We're all working together here at Shanto. Um, sure. Sure, no, I can appreciate that. So board members, I, this, this is, uh, yes, go for it. Hans, Hans, can I make some comments? Yeah, um, please. I just want, I, 
I'm looking at some of the options, you know, and I think there definitely are extenuating circumstances. I think the uh, administration that is in place now at Shanto, for the most part, wasn't there when the consent agreement was established in 2017. I think there's the, the, the isolation of the school and the fact that the majority of the students are within a, within a pretty close distance to, the, to Shanto, uh, it would make it very difficult for them to attend other schools if something, if the school was to shut down. And obviously the, the circumstance of uh, the pandemic and specifically how it's impacted the Navajo Nation all play a role here. Um, I think I can appreciate what board staff is, is, is aiming for in, um, in doing some more compliance and maintaining and well, just encouraging better compliance, um, specifically in opening up, hopefully, more, um, more active communication between board staff and, and Shanto. Um, so unless there are other questions, I'm willing to make a motion to, um, based on extenuating circumstances, direct the staff to develop further monitoring efforts. Yeah, I, I have some comments, I think too, Hans, um, before you make a motion. Um, I, I guess, I guess I'm I'm a little bit more concerned. Um, you know, if if this if we were here and this was the first time and we were doing a consent agreement, um, I think it would be different circumstances when you talk about things like a pandemic affecting it. Um, unfortunately, that you know, 2017 there wasn't a pandemic, um, and and we're still having these issues. And and it sounds like I'm, I'm not convinced that that this leadership team is going to be staying. For the future, it sounds like there might be a desire to go back to the K-8 um, to be the principal. It doesn't sound like there is a solid plan in place to stay in compliance. Um, and with students, uh, and 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 this isn't easy because I I hear what you're saying, Hans, is that it, what happens to the students um, if if this school shuts down? I um, it sounds like that the majority might be driving uh, in a 30 minute range. And so I don't know if that means it only takes them 30 minutes to get to the school. It's an hour away, you know, from, from the, the current um, location of the school. So if so, that would be an equitable driving distance. I just, I know that we already have a violation for next year. They've already been on a consent agreement. And I, I just, I'm hearing a lot of heart and this, I don't think this is an easy decision, but I also am not hearing a solid plan to stay in compliance that brings us back here. And so I just don't, I, I haven't heard anything that gives me a hundred percent faith that, that they're not going to be back here next year. And, and the, and the population of the students will be the same and the drive will be the same. Um, and all, and all of that will be the same. And so uh, I'm I'm not comfortable um, going that route, but if you know, obviously I, I can be outvoted, and so um, I, I'd be curious to kind of hear maybe where the other board members are at, um, so we know how to make this motion. You know, whatever motion needs to be made. President Lee, it's Carol Crockett. I have a yep. clarifying question. You, um, um, it seems like you're trying to reach out and use those resources that are available to you under, under very difficult circumstances. And um, so how frequent is your communication with the uh, charter school board staff? What was that? I'm sorry. How frequent is your communication with um, the charter school board staff as a resource to you? How frequent? Yes, how often do you um, stay, in, do you stay in contact with them? You mentioned that you, you make a lot of calls. Yeah, we, well, recently within like this time of when this occurred, as far as um, um, following back up on the corrective action plan and for the different things that were needed, we've um, been in contact with Andrea. We've also had Zoom meetings with Sandy. Um, she helped us too with some of the um, um, tasks as far as getting Miss Grass set up. She helped us um, with the going through the steps of the paperwork 
And moving forward, I would see that it be a more regular type of um, communication with, um, with the charter board to assist us during this time, because now we, we understand and um, know the important, importance of keeping that um, communication with the um, charter board. Just like on the K-8 site, you know, I think I meet with our, our people through the Department of Diné Education on a weekly basis with meetings and um, just questions and stuff. So Cheryl, Ms. Grass and I do understand the need of the communication. And that was something that I believe, and we as um, the administrators there at Shanto also believe that there was a lack of communication and that's something that we need to enhance across the board. So we all know that communication is very important, especially during this time of the pandemic, but not because of the pandemic, but it should be always some type of communication going on. So we understand that. We understand us there, the administrators there understand that it's very important. Thank you. Uh, President. Um, I just wanted to follow, I, I agree with your concern about leadership um, turnover. I think it's it's terrible that we're, we're considering this without any idea of who will be uh, in those roles, even in the near future. Um, but I certainly like what I've heard from the representatives today. And I think if um, a certain schedule could be developed a certain communication schedule could be developed, I would be in favor of um, allowing, allowing this to go forward. I, I guess my comments on that are just, I'm not sure what, you know, um, you guys would consider a communication schedule because what I don't want to happen and I don't think that the board staff has the capacity for is to be charged with um, explaining or, um, or training, I, training is probably a better word, training in compliance matters. I definitely think the board staff is there to be helpful. And if, you know, if, if a charter comes and says, hey, can you help me file this amendment or how do I make this change? That's what they're supposed to do. But they definitely should not be charged with, you know, having to say, hey, reach out to the school and say, have you thought about this? Are you going to be in compliance with essentially doing what, you know, business manager or compliance director would do at, a, at another school? And, and that's, that's my fear is that we're, we're kind of creating a situation for board staff that isn't fair um, and isn't equitable for that and not what we're doing for other charter communities um, or for other charter charters within our charter portfolio. Um, and so I, I just want to be careful that what we're trying to do because we care so much about this population um, actually makes sense for our board staff and 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 is something that they can handle um so we're not here in a year from now and the school says well the board staff didn't tell us and well it's not it's not the job of the board staff to do that and and that that is my concern with with that and um and i just i i think too with leadership not having um any sort of uh, leadership at this level, obviously, you know, being a teacher that, you know, that all comes with leadership, but, but at the administrative level in dealing with a school that has to, you know, deal with a charter school or, or, or public school, that matter is, is alarming. You know, we're, they don't have someone coming in with that experience. Um, and that, that, that is alarming for me. Is there, is there any thought to you guys having a BIE school for, for, for the high school? So you, so, you, um, so you don't have to, you know, essentially reinvent the wheel with, with your high school. So, so your compliance matters are the same K-12. Uh, have you guys, is, is, are there limitations to that for you guys? I know that was um, brought to the table at some point by our board members. So um, we can probably revisit and I know there are some um, requirements and some things as well as far as turning a school back into um, tribally controlled schools. So I know it was brought to the table at some point, but um, nothing was really um, moved forward on it. So. Yeah. Lee, this is Hans. Yes, Hans. As far as my understanding is uh, right now with the BIE is, they're really not 
doing new secondary schools or focusing on K-8, specifically K-6 more than anything. So um, they're kind of lucky to have K-8 at all in their communities. And 9-12 is probably not realistic for BIE to consider. Okay. Okay. Um, but I want to follow up on, on your comments too, that um, I want to be clear. I, I think there are significant challenges facing Shanto. And I think the, the, the change in leadership in the past and probable change in leadership in the future is a, a serious issue um, in the motion uh, that, could be, that could be made. It talks about uh, a document identifying the further monitoring efforts. I, I would highly suggest to the staff that they um, seriously consider what those efforts would be. And I strongly encourage them to, to put some timelines in there for us so that we're not you know, letting this go on indefinitely. I, I would like to see, and it's probably more hopeful truthfully than, than confidence right now, but I'd like to see um, some real improvement made with Shanto. Otherwise I, I, otherwise I understand that the, the, the probable actions we would have to take Right. Yeah, Actually, we, oh yes, sorry, go ahead, Superintendent Hoffman. I didn't know if you wanted to hear more, more about where we're at. Yes, I do, please. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, um, I'm more where Hans is at this point and, and part of why is because just for example, um, last year I visited the Tohono O'odham Nation where they had had their own charter school and it, it was um, closed. They, because they were out of compliance and their charter was revoked. And that was at that time. Um, so now they don't have their own school. So now all of their students from Tohono O'odham go into Tucson um, for school. And that was really heartbreaking for that community. And that was something that they shared with me. So I, I just, I do want to also make um, the point of um, how meaningful it is for this community to have their own school with their own community leaders. And that it doesn't, that doesn't uh, minimize the significance of being in a completely unstable situation right now and, and having these significant compliance issues. Um, you know, one recommendation I would have for um, the school to consider is rather than, um, you know, rather than hiring, there, there's, there's some opportunities for consortium here, like for a business manager, you don't have to have your own business manager. Like they, you could seek other schools, um, maybe even like the star school that we heard from earlier, maybe they could have the same business manager to make sure they get um, everything into compliance. So I think, um, you know, when I, when I think about our schools, especially in Navajo Nation and what they're going through right now, I, um, I'm just not in favor of, I wouldn't be in favor of revoking today, but, um, but putting, putting more supports in place and, um, and, and just give, I, I'm in favor of giving them a chance, especially considering the circumstances of this year. Mm -hmm. And Superintendent Hoffman, what supports would you, would you say are appropriate to put in place? Great question. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, I, I would, I would like to see them um, develop a, a clear plan of, of leadership and um, like when these positions will be filled um, and getting them, getting those pieces into place, I think it should be a huge priority. And, um, and I don't know if there's other, like, I wonder if the charter association could be doing more and, um, and also providing them with consultants or others who can help them develop a strategic plan. Like I agree, it shouldn't be all on the board staff to provide those supports, but, um, but there are, um, there are people out there that, you know, like consultants um, and other agencies that I think could give them a lift up. Mm -hmm. And then and not to put you on the spot, I'm just trying to process to make this make sense. So then, and so then where's the accountability piece for us? So how do we monitor the accountability of that? Because obviously we can't force the association necessarily to give them a free membership or we can't, I mean, do you know what I mean? So what's the, what would be the accountability on our end to ensure that this is happening? I mean, I definitely think there should be a consent agreement of some sort put into place. I don't know exactly what that would look like, but um, I, I do think that Toronto should have to come back before the board within a year to demonstrate their progress and um, and to have data to show, you know, whether including benchmark data, um, 
So I, I do think that there, we do need to have expectations um, that they would come back before the board in the next year. Right. Right. Ashley, I, and I don't, I don't know if this is appropriate, if I'm even allowed to ask you this, but I'm going to, and you can just tell me no, but um, what's the, what, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you guys are the board staff and I'm just curious your thoughts on kind of th this piece that I'm trying to get answered of what would, what would the, what would your job, what would our job be? You know, what, what could we set up to have some sort of monitored piece going forward with, with very specific timeline and benchmarks. And again, we're going to be giving them timelines and benchmarks during a pandemic that in a year from now, if they come back and say, well, due to the pandemic, I mean, you know, I just, I don't know. I, I, I'm having a hard time. I hear what you guys are saying and I don't, and nobody wants to close this school down. I, I don't, this doesn't make me feel good. I also, but on the same sense, I, I, I don't, I don't know that we have a clear plan or that we're going to come to a consent agreement that makes sense. And that, so I'm trying to just make sure that we have that conversation and really talk about those points and, and kind of get that hashed out before we say, oh, we're going to do this. And then we're not able to, you know, in a month or two months from now, come to something from, you know, come to something that an actual plan that, that we can hold them accountable to. And so, Ashley, I'd be curious on kind of what your thoughts are as far as a board staff perspective of being able to create a consent agreement that had something like this, because it's, it's definitely different than any consent agreement that we would have had moving forward for many of our other charters. Yeah, presently, you're, you're absolutely correct. This is... Um this would be a different consent agreement than we have seen in the past. Um, what I would recommend is that we would continue to require um, and maybe extend the current consent agreement um, and or at least allow for um, that compliance to continue with the terms of the existing consent agreement. We'd also wanna look at, um, you know, just thinking based on this conversation, we could uh, require continual check-ins with the charter so that we understand if they do have turnover. I think that in the past, that has really been the biggest hurdle that staff has had with this school, just not knowing that there is new uh, staff or that there is a new charter representative um, so that we can ensure that communication is being provided to the school and that they have necessary information that um, our communications that we had sent out previously, maybe before that transition occurred. Um, so I'd say regular, regular check-ins, uh, we would need to put a plan in place for, and a timeline uh, for transitioning to um, the new charter rep and having a, having a plan um, that would require the, the charter to come back to the board to present on their plan and their status of that plan and transitioning and making sure that they do have someone that is overseeing the compliance for the charter school and not just the, the BIE school. We would also want to ensure that we put some parameters around the consent agreement that we would be looking at um, you know, in a year that we may not have uh, academic accountability. I think to the superintendent's right. point, we will need to look at internal benchmarks for this school um, year over year and, and throughout the year as well. Right. Uh, I think that it, it, may, it may need to be broad too, right? I mean, we may need to have some ability to bring the school back to the board just to continue to update you on where they're at just in general about their progress. You know, if they're, um, it sounds like going to a BIE school for the high school would be difficult. Um, but I think we just want to make sure that the board is continued to be updated as to what they're, they're seeing in the future and what their plans are for the future as well, not just for the transition, but for the school in general. Right. And Ashley, can you confirm, would they also be in violation next year of the consent agreement already due to the FY21, um, them already having read does not meet? Or is there a chance that that will come out of does not meet once all the other, you know, like if they only have one thing read? Yeah, so, um, well, with regard to the FY20 audit, we do not have the FY20 audit back, but it it is expected that there may be 
a finding in that audit due to this non-compliance that was identified in FY19. Right. We don't have that audit yet, so I, I can't make that um, determination. With regard okay. to the operational dashboard, it's my understanding that once we complete the corrective action plan for uh, FY20, that they will meet the board's operational expectations under that dashboard. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, board members, any other um, comments? Um, President Lee, so, yeah, I have a question for Ashley. Mm -hmm. How long does she think the it would take her and the staff, or the staff, to develop um, the document identifying further monitoring efforts? We does she think she do you think you could have it by January's meeting? President Lee, member Close, I, I do not believe that I can get a full consent agreement drafted with the charter's approval uh, prior to the January meeting. I think at earliest it would be February, and that's still pushing it. Um, what we do is we, we work with legal counsel to draft that consent agreement, and we have conversations with the charter to um, ensure that they would be in agreement prior to going to the board for, for your approval. Thank you. Hans, did you have any other, I mean, are you, are you still leaning towards heightened monitoring? Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out some type of timeline to work around. You know, I re I'd really like to see See, I'd really like us to revisit Shanto within the within the year, or uh, am I just again my confidence just isn't isn't really there as to what we'll see. Um, so, right. but yeah, I, I am leaning toward the, the further monitoring. Okay, um, board members, I, I think we might be split. So um, I, I don't know how how you're going to do this motion, Hans, but I know you do the motion. So um, why don't you motion? <laughs> you know, what, what you're thinking and, and we, you know, without any other input or, or board members, I mean, maybe so we don't have to make multiple motions. I mean, I just, um, un unfortunately, I, I, I think what we're trying to do, we're not ready to do. Um, I, as far, as far as, I, I guess I, I still am unclear on what, what we'd be able to create and stick to legally, um, that, that would work in this scenario. You know, I think it's tough because I think we had this conversation back in 2017, obviously with a different leadership team um, to, to do this, you know, to, to have them do these things. And um, so I, I, I just haven't heard anything that, may, that to me that is like, yes, that is the solution that will provide the necessary supports for this to be successful. Um, that's what I feel like is realistic. So I don't, um, so I guess that's where I'm at. So I don't, I don't know how that that helps you make a motion, Hans. Um, well, I don't I know if board members, that, yeah, go for it. Presently, the, the, the motion language I'm looking at is, talks about document identifying for their monitoring efforts to be brought back to the board. Um, I think that would be, that would be most helpful is to actually see language in front of us. Um, is it an option to table this until we have language in front of us? Are you suggesting like, can we table this to see if we can come up with some sort of monitoring, like specific timeline monitoring plan for them? And that's like, that would kind of fit what we're looking for. Is that, is that in short, maybe what you're suggesting? Am I understanding that correctly? You're understanding correctly. Yes. That's what I'm looking for. Ashley, what are your thoughts on just the legality of that? Can we do that? I mean, I think, uh, I'd hate to say no, just because we don't have time to create something that's good, you know, something that makes sense for this charter, but also, um, you know, again, Ashley, you'd be the one that says whether or not that's realistic for you guys to be able to do. 
but can we take, can we bring them back in January to rediscuss that? Like, can we table this and, you know, come back in January or February with maybe a more prepared document now that you kind of know where we're maybe leaning towards? Yes, um, we, um, in the reference language presented, there is a, an option three where you may take no action at this time and um, board staff can bring back additional information uh, to the board for consideration. Okay. Ashley, um, would, sorry, presently, um, would February be a, uh, a meeting that the, the board staff would, would, would support? Yes, um, I just wanna make sure it's very clear though, um, uh, we will, at that time we can, we can present to the board what board staff is recommending, um, but I believe um, at that point it would be most appropriate for the board to vote on, um, in consideration of not going to hearing to offer that consent agreement to the charter for their approval. And then if they don't, then we would go to hearing. So option Ashley, one. So Ashley, could we, so you're saying we have to make a vote now to say, because my fear is, is what if there's, what if the board doesn't come up with something that they agree to, right? Like that you get with legal counsel and they say, no, you can't get this specific or you can't do this or you can't, I don't want to be tied into a document that. Right that we can't have. So. You do not need to take action at this time. Um, rather that you would, you would move to postpone this item to a later date. And at that time, the board will bring a draft consent agreement. And then we can vote on, and then at that time we could vote to adopt the draft consent agreement or move to hearing. Uh, Vicki, is that, would that be appropriate? That would be appropriate um, with the consent agreement if the board was to um, approve that consent agreement. From what I'm, I'm understanding though, is if we draft a consent agreement and bring it back before the board before February, that's not, it's a document for board staff to review, not necessarily something that we are gonna be directly working with the school um, prior to that, or um, you may need to give me some clarification on that. Uh, are we discussing a consent agreement to be developed with the school prior to that February board meeting? Or are we talking about, um, which is not our usual process, putting the terms of a consent agreement before the board to see if that's something that satisfies or takes care of their concerns and then, um, presenting it to the school. We can do that. It's just not our usual practice. Um, so I guess, right. I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out, can we just, and I don't know the best way to do this. And I, and I is, I just want to make sure I, I'm not comfortable. And, and if I'm the only one, then, then we can vote and, and, and that's fine. You know, I just, I'm not comfortable saying, yes, we're going to do a consent agreement when I don't even know that we as a board can actually come to the, so what happens if we vote on a consent agreement today and then as a board, we don't find a consent agreement that we like, I guess, because this would not be your typical consent agreement. You can vote to direct uh, both staff and legal counsel to work on developing a consent agreement. Um, the terms of that consent agreement still would need to be approved by the school and of course by board. So if we came back to you with a consent agreement that the board members were not in agreement with, the board would not have to approve it at that time. I see. Okay. So that would be option one for Hans then? Yes. I see. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's all my questions. <laughs> um, board members, are there any other questions or comments about this? Um, Hans, go ahead and uh, make a motion and we'll see how it goes. All right. I'm going to do number one then. Okay. I move to find that a basis exists for the board to hold a hearing to determine if Shanto Governing Board of Education Incorporated 
has failed to comply with the January 2017 consent agreement. The board is authorized to exercise its legal discretion with regard to action taken against your charter holder. Due to extenuating circumstances, the board directs staff to work with the legal counsel, with legal counsel to develop further monitoring efforts to ensure Shanto Governing Board of Education Incorporated remains in compliance and maintains internal controls. The document identifying the further monitoring efforts will be brought back to the board for its consideration at a later board meeting. If the charter holder chooses not to accept the further monitoring developed by the board staff, then it is the board's decision that the charter holder be placed on a future agenda to proceed with a hearing before the board. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Carol Crockett. Sorry, with the roll call, please. Oh, okay, thank you, Ashley. You're welcome. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Um, Dr. Crockett. Aye. Uh, Mr. Mason. Aye. Mr. Twist. Aye. Mr. Swanson. I'm going to vote aye, but I'd like to just make a comment. I appreciate the uh, long discussion that the board had on this. This is a very important issue. <clears throat> I also feel uh, for President Lee and her concerns uh, that, you know, we this is a huge challenge we face in our state, and this relates to rural schools and quality education and how do we get there. And um, while I know we're going to ask for more stringent monitoring and uh, watching after this, I still think we will probably end up in the same place next year as we are this year. Um, but we also have no good choices uh, that, that are really easy for us to make at this point. Um, and I just, you know, I commend the board for talking this through. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that the the board staff can find the resources they need to try to help this school, or we can find other resources from the department or elsewhere to allow them to be able to build up the proper staff and infrastructure that they need to be successful. Thank you. Ms. Yanov. Aye. Ms. Rice. Aye. President Lee. Aye. Um, board motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. And Shanto, thank, thank you for being here and, and answering all of the questions. I know that was a long time and, and we really appreciate your time and um, you know, hope we can, we can find something to support you guys because we, our goal is definitely not, you know, to see you guys shut down. So thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> thanks. All right, um, next one. Sorry, let me find my place. I believe we have Andrea with the audits. Just one moment. No problem. State law requires charter schools to annually submit a financial audit and compliance questionnaire. For many of the board's charters, the audit is normally due by November 15th. In consideration of COVID-19's impact on school operations, and the governor's executive orders regarding the reopening of schools for the 2020-2021 school year. In August, the board voted to extend the fiscal year 2020 audit deadline to December 11th. Pursuant to board rule, a charter that fails to submit a complete audit by the audit deadline may be subject to charter oversight. More than 98% of the 287 audits due December 11th were timely submitted to the board. However, three audits excuse me, three charter holders have still not submitted complete fiscal year 2020 audits to the board and remain on today's agenda. Among other options, the board may vote to withhold up to 10% of the charter holders monthly state aid apportionment until a complete fiscal year 2020 audit is submitted to the board. If the board decides to withhold funds, 
the withholding would begin with the charter holder's January 1st payment. Once the charter holder has submitted a complete audit, the withheld funds would be returned with the charter holder's next regularly scheduled payment. Pursuant to state law, the charter school must be allowed to address the board before the board makes a final determination on whether to withhold funds. For board consideration, two of the charters provided written comments, which were emailed to board members on Monday. In its written comments, Flagstaff Montessori LLC's audit firm um, took responsibility for the untimely audit submission and believes that the audit will be submitted to the board by the end of this week. In its written comments, Paramount Education Studies Charter Representative indicates due to various issues, including a delay in receipt of information and complications caused by the pandemic, the audit was not completed timely and the charter has now retained a new audit firm. The charter anticipates that the audit will be completed by December 24th. I'm available for questions. Andrea, if we withhold funding on any of these charters, when when does that, um, what's the timeline for that 10% withholding? So in other words, like if they were to get their, um, you know, audits in by the end of December um, and we had voted to do the 10% withholding, would they, is, is that within their window to where then they wouldn't get the 10% withheld? The window's a little shorter than that. Um, ADE, okay. Um, has indicated that we have, um, that we can notify them on Monday, the 21st. So in the letter, okay. if you decide to withhold funds in the letter that goes out, we would be giving um, these schools until noon on the 21st to submit their audits. If they submit their audits by that time, then um, no funds would be withheld from the January payment. Okay. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh -huh. Okay, then is there a representative from Flagstaff Montessori LLC? And if so, um, could you unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and if you had any additional comments? Do we know if someone's on the line? I, I, I don't oh. believe so for um, both. Well, maybe so. someone just unmuted themselves, so I don't know. Hello. Okay. Hi. <clears throat> hey, yeah. Uh, so my name is Ike Ozis. I'm the head of school for Montessori School, um, Flagstaff Montessori LLC. And uh, I just received a copy of the letter that our audit firm submitted to um, Andrea. Um, so I think you should have a copy of that. Uh, he was planning to, the auditor was planning to come to our school uh, last week. We had all the documents um, ready, but then uh, I think he got sick and it was delayed. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we know. So on our end, we had all the documents ready. Uh, we uploaded all the documents requested to their portal. Um, and um, the firm failed to uh, submit the audit on time. So that's, that's our knowledge. And I think there's right. a letter accompanying um, that sent to um, the responsible yes. parties, yes. Yes, we did see that, thank you. And when, was the, when were they planning on having the audit finished? Uh, last week, uh, towards the end of last week, I think it was Thursday, um, as far as I remember. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, the future date. Um, so he, as of today, he said he was planning to submit it as of December 15th. So um, I will check in with him and, um, and can send an email to the board. Um, but that, that's the last I've heard from, from uh, our auditor. Oh, okay, so so today, essentially, he thinks that maybe by today. Okay. Yes, so, yeah, that's the date okay. I've heard, yeah. Okay, perfect. So it looks like, so board members, um, you know, technically, let's say he doesn't get in today, but, you know, it goes until next Monday. He still has until next Monday until the 10% would, you know, would go into place. I don't know where you guys are at, but for me, I would, I say then we do the 10% withholding, knowing that they'll most likely make it in prior to that and not, you know, get the 10% withheld. Are there? President Lee, yep. total agreement with you. Okay. 
and we, I'm assuming we make a motion per school. Is that is that correct, right? We don't take this as one motion? You may do either. You may take it as one motion if you plan to take the same action for all of the schools, or you may make separate motions for each school, oh, okay. whatever you prefer. Okay. Okay, then let's let all the schools uh, maybe speak first and then we can maybe do it in one motion, save save everybody a little bit of time. Um, but I wanna make sure schools have the opportunity to speak just in case there's you know something that they need to tell us. So, um, okay, thank you President so much. Lee, this if is Matt Mason, just to interject real quick. I formerly represented um, Flagstaff Montessori and I won't be voting on that item. Uh, so okay. I don't know if we wanna take them separately or not. If you do not take them separately, then I won't vote on any of them. And if you do, then I will just abstain from this one. Perfect. Um, Ashley, do we have quorum if Matt just abstains from the entire vote? You do. Okay, Matt, then unless you have any objections, we might just have you abstain from the entire vote. Is that okay? Or do you wanna no, take it separately? No, that's okay. fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, is there a representative from Paramount Education Studies, Inc.? And if so, could you unmute yourself at this time? And then maybe just quickly, um, if you could just give us what you believe your, your deadline will be for, for getting the audit in. I, th I think we said that we did not see a representative, correct? I think that's true. And they also submitted the written comments prior to the right. Meeting. Right. I saw that. And then Painted Desert. Is there a representative from Painted Desert? Yes. President Lee, uh, Superintendent Hoffman, and members of the board. This is Angela Hansen. I am the board president at Painted Desert Montessori. And <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to address you. Um, and we do apologize that this um, audit is late. We can tell you that um, we took over the, the school from the previous owner in January. And so <clears throat> the, it being late last year, we don't have much knowledge about because we weren't uh, part of the school uh, of, as of last year. But as of this year, um, we actually engaged our auditor in September. But because of um, issues or concerns that our auditor had with the previous owner, um, she did a bunch of background checks and vetting of uh, ourselves, the new board, and then um, was approved to do the audit on November 19th. She didn't start the audit until November 30th and then sent out um, uh, an invoice to us, but it was not addressed to Painted Desert. It was addressed to a different school. So we were not under the impression that we were going to be paying an, a, an invoice that wasn't addressed to us. Once we finished uh, or we um, fixed that miscommunication, she started the audit and we've been given right in writing that she will be done this month, but will not be done until December 28th. So that's after the date of that you're requesting on the 21st. So I just wanted to make clear, and we are uh, happy to submit that communication from her to the board if, if you so request. But just to let you know, that's where we, we are at. And we do apologize that it is late and we um, are not happy that it's late for a second year, but we don't, we didn't have any control over that, that previous year. Sure. And let me just make sure I understood you correctly. They said that December 28th is when they think the audit will be done. That's correct. And um, so it sounds like if you had the 10% withholding that it would just be for one month. Um, can you talk to me about what would happen if you guys, you know, had the 10% withholding, how, how, how does your school function with the 10% withholding? Well, it would be difficult um, just in terms of uh, some of the, obviously, the bills that we've had to pay. We've uncovered issues in the past, and so we've had to pay some things behind us that we didn't, we didn't know hadn't been paid in previous years. And so that would be a, a, a little bit of a hardship. But if it's just for one month, we obviously would know uh, how to get through that. Um, but that would be but we in fully anticipate that it will be done on the 28th. So sure. Sure. Okay. Um, board members, any questions or comments? 
Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's important for us to, you know, kind of stay consistent with with all of the charters. And it sounds like if it's just the one month. Um, hold on one second. Um, the I, something that I believe, and Ashley, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong, that for two year, a second year charter, um, they actually go historically, do we, do we put them on a consent agreement or do we do a 10% withholding again for the second year charters? President Lee, to be consistent with what we've done for charters in the past, if we have a charter that has been late on their audit for two consecutive years, the board has issued a 10% withholding and a consent agreement that would require um, the charter to stay in compliance with the audit deadline and having a timely submission or um, the board may choose to issue a notice of intent to revoke. Okay. And that consent agreement just says in layman's terms for, for me, um, it just mm -hmm. says you need to submit your audit on time the following year. Is that essentially what it is? It would likely be for three years, but yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, board members, do you have any I just would want to get your opinions on, on, on a consent agreement. I do know that the second year they did turn it in before the board meeting, but that's still considered late, right, Ashley? That is correct. Our deadline is at 12, the night of the deadline. So by 11.59. Okay. Okay. President Lee? Uh, yes. Jim Swanson. Um, these are, you know, as I've said before, at this time in these meetings, this is really an important part of the compliance and something that we use to, you know, really make sure that the schools are doing what they need to do. I understand the whole new man management argument, but I would like to, I think we should remain consistent and issue the um, uh, okay. consent agreement so that we can um, make sure that, you know, this is an issue two years in a row, we have to get it done so that would be my uh, way I would vote right. on this. Right. No, I, I, I agree. I think it's important that we remain consistent. So, okay. Um, board members, any other questions or comments? Okay. If not, Hans, could you can you do a motion for all three schools, please? All three not for consent. Or do, do we have to do them two separately? Yeah. You, yes, we would need to do them separately because... Um, you would just be doing the consent agreement for right. Painted Desert. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so you have to do two motions. Sorry yeah, about no that. No problem. Hans. Not a problem. Um, so my first motion is I move to find that the following charter holders, Flagstaff Montessori LLC and Paramount Education Service Studies Incorporated are not, in compliance, are not in compliance with state law and their charter contracts for their failure to submit their fiscal year 2020 annual financial audits and to approve withholding 10% of each charter holder's monthly state aid apportionment until a complete fiscal year 2020 audit is submitted to the board. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Mr. Twist, is there, um, oh, can you do the roll call please? If Alexis, you're on the line, otherwise Ashley. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman? Aye. Dr. Crockett? Aye. Mr. Mason? Oh, sorry. He's... Yep. Ms. <laughs> Rice? Aye. Mr. Swanson? Aye. Mr. Twist? Aye. Ms. Yana? Aye. President Lee? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Hans, with another one, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I move to find uh, Painted Desert Montessori LLC has failed to timely submit its fiscal year 2020 annual financial audit and has violated its charter contract and state law. This failure provides a sufficient basis to issue a notice of intent to revoke the charter contract of Painted Desert Montessori LLC. However, the board is authorized to exercise its legal discretion with regard to actions taken against a charter holder that is not in compliance with this charter or state and federal law. Therefore, the board direct 
the board directs staff to work with legal counsel to develop a consent agreement that addresses Painted Desert Montessori LLC's compliance with annual audit submissions. The consent agreement will be brought back to the board for consideration at a later board meeting. If the charter holder chooses not to accept the terms of the consent agreement developed by board staff, then it is the board's decision that the charter holder will be placed on a future agenda for the board to issue a notice of intent to revoke Painted Desert Montessori LLC charter contract for the reasons already specified. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Carol Crockett. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. A roll call, please. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Mr. Mason. Mr. Rice. Aye. Mr. Swanson. Uh, I vote aye. And just a shout out to the staff and all the other charter schools that were able to make their time commitment on this. I should, I, the very few that come through this process and get in trouble um, says a lot about the organization and um, the quality of all the schools that are able to get through it. So thanks. Mr. Twist. Aye. Ms. Yana. Aye. President Lee. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, board, I just have a quick question for you guys. Did you want to do a three to five minute break so you guys can go get a drink, do or you know, do whatever you need to do? Um, or do you just want to keep going? I just, we have new charters coming up, so it might be a little bit, but I just wanted to give anybody a chance to go grab a, you know, a coffee or whatever if you needed to, or are we, are we okay to keep going? President Lee, would it be okay if we took a quick five minute break just yep, to I, take some messages and grab a drink of water? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yep. Okay. So, so Ashley, is there anything, do I need to like motion to go to, I don't know, recess or something? I'm not sure. <laughs> to take a break. Uh, Vicki, I'm going to defer to you on that. No, no. Let's just make a quick motion that you're adjourning to take a break and the time that you'll return. Okay. I move that we adjourn to take a break until 1140. I have 1135 right now. Deccan, Carol Crockett. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. Um, can I just say all those in favor? Can we just do a group or do you need to do roll call? You can do roll call. Ashley, we do the roll call. Alexis, we do the roll call, please. Vice President, Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Mr. Mason. Ms. Rice. Aye. Mr. Swanson. Aye. Mr. Twist. Aye. Ms. Yano. Aye. President Lee. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thanks. All right. So we will come back at 1140. Thanks, guys. Don't forget to mute yourself. <laughs>
All right. Wanted to make sure we gave everybody that full, full minute of 1140 because I know we kind of ended a little um, late. As Can we do a roll call just to make sure everybody is back? Oh, are we back? We might need Mrs. another. Holmes, I'm back. Okay, thanks. Alexis and Ashley, are you guys back? Vice, Vice President Close. Perfect. Here. Superintendent Hoffman. Here. Dr. Crockett. Mr. Mason. Present. Ms. Rice. Present. Mr. Swanson. I'm here. Mr. Twist. Okay. Mr. Twist. Here. Ms. Yana. I'm here. President Lee. Here. You have a quorum. Okay, great, President thank you. Lee, yes. If I may, um, in reviewing the motion that was taken regarding Painted Desert Montessori, it was only for a consent agreement and not a 10% withholding. So I just wanna make sure that the board, um, if the board does wanna do a 10% withholding for Painted Desert that we reconsider. Um, I would like to reconsider. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, we can do that. Can we, um, how, how do we, you can, can we just you move can, to, go for you it. You can, you can make another motion um, for the 10% withholding. So you'd have two motions. You'd have the, um, the 10% withholding and also the motion for the consent agreement. Got it. Okay, Hans, do you mind making that motion? Yeah. I move to find that, that the following charter holder, Painted Desert Montessori LLC, is not in compliance with state law and, their, and its charter contract for its failure to submit its fiscal year 2020 annual financial audit and to approve withholding 10% of the charter holder's monthly state aid apportionment until its complete fiscal year 2020 audit is submitted to the board. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Rice. Um, if we could do the roll call. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Mr. Mason. Aye. Ms. Rice. Aye. Mr. Swanson. Aye. Mr. Twist? Aye. Ms. Yana? Aye. President Lee? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And Ashley, can we just, not that we wouldn't, but just can we make sure we reach out to that charter holder? Because if I was that charter holder, I would not have hung out for the rest of the meeting. So just to make sure that that's really clear that that was, uh, you know, that, that we did that, they might not be on the line right now. So. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay, so Rachel, it looks like you are up. New charter applications, and it looks like we have Albert um, Einstein Academy. So actually, President Lee, prior to considering the first applicant, we would like to provide some background information about the cycle itself, um, yes. both for board members and for the public. So here we go. <laughs> applicants were required to submit applications by a deadline of July 15th, 2020. The deadline was extended from June this year due to COVID. The applicants before you today have likely been working on these applications for a year or more. After submission, application packages were reviewed by board staff for administrative completeness, which includes ensuring that all materials are present and ready for review and that the application fee has been submitted. After the administrative review, applications are forwarded to, the, forwarded to the technical review panel or TRP to undergo the substantive review of the application package. Individuals for the technical review panel are recruited from across the country. Applicants for the TRP submit resumes and written responses to questions related to TRP qualifications. 
Board staff reviews these resumes and written responses and chooses top candidates with expertise in charter school business, operations, and academics. Once these individuals are chosen, teams of three are formed to review applications. Board staff strives to ensure that the experience on these teams is well balanced in each of the three areas that were previously mentioned and attempts to assign, app, assign teams to applications in which they may have greater expertise. For example, if an application indicates that it will serve an alternative population as defined by the Arizona Department of Education, we try to assign the application to a team with experience and expertise with that population or chosen model. Additionally, applications and team members are reviewed to ensure that any potential conflicts are avoided. For example, if an applicant intends to open in a certain city, the team is comprised of individuals who do not have charters in that city or surrounding areas and are not currently looking to expand to that area. These processes help to ensure that each team reviewing an application is doing so objectively and without conflict. The board's criteria for substantive completeness is defined in the publicly released new charter application instructions. Using rubrics, the TRP reviews the application packages against the criteria set by the board, first through independent individual reviews, then through a consensus process that includes all three team members. After this initial review, the completed rubrics are released to the applicants, and they are given the opportunity to revise and resubmit their application packages based on the feedback provided by the TRP in the rubric. When the application packages are resubmitted, they will go through a final review by the TRP against the same criteria, and once again, these rubrics, which include feedback, are provided to applicants. If the application is substantively complete, it proceeds to the interview none of the applications before you was substantively complete. These applicants have each requested for the substantively incomplete applications to proceed to the capacity interviews. At that point, the TRP conducts a capacity interview with each applicant team. This opportunity is used to gain clarification on any areas of deficiency that still remain in the application and also to assess the capacity of the applicant team. To do this, the TRP asks questions about the application itself, providing the applicant the opportunity to address questions and concerns the TRP may still have after the review of the paper application. This may be in areas that met the standard or those that did not. These questions may also relate to concerns the TRP has about the viability or sustainability of the applicant's plan. Additionally, the TRP may ask scenario-based questions to understand the capacity of the team and its ability to work through situations or problems that may arise with the plans described in the application. After these interviews, the TRP confers to determine whether to provide the board a recommendation to approve or deny each application package. The TRP uses information from the paper application and the capacity interview to make this recommendation. Finally, the team leads with input from their additional team members write the recommendation reports using information gathered from the application package, rubrics, and capacity interview. These reports are included in the board materials you have before you today. As outlined, the new charter application process is one that is both rigorous and lengthy with many levels of review conducted by qualified individuals. And at this time, I'll present Albert Einstein Academy, which is item L2. Um, it is important to note that the applicant for L1 did withdraw their application, so they are no longer included. Albert Einstein Academy Arizona has submitted a new charter application package to open Albert Einstein Academy, serving grades K through 12. The TRP evaluated the application package and determined that the revised application package met the minimum scoring requirements set by the board for the 2021-22 application cycle because the applicant's educational plan scored 97.81%, the operational plan scored 100%, and the business plan scored 100%. However, the application was not substantively complete because two sections in an area of the educational plan scored as an approaches. After receiving the scoring rubric, the applicant did request to proceed to the capacity interview. Based on responses provided at that interview and additional information provided at the app by the applicant at the interview, the TRP recommends that the revised application package for the applicant be denied. I'm available for any questions you may have today. Board members, are there any questions for Rachel? Okay. If not, then is there a representative from Albert Einstein Academy? And if so, can you please unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and if you have any statement you'd like to make before we ask questions, go for it. Hi, yes, I'm Dr. Lacey. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, good morning, Superintendent Hoffman and President Lee and board. And on behalf of our board and staff, I wanna thank you for all you are doing during this very difficult and unique time. I can assure you it has not gone unnoticed in our community. Again, my name is Donna Troisi, and I serve as the chair of the board for Albert Einstein A Academy Arizona, AEA. Thank you for the opportunity to share our vision and specifically to address the concerns raised during the application process to date. AEA Arizona is a culmination of years of plan work and planning. I met Mark Blazer, a successful educator in California, about 10 years ago when we were both attending a charter school meeting in New York. At that time, I was interested in opening a STEAM-based charter school in the Scottsdale area, and Mark was opening similar schools in the Los Angeles area. Through Mark's hard work, the Los Angeles schools opened and thrived and eventually helped serve as an inspiration for AEA Arizona. Since then, my passion and drive to open a STEAM-based school with language integration in Scottsdale has continued to grow. Our vision is to establish a college preparatory school based on an interdisciplinary curriculum, offering multiple foreign languages where students gain cultural awareness to become kind, tolerant, and educated people. To help turn this vision into reality, we have brought on board the brilliant and talented Megan Myers to champion the K through six grades and our incredibly experienced educational expert, Dr. Greg Sappos, to join us at the high school level and overall school administration. I'm thrilled to have Megan and Greg and the entire AEA Arizona board with me here today. Our board, with each with our own unique talent and area of expertise, have provided the vision for this school. If each board member would quickly introduce yourselves, starting with Andy. Sure, good morning, Andy Baran. I'm a uh, former executive, uh, serial entrepreneur, and a consultant here in the Valley. And my role on the school board is finance uh, and, uh, and accounting control. Donna? Hi, everyone. I'm Donna Pfeffer. I am the secretary for the AEA Arizona board. I'm a mom of four kids, ranging from middle school to college. And I moved to California, I mean, from California here three and a half years ago. My kids attended the AEA School of California. I was the PTO president of the elementary school. I just quickly wanted to share because I am very excited about this idea of bringing AEA to Arizona. My kids thrived under the AEA model. My son currently is at ASU Barrett Honors. And with his background in technology, and language Hebrew that he took, he is now working with Israel, helping consult startup companies through a program through ASU. I am very excited to see something come to fruition here in Arizona that can bring that opportunity to so many more students, as well as my youngest. I'd like to introduce David, who will next speak. Good morning, thanks for having us. My name is David Massbaum, and I'm on the board primarily because of my parents. Both were K through 12 teachers and they instilled in me a love of learning. I'm currently, <clears throat> excuse me. I am currently president and CEO of Copini LLC, and I provide IT, email, and website expertise. Carolyn. Hi, good morning. My name is Carolyn Benger. I am a board member of AEA. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, review our application. Uh, I am the founding principal of KB Enterprise Consulting Firm, where I consult with nonprofit organizations. I'm a commissioner with the City of Phoenix on the Human Relations Commission, and I serve on the Arizona Interfaith Movement. Um, I have deep extensive networks in the community, which I am eagerly looking forward to sharing with AEA uh, in my role uh, involving community outreach, community relations, and marketing. Um, additionally, 
I am the mother of two boys who I hope will attend this school. And as the child of immigrants and someone who was married to an immigrant, I recognize the importance and need for diversity in languages being offered and the, and the need for having a global outlook in our school system. Thank you. And I'd like to take uh, just a minute to introduce three members who were not at the TRP capacity interview, our newest incoming board member, Ricky Light, and our two employees. So I will start with our newest incoming board member, Ricky Light. Uh, Ricky, you could wave. <laughs> Ricky Light holds a master's degree in school administration from Pepperdine University and a master's in counseling from Niagara University. She has 40 years of international experience as a special educator with 20 years in public education and 20 years as an educational advocate for children with unique learning, behavioral, social, emotional, and developmental needs. Ricky is affiliated with the Melmed Center and has extensive background in special education law. Ricky has presented locally, nationally and internationally on topics related to special education. Ricky will join the board with a focus on the special education needs of our future scholars. Dr. Greg Sakos holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies from Arizona State University and a Master's degree in Educational Administration from Northern, Northern Arizona University. With an extensive leadership career in education, Greg's most recent educational administrative work has been as superintendent for several small rural districts and schools within our state's Native American communities, including that of the Hopi, Gila River, and Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian communities. Among many of Greg's efforts is fostering an awakening process that enables stakeholders the opportunity to use data to support student academic improvement. Dr. Sackos has 34 years in education profession and has been pra a practicing administrator in Arizona since 2002. Megan Myers holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Linfield College and a Master of Arts degree from Portland State University. Megan comes to us from most recently serving as assistant principal at Academy Math and Science Glendale K through eight. Previous to that, she was the founding principal of an arts integrated STEM charter school in Nevada. Megan specializes in leading teachers through rigorous curriculum and assessment design. She is a champion of quality instruction and wants to develop a team of innovative, hardworking professionals whose passion is to inspire students to change the world for the better. To, continue, to continue our opening remarks, Megan will describe the school's program of instruction as described in the application. Thank you, Donna, and good afternoon, board members. The overarching framework chosen by Albert Einstein Academy to provide students with rich interdisciplinary experiences K-12 is a STEAM framework. We feel this instructional model prepares students to work in fields poised for growth and that STEAM skills and knowledge can transfer to any career. Albert Einstein Academy's integrated STEAM in approach attends to inspire innovation and cultivate a love of learning and invention by involving students in solving real life problems where the work is meaningful and impacts the world. The Albert Einstein Academy's program of instruction will be based on Arizona state standards in reading and writing, speaking and listening, mathematics and literacy and history, social studies, science and technical subjects. The progressions or building blocks of knowledge outlined in the Arizona State Standards for each subject will guide our teachers to ensure success for all students. One instructional approach that will be utilized at Albert Einstein Academy is project-based learning. Project-based learning is proven to be effective for all learners from gifted and talented to English learners to students with special needs. Framed by a meaningful problem to be solved or question to answer, projects are focused on students acquiring key knowledge and skills through sustained inquiry. 
Students will give, receive, and apply feedback to improve their processes and products. At the end of the project, students make their projects public by sharing with people beyond the classroom. During the in-person interview, the technical review panel asked about the use of technology in our STEAM program. Technology will be used not just as a tool, rather to empower our students through the learning process. Students will use technology to demonstrate creativity and innovation, communicate and work collaboratively, manage projects, solve problems, etc. Albert Einstein Academy will use the International Society of Technology and Education Standards for students and teachers to integrate technology according to its provided framework to leverage student learning. To address the TRP's recommendation report regarding how the arts fit into Albert Einstein's instructional model, the A in STEAM will represent liberal arts, language arts, social studies, physical arts, fine arts, and music. Students will apply creative thinking to STEM projects, igniting students' imagination and creativity through the arts. How we will implement this instructional model is as part of professional development, teacher teams will create and design curriculum complete with learning targets, assessments, and rubrics to ensure high quality instruction. Greg will now address the target population and transportation as it relates to the TRP recommendation report. Thank you, Megan. Good afternoon, board members. From the recommendation report, we want to assure you that the students residing in the application zip codes of 85254 and 85255 are the intended students for the proposed school. AEA's proposed opening sites are in the zip codes of 85254 and 85255. Uh, though our application denotes the target population, be aware that there are surrounding zip codes such as 8505, 85032 that will be in close proximity to the school and will draw the interest of our aspiring students. Arizona is an open enrollment state and our goal, if possible, is to serve those students aspiring to the mission and vision of the school and their quest to be college and career ready in a global world. The demographic data from these areas show approximately 65% of the population completing some college or higher education. In addition, approximately 60% of the same group has attained a bachelor's degree or higher. The employment sectors of this target population range from sciences to finance to arts and even to education. As such, their education philosophy is reflected by the vision and mission of AEA, of which believes in the delivering education that aims to prepare students for post-secondary success by imparting a breadth of knowledge across disciplines to raise lifelong learners who have extensive global view and cultural awareness with proficiency in multiple languages. Recent data shows those schools in the zip codes of 85254 and 85255 have an average math score of 62% and reading proficiency scores of 66%. While this data outperforms Arizona public schools, it is our goal to have our students perform at an 81% proficiency rate. If this charter is approved, AEA will be one of the only schools in the area offering a K-12 STEAM program based, excuse me, STEAM based college preparatory educational program. AEA is also committed to best serving the target population by establishing a small school environment where students receive personalized instruction with project-based learning experiences from the small teacher to student ratios that will be in place. At AEA, we will support recruitment and enrollment practices to promote inclusion for all students. This is includes eliminating any barriers to enrollment for edu educationally disadvantaged students. We firmly believe by growing AEA to create a diverse school environment that we are preparing students to live out their future life as part of a diverse culture by learning to emphasize, live, learn, and collaborate with people who are not like them. I hope this helps the board better understand our market area and how we intend to support it. We would also like to clarify the discrepancy as noted in the TRP report regarding transportation. The TRP report is correct in that on page two of the three-year operational budget assumptions, it will be assumed transportation will not be budgeted for. We will always look, we will always be looking for ways to support families who want to attend AEA. These plans include carpool groups arranged by AEA based on family geographical data, 
Our staff will compile lists of families and help coordinate the use of carpooling to alleviate the burden of multiple families commuting similar distances. Student ride sharing services. The governing board is exploring the use of student ride sharing services that operate much like popular app-based taxi services. Given an appropriate amount of demand, AEA Arizona may con contract with a student ride sharing service for students and families in need who wish to participate free of charge. AEA Arizona has already reached out to Ride Zoom, a company that currently provides transportation options for over 10,000 schools nationwide to explore partnership and service of the AEA Arizona students. Additional plans or programs will be implemented as necessary based upon future discussion with families as part of the community engagement process or as AEA Arizona develops more community partnerships themselves. We continue to seek additional funding to expand our ability to provide comprehensive transportation service for our students to make sure that they are safely uh, and safely and effectively transported to and from school. Donna will now complete our introductory remarks before we take your questions. Thank you. AEA Arizona will be a model school for bringing together STEAM and language opportunities, preparing our students for the global economy with internship and leadership roles. Through our board's strong community networks, we are able to support these unique educational opportunities. I hope we have addressed any concerns your board might have. We are so excited with our progress to date and look forward to bringing our vision to reality in the months ahead. Thank you again for your time and consideration of our application. We will be happy to answer any additional questions you may have. All right, thank you so much for that, guys. Um, board members, are there any questions? Okay, um, so I have a couple. Um, first off, it and and you addressed some of them, so um, I'm gonna um, ask ask a couple, maybe more clarifying ones. But I appreciate your your guys is looking at the TRP responses and and being prepared for for today. Um, so one of the questions was, it's, it's my understanding, so this school is, is in Scottsdale, you're talking about serving Scottsdale students, but yet in the interview, you started talking about serving, you know, the whole of Phoenix and specifically um, there was a, a Syrian refugee population that you were looking at, at, maybe targeting is the wrong word, but that you had identified um, for your school. Can you talk to me about, um, can you talk to me about that piece? And then I know I think that's kind of where the concern for tra transportation came into play. Um, so if you could elaborate on that some, that would be great. So I'll start and then Greg, if you want to add, but um, please note that the Syrian refugee community is targeted for us, but they are not in a specific area. They are spread out, including um, very appropriately in the near the 85254 zip code. So there's no area where the Syrian refugees live. Um, so that's how that was brought up. And Greg and Carolyn, if you need to add, but Greg, go ahead. I mean, is there a, is there a, sorry, let me just clarify, right? Like, so is it, are you, um, I mean, do you have like ties to people that you know that are, that you're going to be targeting, like to bring that population in? Like what's, what's the relationship, I guess, between you and, the, and that target population and how are you, how are you getting that target population to your school? Or is that part of your school's mission or? Mm -hmm. No, we're just offering the Arabic language. So we thought it would be appealing for um, people who, whose native tongue is that if they're living here now that their children um, can learn that language as well. And Carolyn, uh, Carolyn works, as she said, in the interfaith community and has spoken to um, people from that demographic who has a strong interest in attending our school. Carolyn, do you wanna add? Absolutely, yes. Um, so, so as noted, the Syrian refugee community is not, you know, in one particular sure. location, but the leadership of their community, and there is a substantial number of them in Scottsdale, actually. And one of their um, community leaders uh, I have been in contact with, and uh, he is very supportive of this project and is interested in, ex in doing further outreach so that his community members can participate. I can say, again, as I mentioned in my in my intro, I'm the child of immigrants, and uh, there's a lot of pressure on the children of immigrants to conform very quickly, and pressure on their families to learn English and and adapt to it quickly. 
and many immigrant families uh, are torn between wanting their children to learn their language from their home country and wanting to um, quickly adapt and acculturate into the American system. And we feel that this school is really bridging a gap for those families. And, and if I may, again, uh, our, our application is very clear about the target zip codes, uh, but also understand that that location uh, provides accessibility from various freeways and surrounding zip codes. As we build this model, uh, not necessarily targeting specific students, but knowing that there'll be students of interest who want to come to our school and have that availability. So again, we want to clarify that with you guys to fully understand that. So it sounds like a, a big focus though. It sounds like you've already for recruitment, right? Which I mean, which all schools need to do that, right? You want to make sure you have people who are interested in coming to your school. Um, it, is this, you know, Syrian refugee population, right? I think some of the concern was, is that that wasn't necessarily noted in the application and it, uh, it, but then on top of that, so so, what what do you guys have set in place to address that specific community um, as part of your school model? So that's not our, you know, that is one of the populations we're targeting. But I will say we've done extensive marketing in the eight five two five four and eight five two five five, and there was strong interest particularly within the 85254 um, uh, zip code of attending our school that is not of the Syrian community. So this was just something after, you know, we, we um, submitted our charter that Carolyn has um, met with people in her line of work and they came to us expressing a strong interest. If, if I can add, this was the result, honestly, of an evolution in our marketing that, that came after the application was submitted. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and so what, so talk to me about then your curriculum and how you're focusing on this idea of world languages. Um, you know, it sounds like, so you're gonna offer, you know, how many world languages, what does that look like, um, that piece? So Megan, do you wanna take that? Um, yes, so our language program, we, we are looking to offer five different languages. And again, I think um, when we get enrolled students, it's going to be based on an interest about what um, we will serve, but we have listed five different languages that will be offered in our application. So that is our language. Um, students in high school will take a language all four years. And um, besides that, in our curriculum model, um, we will be utilizing um, tier one instruction to involve all of our students in um, grade level standards and projects. And so language will be one of their, um, another course offering as part of their college preparatory um, progression. So, so, okay, so you're gonna offer five languages at the high school level? Only. Wow. So if I'm a kindergartner, how, how does the language get integrated? I'm sorry, the languages will be offered at all grade levels. Um, and I, I'm not sure if kindergarten, if we start in kindergarten, but it will be offered in the elementary grades. I know um, just from experience coming from um, my previous school, students in kindergarten were offered Mandarin and other languages and they thrived with that starting young and early. So we hope to um, replicate that similar idea. Um, but you don't have a plan right now that you can tell us on what, I, that just seems to be a huge focus, right? That keeps coming up in your application, this idea of languages, but you don't have a solid plan yet as far as what that language integration looks like K-12, is that correct? Okay, so the language classes offered are going to be Latin, Hebrew, Arabic, Spanish, and Mandarin. So mm -hmm. th that is what's offered as a language class. For, for a kinder, so a kindergartner has a choice of five different languages? Yes, yes they will. 
So what, and what obviously so there there's there's um there's already information out on you know how to teach language at specific grade levels so like for example I, i'm just so for hebrew i am already in touch with somebody who has a great program for kindergartners so we are going to integrate depending on their interest in the language um either hebrew or arabic or mandarin for the kindergartners into their daily curriculum and they'll pick what I get. I'm just trying to, I, I guess I don't feel like, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding and I could be. So, um, cause yes, my, my son is in kindergarten, you know, he takes, you know, multiple, he, you know, he, I think a lot of schools are doing that. I think, I think it's really great, but, but I guess I'm confused as to how your model is going to work. Um, so, so what is your starting? And I don't see this in the documents. I'm sure it's there. What, what's, what do you plan on your starting kindergarten size to be? Like how many classes do you plan on running based on the enrollment that you guys, you know, are projecting? Yes, we hope to have three kindergarten classes to start with. And obviously a kindergartner may not know. Um, and so parents will have to be involved in choosing what they want their students to begin studying. Um, so, so we will survey parents um, to see what the right. interest is. And then that student will, when we hopefully be enrolled in that class for the year. So is, if, just to just mm -hmm. to clarify, it's not an immersion model. Um, the the language is a a separate study. Yes. Okay, because I think that you guys just said that the language was going to be throughout the core content areas as well. So that's not the case. Um, no. To clarify, they will have um, language in their day, but it will not be an integration into the um, subjects like we will with STEAM curriculum. Okay. Um, Madam President, just to let you know, in their um, management and operation plan submitted in their application, they indicate 50 kindergartners in year one and 80 in years two and three. Okay, thank you. So 50 kindergartners, that's at least two classrooms, ideally three, but probably two. <laughs> um, and I, I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to make sure that, that you guys have, uh, I, I'm struggling to see see that you guys have a clear, concrete plan. I know that there's a lot of talk about, well, we'll see what happens when the students get here and what the, what the, what they want. But, you know, a lot of times what happens, especially with charters is, is those students are getting there the day before or, you know, two weeks in. And what if you have a whole class that wants Mandarin and, or, you know, it's a 50, 50 split of Mandarin and Hebrew or, and are, are, like, do you plan on having live teachers just with all five areas and you're going to do small groups with students pulling them out like I, I guess I, I still don't understand that you guys have a solid plan on that so obviously we will yes we will have live teachers but obviously too if somebody comes in the day before and it's the one student who wants mandarin you know we will do our very best to accommodate but you know we're going to have enrollment forms and you know we're going to get to know because it will be a small school we're going to get to know the the families that are enrolling in our school and do our best to accommodate every single student and their language preference but can we guarantee that if nobody picked mandarin and the day before they come to the school this child wants mandarin Mandarin on day one, uh, you know, no, but, but will we try to make that happen? Absolutely. We will. Okay. All right. Talk to me. If you guys talk about the, this model from California, who um, are you bringing someone? You, Cause you called it the Albert Einstein education school of California. Um, and you're saying that you want to be the Albert Einstein. Um, I think, uh, sorry, the AA school of Arizona. So do you have somebody from their leadership team coming to help it, do that model? No, not at all. I just worked with Mark because when I met him years ago at the, at the conference that we both attended, I just loved his model. So we have been in touch and I'm just using that model. And personally, I loved the name. I just, it embodies everything that I believe in where each child can be unique. Each child can um, just understand the world in his or own best way with, without having, you know, strong structural, um, rigorous you know, ways of learning. Um, and it just embodies me and it embodies, I think, our whole board's vision of where we want to go. So we just actually chose to use the name. So what time, okay, so, so you're using the name, but not the actual model of the school in California. Just some, we just took, you know, from what they have done to be successful and, and are using some of that um, as a basis for our growth. And so you've met like with their leadership team to determine what they've done to be successful or did you Correct. just, 
uh, and talk to me about meeting with their team. That was like in an official capacity. You went and spent time at the school. What did you do to kind of gain knowledge of, of their uh, format? Um, I, I just uh, reconnected with Mark and, and picked his brain <laughs> and he helped me, you know, just form this vision that we now presented to you to open up in Arizona. That was like one meeting, multiple meetings, like he actually showed you what curriculum he's using? In person twice and then because of COVID, we spoke on the phone weekly at least. Okay. President Lee, it is board staff's yeah. understanding that those California schools are no longer open based on some information that we did find um, through some searches. Okay, and that's Mark, Mark, and I know you said this, but Mark is the founder of the AEA Schools of California or? Yes. I see. Um, and you didn't want him, is he on, the, is he on your guys' board at all? No, no. Okay. This is an Arizona-based board. It's an Arizona charter school. Sure. And what and what curriculum are you guys going to be using? Well, we have not um, set on a, an exact curriculum, um, but we do have a rubric for when we get a cur our curriculum team together that we will use to um, use the criteria for the mission and vision of the school to purchase curriculum. We are going to stay close to the standards. Um, the science standards and all the, um, the Arizona state standards, that's going to be our foundation, of course. And then um, that will be part of the work of our curriculum team, which if and when we get approved will be our next step. And if I may add with uh, foresight, uh, obviously with relating to COVID uh, on how to support uh, the curriculum of choice, uh, so that if we do hybrid or some distance learning, we can still deliver the instructional model that we want. Right, right. <sighs> okay. Um, so I, I guess, I, I think you guys have a good, I, I, uh, good ideas. Um, I, it just doesn't seem cohesive, like that we have the answers. And my guess is that's probably what the TRP kind of felt the same way is well, that, yeah, go for it. Well, if I may, um, I did not have um, my now um, two very highly skilled educators um, at the TRP. Um, and that was my misunderstanding. I, I did not realize that if they were not mentioned in the charter, they couldn't attend the, the interview. Um, so having said that, we have such a strong leadership team now, professional leadership team, that we are we are so cohesive. And and I, you know, I, I wish I could have spoken as the the educators that will be taking our vision to fruition during the TRP, but I, I couldn't. But having Megan and Greg here now, um, you know, I believe we are a slam dunk for cohesiveness and consistency to get this done. And we're all our vision is so aligned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Board members, do you have any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, if not, then is there a motion? President Lee, this is Hans. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to follow the um, recommendation of the TERP. Okay. Okay, ready? Yes, based, please. Based, based upon a review of the contents of the portfolio provided for Albert Einstein Academy, Arizona, and the, and the information provided by representatives of Albert Einstein Academy, Arizona, during consideration, and given it is within the discretion of the board to approve or deny a charter, I move to reject the application package and deny Albert Einstein Academy, Arizona's request for a charter for the reasons that, one, the applicant did not demonstrate the capacity to implement a program the program of instruction as described in the application package. And two, the applicant's responses during the capacity interview were inconsistent with the plans presented in its application package, specifically in the areas of target population and transportation. Is there a second? Thank you, Dr. Crockett. Roll call, please. We get it. 
Alexis, are you for the roll call, please? I will go ahead and go through the roll call. Here Thank we. you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Close. Aye. Super, uh, Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Matt Mason. Aye. Mr. Twist. Mr. Twist. Ms. Rice. Aye. Mr. Swanson. Aye. Ms. Yanoff. Aye. President Lee. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. All right. Um, next one, Co-Learn Co Club, Inc. Rachel. All right, I had to find the mute button. All right. Co-Learn Club, Inc. has submitted a new charter application package to open Co-Learn Academy Arizona, serving grades K through 12 in an online program. The TRP evaluated the application package and determined that the revised application package does not meet the minimum scoring requirements set by the board for the 2021-2022 application cycle because the applica applicant's educational plan scored 76.72% and the business plan scored 79.38%. The applicant did score a 100% in the operational plan. After receiving the scoring rubric, the applicant requested to proceed to the capacity interview. Based on the responses and additional information provided by the applicant at the capacity interview, the TRP recommends that the revised application package for the applicant be approved, but with strong reservations. Additionally, the applicant proposes to open an online school. Therefore, it was required to submit an Arizona online instruction additional information package as a component of its written application, which did meet the required criteria based on the Rio Salado review. I'm available for questions if you have any. Board members, are there any questions for Rachel? Okay. If not, then can the representative um, from CoLearn Club Inc. please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and if you have any statement, now's the time. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon now, uh, Superintendent Hoffman, President Lee, and members of the board. We are very grateful to be here, and I'd like to introduce myself and along with the rest of the team. My name is Denise Jarvis, and I will be the Executive Director of CoLearn Academy. I believe in education as a pathway to success, and I am dedicated to offering that opportunity to all students. In pursuit of that effort, I have been active in education settings of various forms. I have been a classroom teacher, a homeschooling parent, a co-op organizer, and a micro school guide. I am currently the director of a program servicing 170 students that offers parents support, feedback, and resources as they educate their children at home. I am a certified Arizona teacher and I'm currently enrolled in a doctoral program at the University of Arizona. I'm working towards my principal certificate and an EDD in educational leadership. My area of focus is parent involvement in K-12 education and its positive impact on student outcomes. This is at the heart of the CoLearn Academy model. I would like now to um, welcome Ms. Michelle Spencer to introduce herself. Hi. Uh, I'm Michelle Spencer, one of the authors of CoLearn's charter application. If the charter is approved, I will be the only individual on both the corporate board and a non-voting member of the school governing board. I hold a master's degree in educational management and valid teaching and administrative uh, credentials. I have over 20 years in public education, including founding a big picture learning charter school, being an administrator at a K-12 home school independent study charter and being the principal of New Technology High School, which is the flagship school of the New Tech Network that has over 200 schools modeled after it across the United States. In my previous role as a district office administrator, uh, director of teaching and learning, 
I supported 7,200 students across 12 elementary and high schools. I was a Western Association of Schools and Colleges, WASC, uh, accreditation chairperson for five years. Recently, I've been in the EdTech world surge where I formed relationships with over 200 school districts across the United States to help them find the right fit technology aligned to their pedagogy to move the needle on student learning. I'm co-founder at CoLearn Club with Michael, who will now introduce himself next. Hello, is this thing on? Am I, yes, we can hear am you. I on? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I, I, can, I can see Michelle, so I can't see myself. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Michael Staten. I'm one of the co-founders of CoLearn. Um, uh, I have spent the past 20 years in education. I started as a public school teacher in Houston, Texas. Uh, I've been involved in education technology for the past 15 years. And for the past nine years, um, I've been involved in funding innovators in, uh, in education. So... Uh, innovators like Edmodo, Class Dojo, Quizlet, Kahoot, etc. Um, I am excited to be here and answer questions. Next up, we would like to introduce Tina Littell, one of our governing board members, the school governing board. She unfortunately had to leave um, just a short time ago, but uh, Tina is uh, securing her master's of science in curriculum and instruction uh, right now. And she is credentialed in K-8 teaching by the Arizona Department of Education. She will sit on our board, but she is employed as vice president of school management and academic at K-12. She's been with K-12 in that senior role for 13 years. And in that role, she oversees public charter schools across the United States, including managing a team of over 1,000 school administrators and teachers. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Tom Tafoya, who is also one of our school governing board members. Tom? Hey, Yes, thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm a uh, chief business official for a charter school in Northern California, I have about 30 years experience in uh, public education. And um, in that role, I've been uh, involved for the past 16 years uh, as a chief executive officer for, uh, excuse me, chief executive operating officer for this charter school that serves over 7,000 students in a non-classroom based model. Um, my education background is I have a master in science for, uh, in computer information systems, an MBA in uh, uh, computer information systems, as well as the CPA license here in the uh, state of California, which is currently inactive. And so um, look forward to participating and helping uh, provide this innovative model for uh, personalized learning for kids in Arizona. And Tom's experience with the current charter school that he is with, um, that school has been going strong for over 20 years. Thank you for that, yes. Uh, <laughs> the school has been in operation for 20 years. Uh, I came on as a, uh, as a person to help turn it around when we came on from an operational standpoint. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of growth initially that uh, was, was challenging. And so we helped build a lot of systems and technology to, to really, uh, Put the organization on a positive uh, pathways and so um, we've grown about 10 percent the last uh, 10 years and you know we're currently serving over 7,000 students in the, the northern california area um, with um, extensive waiting lists given the covid circumstance and, and really this model is really lends itself well to the covid circumstance next up i'd like uh alex rickin to introduce himself thank you michelle I've spent the last 12 years working in digital learning products, essentially how to combine design, technology, and learning science to make things that are more effective, uh, either at access or outcomes. I'm the chief product officer for Podium Education. We serve universities across the country by building and running minors in technology fields for credit for them. Let's see, uh, prior to that, I built the largest at the time live online, so synchronous education product for Kaplan. Um, that was years ago, but it was uh, about 25,000 students. And uh, after that, went to Arizona State University, actually, and built a global freshman academy. That was uh, Dr. Crow's <clears throat> uh, project to create uh, open access to ASU professors and university courses for credit. 
from that, I built a few products off of that. Uh, one of which was interesting was earned admission. So right now at ASU, there's an alternate track to be able to prove admission uh, with using actual work at college that uh, provides more access or gets away from SAT and other things like that. Built a dual enrollment program so students can start taking ASU courses while they were in uh, high school as well and rolled out some of these things through various uh, corporations to increase access to people financially, things like Starbucks. Uh, and my major role here with the team is advising on the effectiveness of the digital learning products. And Alex has agreed to be on our founding governing board. Uh, and he's an Arizona resident and has kids. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Actually, I have four boys here <laughs> who've uh, been uh, educated uh, in Arizona. And uh, geez, I mean, we've gone through uh, private schools, uh, charter schools, public schools here in Tempe, and actually homeschooled as well. And this is my office, but uh, if I looked out there, I'd see uh, a mountain. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, we also have uh, Don here with us. Don, if you could introduce yourself. Don is an officer listed with the Arizona Corporation Commission for CoLearn. Don? Did we lose uh, Don? It, says, it says he's on, but we might, we might have lost him. I know that he was uh, in line at the DMV. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> um, so anyway, um, uh, I guess it's important that we we talk for a brief moment about the the inspiration uh, or original inspiration for trying to develop this model of co-learning, uh, which is for the for the past ten years I've been involved with innovators again like Edmodo, Class Dojo, Nearpod, Quizlet, uh, etc. And um, I kept on getting asked questions uh, on various panels like. Um, how are we personalizing technology? What's the future of, of personalization? Um, how do we better address the needs of individual students, uh, et cetera? And I kept on thinking over and over based on my experience and in, in speaking with families and kids that the biggest personalization technology we have, the most undertapped, underdeveloped personalization technology we have is actually the parent. And we need to figure out ways of engaging parents in more effective ways through using technology. Uh, so that was really part of the inspiration for, uh, for trying to apply for this new charter model. Yes, and so that the inspiration grew from there and I'd, I'd love to share a little bit about, about the, the mission and the vision of CoLearn Academy. So the mission of CoLearn Academy Arizona is to inspire and empower all of our students to be responsible, resilient, and personally successful in a rapidly changing world. One of the reasons we chose to initiate CoLearn Academy in Arizona is because of Arizona's track record of promoting school choice and education innovation. Personally, as a parent of six Arizona students, I'm very grateful for the choices that we have here in Arizona. However, I found that there wasn't one model in existence that served my family well. Families like mine that prefer to educate our children at home have limited options. We could file a homeschool affidavit and educate at home with, with little to no support really, or we could enroll in one of Arizona's current AOI programs where there are limitations on parent involvement in the educational model. Neither seemed like a good fit, and thus this is the background for CoLearn Academy's vision. Our vision is that students will discover their interests and their passions, create authentic work, and harness curiosity and motivation to pursue accelerated learning with connections to their peers, adult mentors, communities, and the world. CoLearn Academy Arizona will offer a coherent, integrated system that addresses family pain points with existing school models and instills a love of learning that will continue to benefit students in the future. CoLearn Academy will invite homeschooled students back into public education. We will offer a new model of high-performing online education by focusing on student engagement through parent support, along with flexibility for personalization and curriculum choices aligned to their children's learning preferences. CoLearn Academy families will have the benefits of credential teachers and collaborative learning opportunities, along with a high degree of flexibility and academic choice. While CoLearn Academy Arizona will serve any family that wants a home learning environment for their children, we specifically take on the task of leveling the playing field and narrowing the achievement gap 
by seeking out underserved populations in all of our enrollment efforts. CoLearn Academy strives to break down key elements of structural racism embedded in the current academic systems. In Arizona, Hispanics make up approximately 50% of our K-12 student population, but only 21% go on to enroll in a four-year institution, as compared to the 57% of non-Hispanic whites. Data from, the, from Arizona's Native American population tells a very similar story. This disparity across tracks is what social scientists commonly call racialized tracking, in which minority students get sorted out of educational opportunities and long-term socioeconomic success. We believe that CoLearn Academy can help bridge this gap for families that for a variety of reasons may have not seen home education as an option before. Students will benefit from individualized learning plans that will promote mastery of Arizona's college and career ready standards. And a, a nurt, we will nurture a love of learning by encouraging all students to pursue their interests. With the help of a dedicated course mentor, students can maximize their potential. Arizona's families clearly need CoLearn Academy and we are happy to be able to provide this educational model to the students of Arizona. We again thank you for the opportunity to be here and look forward to answering any questions you may have. All right, well, thank you guys. That was thorough. <laughs> All right, so um, board members, first off, I'll go to you guys. Do you have any questions? Uh, President Lee and Superintendent Hoffman, if I may. <clears throat> yes. Um, so this course mentor uh, thing that you talked about a little bit, um, and you call you in actually in the last sentence or two when you were talking, you spoke about a dedicated course mentor. I have not heard that term in your application. Um, and as far as I saw, the course mentor was a family member or other person uh, in a student's life that could help them. Describe how that is going to work and how it's going to work with kids that may not have access to a I don't know a quality uh, course mentor or a broad range of people to select from? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. So we believe that all students will benefit from um, the attention that a course mentor brings, right, to be able to personalize their education and also just provide that support, right? We all benefit from a cheering section. So we think that in a lot of cases that will be a parent or a family member, but we also understand that there may be cases where a parent or a family member is not available or does not feel able or empowered to take that role for whatever reason. And so we have um, a system in place, a matching tool that I'm going to ask Michelle to speak on a little bit that will help us find mentors for students in that situation. Yes, we've tested out on a national scale, a learning pod matching tool. We offered this up several months ago when uh, parents were scrambling to deal with a remote emergency learning. Uh, it was a free matching tool using some algorithms to create community matches uh, in neighborhoods where parents were seeking help. We had 373 parents uh, who were seeking help with forming uh, learning pods. And of those 373, 53 of them indicated that they wanted or were willing to facilitate a learning pod to support a small number of other families in their neighborhood, even though they didn't have a teaching credential. Now, this was on a national scale, but we think that the 14% margin of parents in general who would be willing to help one or two other families and be a learning pod and serve as a... Uh, a course mentor, we think that that 14% is likely um, a reasonable number. Um, and based on some of the families that Denise is already working with in Arizona, it might even be higher than that in Arizona. Um, thank you. And this just occurred to me. How do you deal with um, fingerprinting and mm -hmm. child safety issues as it relates to that? 
Yeah. So any parent that is um, not the, any, any adult who is not the parent of the student um, to serve in a course mentor role, they will go through the background check and fingerprinting uh, that will be done at their own expense. And then the parent will assign them permission to serve as the course mentor and their contractual stipend will be given to that other parent. It's sort of a more accountable um, configuration of micro schooling in that we still have full time credentialed teachers in the state of Arizona providing oversight and primary instruction, but now we have secondarily instructional assistants who can pull together learning pods and allow some parents to continue working while other parents might be able to be stay at home and supporting a couple of students um, and earning that uh, contract stipend. And then, thank you. And just a quick follow up on another, your, your growth plan seems uh, fairly aggressive. Um, can you talk or address a little bit about how you plan to meet all the challenges that, that go come together with growing that quickly? Yes, so I have, um, we are prepared to have maximum enrollment of 180 students for year one, but we um, are um, also um, able to operate if we go all the way down to only 70% enrollment. So we, uh, we're prepared to hire all staff and be able to afford this program, even if we only reach 126 students. The good news for us is we have a broad network as CoLearn Club, as well as from Denise's current program that serves 170 students, we suspect that simply by word of mouth, we will probably go have to go to our lottery for enrollment. Um, but it, as a backup, we do have $30,000 invested in a marketing and outreach plan to promote enrollment uh, immediately as soon as if we get approved. Uh, to, to add to, to Michelle's comments, currently in Arizona, there are over um, 3,000 students that are participating in alternative models or micro schools or learning pods, very similar to our model um, with varying degrees of accountability. And so this is why we think our program is so, um, sorry, our school is so important because we can provide that support and ensure that all of our students are seeing the Arizona standards. Uh, President Lee, this is Rachel Yanoff. Could I ask some questions? Please. Um, hi, guys. Uh, so I have three kids in the background, so uh, <laughs> I'm, feeling, I'm feeling everything you're saying. And I just want to um, uh, sort of echo some of the TRP comments of like, this is such a cool model. And I think, uh, man, like any given day, I'm, I'm uh, ready to sell my kids to the circus and start all over again. So I think there's a lot of merit. Um, but having run a school, um, uh, I have some, some logistical questions um, that I would su sort of suggest maybe um, uh, err on the side of like, let's go slow before we do something that is so cool that can't happen that we make sure it could. So here's, my, here's some questions. Um, I think I, I heard you in the school safety with um, Jim Swanson's questions, but you know, when I think about my schools, like everyone in the school had to be fingerprint clearance. Um, and when I think about students in their homes, you know, I think about how often my neighbor stops by or how often my mom comes in. Um, there's a lot of people that you're talking about and the worst thing that we could ever have happen, right? would be a kiddo uh, getting hurt and no one ever wants that, but how do we, I mean, you know, how, how are you, how are you so, taking that risk on or thinking through that? So <laughs> yeah. Rachel, we're a fully online. We're a hundred percent online. We might uh, host meetups for families to get together voluntarily, socially, such as field experiences, field trips, and other kinds of social meetups. But the fingerprinting um, does not necessarily mean that the other children will be entering that family's home. Um, it means the course mentor will be supervising that child's learning online. Now, I'm not saying we would prevent that and your questions and concerns are valid, um, but we are a, a technically a hundred percent online model. Okay. So the field, so I, I guess I was reading it that the field work and the meetups were a part of the coursework 
And you're saying those are all optional? Yes. Um, yes, yes. Meetup, all, that's all, all yeah. the exper experiential learning uh, is optional. We have mandatory learning with uh, synchronous uh, Zoom meetings or whatever platform we use to host that. But um, the experiential, the internships and other experiential are optional. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, go, I'll come back to that. Um, I, I think, I just wanna say, uh, I think that's really important and essential to the program. And I would push that we that that, that you all think about how how you can do that in a way that uh, wouldn't prohibit somebody from being part of it. Um, because because we because how do you how do you do the logistics of safety? I don't want to answer the question right now because I'm not sure I have the answer. But I I worry that something could get lost in that for a child. And, and I think we all think it's important. So um, having said that, my second question though is just logistics. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't, and I, I don't wanna put Superintendent Hoffman on the spot, but I know there's lots of conversation already about how in the world like statewide testing is gonna happen when we've got kiddos all over the place. Do you, um, I mean, obviously it's all online. Um, how are you um, thinking through the logistics of statewide testing, interim assessments, things like that, that um, are so logistically a, a, a lift um, and that would also still be something you'd have to take on. Right, so like other online models, we will have to find locations across the state of Arizona when it comes to state assessment time um, to, uh, and I believe Michelle, this is in our budget in terms oh, yes. of uh, how many facilities, if we need to rent a, you know, a meeting space or things like that with internet so that our students can come to the location closest to them to take that state assessment. Um, I'm also this year um, practicing our benchmark testing with MAP uh, virtually, and it's been going well. The, the course mentor in that, in that student's life would help you know, facilitate that and make sure they have a, a good testing spot to benchmark test throughout the year. But as far as testing um, for state assessments and where we need to have a trained proctor and things like that, we will be holding those locations throughout the state so they're accessible to all of our students. And we don't know exactly where those locations are at this time. It will depend on our student population. And I have experience with this and I learned from the master Tom Tafoya, who is on our governing board. Uh, we, were at, we were at a homeschool independent study charter school together, uh, the one he's still at. And when it was time for our students to leave their homes and enter a testing site, we had testing sites close to every single student's homes, uh, renting uh, conference halls, church halls, uh, every, uh, community centers, every kind of rental, and, and we are fully budgeted for that kind of rental. So we'll be able to accommodate supervision, testing close to students' homes, um, and we're budgeted for it. I appreciate it. And I have one more, and then I promise I'm going to go chase my children because I'm pretty sure one of them is on the roof right now. Um, but uh, I, I'm also, so I, I apologize because I, I know that you've talked about this probably, but um, uh, I missed it. So I know you talked about teachers being, or sorry, um, uh, guides and mentors being um, fingerprinted. Um, how does teacher of record work when you're talking about course catalog um, and uh, all of the metrics that roll up into accountability when you have like a, a guide. I, I actually, I'm sure you've talked to somebody about this. I should have read it. And I apologize that I didn't, but can you just tell me how teacher of record is going to play out for, for such a, for such a dispersed model? Yeah. Definitely. So we have certified teachers, which are our teachers of record that will oversee the instruction for all students. And so one of the things that um, we try to I know it's, it's a different type of model. And so one of the correlations we try to make is if you have a classroom teacher and then um, they also have an instructional aid in the classroom that helps assist students. Well, that 
classroom teacher of record is a certified teacher that makes sure that all student needs are being met. But that instructional aid sometimes is, um, you know, is there to provide that additional support or if a student needs someone sitting next to them to make sure they're understanding. Um, and so that's the relationship that our teachers of record, which are our certified teachers and our course mentors will have. We have, um, we will have highly, um, uh, qualified teachers to be, uh, oversee all of the instruction, um, you know, across the, all of the subjects for K through eight and then subject specific for nine through 12. Um, and they will oversee all of that curriculum, all of the assignments and the course mentors are there in person with the student just to facilitate the understanding and to be able to guide the student through a lesson if, if they, if, to whatever degree they need that support. It's very typically similar to an instructional assistant, just a contracted instructional assistant uh, for uh, the parent to have that job or to assign that job to someone else. Our, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> did, you, did that help answer your question or did you have a clarifying question on that? No, I think that helps. Um, I'm just, I, I, like I said, I, uh, I, I really like how innovative and creative this is. So I just want to say that and also to temper it with like uh, innovative and creative requires like a lot of thinking uh, things through as you're all doing. I appreciate that. Um, and so I, I would certainly uh, like love to hear more comments and questions from other board members. This is not just my meeting, I know. Um, but I also would just say like, no matter what the result and how this works out, like I think the more you are working with Superintendent Hoffman's office and working through logistics, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different parts and thinking through how students with special needs are getting services of all different kinds, especially. Um, I know, again, this is not the first online model, but it's so unique with the, with the, with the guide, um, you know, equity, all of those parts. So I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to poo-poo anything. I am trying to explain that my mind needs to expand a lot to embrace all of this and uh, figure it all out. And I think you have some great advocates um, who can help you with that. And I would just say the work you've done so far is great and continue to ask the questions um, I think is, is really important. So I'll let other people ask questions now because I, uh, I think I've dominated enough, but I appreciate this very much. And, and we Thank know you. that the uh, course mentor situation sounds unusual and you know people might call them guides or whatever, but they're instructional assistants who are uh, contracted as, uh, but we're calling them course mentors and they most likely will be parents. And um, we know that teachers too, uh, experienced teachers, will find this confusing. And oftentimes they, you know, educators say things like, oh, those helicopter parents. So we, you know, as a, if we were to replicate this flagship model, which I hope we do once we really get it tight in Arizona, what, what I'm going to be working on is a replication rubric with some key uh, elements. And we anticipate that teachers especially will need professional development and how to empower and honor and partner with parents. And likewise, our course mentors uh, as parents will be given many optional professional development opportunities um, so that they can get better uh, at their work. And we've done some national pilots on parent working groups that would be implemented as well. It, it, it's also worth saying that to the extent that we're going into uncharted territory, for instance, involving parents in their children's <laughs> intellectual development and education. Uh, you know, we are all ears about trying to make sure that we are learning to, to understand and know what we don't know, to surround ourselves with experts, to be open and transparent about any challenges we're running into, and to um, make sure that in any uncharted territory we're, we're going into, we're being as responsible and as thoughtful as we can. Uh, and are meeting all of the, the state requirements and community expectations of all of our stakeholders. That's great. I have two questions. Um, I think easiest one first um, is for as far as Arizona compliance goes, who do you have um, championing that championing championing that for your school? Uh, the Arizona compliance piece. We have. I myself as the executive director will take a large portion of that responsibility, but we have a position of a business manager who will also be um, taking the lead. I personally, since our capacity interview have gone on the Department of Education's website and I 
did all the training modules for, for funding and anything um, else that came up in our, in our report that we might be lacking. I think I just want to echo what Michael said. And I think it was mentioned in, in our recommendation report is that, yes, we are very growth minded, <laughs> growth mind, uh, growth mindset in our, in our group. And we are ready and willing to learn anything that we may have, have missed in our, in our application. And I think Rachel, Ms. Rachel Hanna can attest to the fact that we're not afraid to ask questions <laughs> and <laughs> get support when needed. And that was one of our biggest considerations when we were looking for our governing board was to make sure that we surrounded ourselves with experienced people that can give us that foundation that we needed for anything that Michael and Michelle and I might have missed because yes we do have big ideas and sometimes you know little details may fall through the cracks but we think that we've put together a team that will alleviate to that. In our, our budget uh, we have budgeted to hire special education uh, specialists as regular employees. We also have a significant budget for contracted services for um, the larger um, special education services. We have budgeted for uh, a legal team uh, as a contracted service and we also have budgeted for auditor fees and we'll be joining the Arizona Charter Schools Association of course. That's great. So the other, uh, you guys, I mean, you really are an impressive and an exciting team, you know, just to hear your guys' passion and, and what you're going to do. I, I'm very, you know, I'm excited for you guys. I, uh, my big, uh, maybe my biggest concern or, or hang up right now is really ironing out the course mentor and what happens to the students. Uh, maybe it's twofold. One is your course mentors are paid. Is that, did I hear that? You, they're like contracted, essentially, if I'm a parent and I sign up to be the course mentor, I, I'm, I'm a contracted employee. Is that correct? Not an employee, but a contracted. Uh, like an independent contractor yeah. role. Okay. So and don't, so yeah. they all, aren't all independent contractors required to be a pass the fingerprint parents? Um, no. If the, if the course mentor is the student's legal parent, they will not be fingerprinted. Okay. Um, and then they would not be allowed to serve in any capacity with any other student, correct? Correct. Um, Anyone that has an in interaction with another student will be fingerprinted. Whether they be staff or course mentor or whoever they are, if they're going to be dealing with a student in a leadership, in a position where that it is not their own child, they will be fingerprinted and background checked. So and then for your meetup, Oh, sorry. And yeah, for, for your meetups, then are are those people all going to be fingerprint clearance card for the meetups and the field trips and things like that? Not, <laughs> well, no. I mean, so if when we host community events, just like a brick and mortar school, if there's a field trip and it's all families are invited to attend, if the parent comes with the child, a, 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 an elementary student, um, and it's I didn't. Yeah, I believe that if parents are present, um, I didn't anticipate that being necessary. But that's no. something we will consider if you yeah. feel that is best. Well, I mean, we have no issue well, asking everyone uh, to be fingerprinted. <laughs> no, it's more of just the concern about like, so we don't in a school setting, right? Like you have teachers, your teacher of record is going with, right? So there's no students that are with, un, you know, fing students that aren't fingerprint clearance or parents that aren't fingerprint clearance card alone, right? That That's the issue. I think that's where if you're having these meetups, you have people who are, you know, or, or they decide to send an uncle in their place or something like that, right? It gets a little, once it's, when it's ran by a brick and mortar school, there's a little bit more, um, uh, you know, forms that have to be filled out, you know, you're ensuring procedures that are happening. So that's why I'm asking, what are you doing? So with these meetups, you know, do you, is the teacher record going to always be present? Is the, you know, that's what I, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, we have um, instructional assistants who are salaried employees 
who are the experiential leads. And Got so it. our instructional assistants will be fully um, fingerprinted. And as an experiential lead, they will host these meetups and these field trips. We expect okay. in some cases, the teacher of record might be there if they reside locally, but that um, we will make sure there's a, you know one school representative at every physical meetup. And, and probably in our first year, the, we'll cautiously enter experiential learning <laughs> opportunities right. since we're right. an online model and we'll get the kinks out smally, uh, small and slowly um, and get better at it. Right. And I guess, and I know this has kind of already been maybe asked and answered. So, but for the students who, my thing is, is it, this seems like an amazing program and, and the equity issue, you know, you talk about your target population and, and the populations that you're really wanting to reach and capture. And you gave some, you know, kind of great statistics and things like that. Um, a lot of times those same, you know, target populations don't have a course mentor, right? You're talking about parents that, um, you know, would need significant or could need significant amount of technology training. You're talking about like parent, you know, course mentors that are going to need their own classes to be a course mentor. So talk to me about how you plan on addressing that. Do you plan on offering that in multiple languages, um, you know, for Arizona or at least English and Spanish um, or, you know, it sounded like there was other, you know, kind of targeted populations you guys were referring to. So talk to me about that piece of, of kind of equity. Yes, definitely. So multiple languages that is um, in our application. We talk about how all our enrollment materials will be in multiple languages. I myself um, fluently speak English and Spanish, so I am able to um, directly speak with those families and those course mentors. We also have outlined I believe in both our AOI and our main application. I know for sure it's in our AOI how we will plan to provide um, internet for people that are in a situation where they don't have internet access, um, remote hotspots and things like that. We also have through our LMS, we have um, professional learning um, play, uh, modules, that's the word I was looking for, modules we can go through. And as Michelle mentioned, we also have the working group models that CoLearn has been already testing out and using in order to provide those parents with the professional development. And honestly, from my speaking with homeschool families all across the state, um, not only the, the 62 currently in my program, but just others across social media that I interact with, this is one of the biggest benefits of our program. I talk to parents all the time that don't know where their students should be grade level wise, either um, because they've always homeschooled or because, you know, they're just pulling their kids out this year because of COVID and they didn't realize their student um, didn't know multiplication and division and they didn't realize their student didn't know how to read well. They don't, they ask me all the time, well, what should they, what should my third grader be learning? What should my fifth grader be learning? And we can provide that and we can provide ideas for best practices. Uh, we're going to provide this curriculum to help them learn uh, to help their students learn, but also give them the freedom to personalize that for their students. And so this is where I see the biggest need um, in the people that I interact with is um, a lot of times we find that those people, um, families that find themselves in lower socioeconomic status are the ones that are asking those questions the most, you know, where mm -hmm. should my student be? What should my student be learning? And so we plan to, to provide them with that information and that support so that they can right. educate their kids. And that's a, so another reason why we've budgeted for every student uh, to receive the same technology device. Um, right now, we're looking at Mac uh, Air, MacBook Airs, which are it, it, more expensive than Chromebooks, but they're also um, a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> and can do a lot of things. And so when we provide professional development opportunities for our parents as course mentors or the guardians or whoever the course mentor is, when we do online trainings uh, using Zoom on how to use your child's MacBook Air, which is specifically for the child, not for the mentor. We are not buying mentors, the, the computers, we're buying it for their children. But everybody will have the same device. Right. And, and so we anticipate that we will be actually educating kids, but helping educate families uh, peripherally. Right. So should you have a specific training program for your course mentors that they have to do to become a course mentor? We don't. It's optional, though. Okay. 
We'll have many. That's a, that's a, that's a little concerning just as, you know, as an educator, I think a lot of times, um, you know, I, I don't think any school goes in saying, man, I really hope we don't communicate with parents. Do, do you know what I mean? I don't think yeah. any school would yeah. say, oh, man, like, you know, I think, in fact, it's the opposite. I think schools really try to bring parents into their children's education. I think parents, you know, I think it's I think it's tough because, um, you know, just even being a math teacher, right, like for, for so long, um, trying to say, what do you mean you didn't get the 50 emails that I sent you about your about your teacher, about your students, you know, report card. Um, but but so this, I think we'll, but we'll have we'll teachers have, as well, yeah. credentialed yeah. teachers with uh, very small, reasonably small caseloads uh, communicating. Right. I, I just yeah. I get concerned Sorry. about the course Sorry. mentor being such a big portion no. of this without a formal without required formal training. Like, so I, I think that it's awesome. I think that, you know, parents opting into this is great. I just I think that there's some more work to be done in regards to that piece of really shoring it up and, and then making sure, okay, if you're if you're a course mentor and you're agreeing to take on a student who um, doesn't have a course mentor at home, but you're going to be, you know, virtually being a course mentor for that student, then what training, you know, there should be specific trainings in place versus parents that just want to collect a stipend for being course mentors, I mean, you know, I mean, because mm -hmm. that, that can happen. Um, and yeah. there's a lot of parents that need those resources, um, arguably, you know, it, it it should be a requirement. I mean, you know, I guess in my opinion, um, if, if that, if it's, it's just because it seems like such a huge part of your, which of your program, and it's the part that I love about your program. Cause mm -hmm. I think, you know, right. I, I think it, I think parents should know that signing up, right. Like where if, yeah. the, you know, Hey, yeah. the, you know, this is required to be this, you know, I don't know. And, and no, and to, sorry to jump in. We have, yeah. you know, we have, we have lots of ideas and, and many of them are documented about what kind of support we want to provide parents. And I think what Michelle was saying is we don't, we, we don't have exact um, specifics around what is required versus what is not right. Um, because obviously if we're offering, you know, an hour and a half to three hours of professional development for parents every week, is that required for them to come? Um, may, maybe, maybe not, right? So um, uh, another thing to, to note as it comes to, uh, you know, equity and some of the underserved populations that we hope to, to serve eventually is that, you know, at the beginning, we may be serving more families uh, where they one of the parents is already, you know, not working and is kind of full-time supporting their children. Um, but by, by focusing on parent engagement and using technology to streamline it and understanding how to fully support parents and develop their capacity and their confidence to personalize education for their children, we hope that we can kind of bottle that lightning, right? And kind of streamline the, the how we engage parents in the process so that we can kind of scale it to more and more parents where they might need it to be really easy to use. They might need to, uh, it, it might need to be very, very accessible in order to get to some of the parents that we want to get to eventually. If that right. makes sense. No, it's it does. Like, I just, it just you know, like Tesla right. started with the sports car, right? And sure, now sure. they're, now they're transforming the national electric grid, but they had to start somewhere, right? Right. Right. I think the, you know, difference though between a private company is you can choose who to start with, right? Where when you're a public school, right, you get, you know, you get the people who want the grid and you go, but I only, but, I, but I'm only prepared to offer you a car, <laughs> you, you know, you know what I mean? And, and fortunately you have to figure out then how to get them the grid, right? Like because of enrollment law, right? So I think that's the piece that, that I'm concerned about is just that, that piece has to be so solid for us to say yes, you know, so, so um, at least that's, you know, I feel like our job is to make sure that that piece is solid, you know, before, before approval. Um, but no, you guys, and, and guys, I'm, I'm so excited about this model and, and your team is, um, de you know, definitely top notch. I appreciate you guys, you know, spending, spending the time on all the introductions. They were definitely, um, impressive <laughs> to say, to say the least. So board members, are there other, um, other questions or comments? Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, first want to kind of echo what's been said. I, I can definitely see why, um, how your leadership team was able to impress the, the TRP committee and you guys are, are very impressive. And this is a time to be really rethinking what education is like and thinking about different models that are innovative. So I, I just want to um, acknowledge that as well. Um, I think there, I also had quite a few questions as I was reading through the application. Um, 
one of which I think has been answered, which in the application, it looked like there would only be one special education teacher to start. And then, but I think Michelle, you said that you plan to hire um, the whole the whole range um, because, you know, also this, there, sorry, there's so many different points to this, but um, also as we're thinking about testing, which was mentioned before, you know, there's the state testing, but there's also like the Azela testing and special education testing. Um, so, you know, I was curious, I was, I, just, if you could just maybe re-clarify that again, as far as uh, making sure it's because, you know, one special education teacher cannot provide the whole range of services, including the evaluations that would be needed for a student with disabilities. So let's just start there. So in year one, when we have a maximum of 180 students, we will have a salaried 1.0 FTE full-time special education specialist. In year two, when we have 665 maximum students, we'll have one and a half. And in year three, when we have 1160 students max, we will have two full-time uh, special education specialists. Our budget also includes contracted services for special education. Uh, year one, 16,000 has been budgeted for special education contracted services. Year two, $19,950 have been budgeted, and year three, $34,800 have been budgeted for contracted services for special education alone. So those would be the, like the school psychologist, the yes. SLP, the OT, okay. Yes. That's what I thought you were saying before, so I just wanted to confirm that you did have a plan for comprehensive services for all students, because um, again, you could have a student who who really needs all of those services. And especially since you are working with elementary school students as well, um, you know, I used to screen all of our kindergartners for speech because that's, you know, we gotta get them in early when they need those services. Um, I was also wondering about in terms of the funding model, um, because as I was reading through the application, I saw um, like there was one example where this we're talking about example students and that one of the students would be getting would be going to um, youth soccer like a soccer club would the school be being paying for club soccer was that what was being said like how is that funding working when a when a student is um is going to a, something private for for any kind of activity we have an approved vendor list that we'll be building and Tom Tofoya, our governing board member has um, built these from scratch and at CoLearn, we actually already have a design for this kind of approval. So uh, course mentors, no, I'm sorry, parents, whether they're a course mentor or not, will have $600 annually. Um, to spend. 300 will be available right before the first day of school. And the second $300 will be available for the second semester. And uh, the approved vendors will include um, some um, vetted uh, physical education, uh, recreational sports opportunities, um, as well as enrichment curriculum to personalize the student's education to scaffold or to accelerate their education. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, I think one of my main reactions, just as, as a comment to the board, um, is you know, as we, I, I, I like that again. I, li I like that there's this you know innovative idea, and this is intriguing. Um, I my biggest concern was about the plan to serve over a thousand students within three years without and to like approve that now without actually seeing how successful it is when it's being implemented and actually being able to track how students are doing. So my, um, I think my biggest priority would be to advocate a, a lack of student enrollment, um, not for the first year, but for the second and third year, um, just so it's a, a more, more tapered and gross. Um, so we can actually see how, how it goes because this really is experimental. And, um, and I do worry about accountability, especially um, in this next year when there's just so many, so many unknown factors and it would be really hard to assess how you're doing even from one year of data um, and especially in an online school and AOI model. So I just, that was my, my, strongest, um, my strongest reaction to this application. 
Ashley, can you confirm our, our I don't believe we're allowed to change the enrollment um, pro like projections on this. Is, is that correct? Don't they have, would they have to resubmit to, to, to satisfy lowering the enrollment or no? Presently, my understanding is that if it's the will of the board to limit or decrease the enrollment cap of the application in the charter that you may do so. Okay. All right. I felt like we had tried to do that before and that we were told maybe that we couldn't. So, okay. And I just wanted to get clarification on that. Thank you. If, if, even if that wasn't the case, if you had a recommendation as to the pace of growth, um, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to, uh, to alter our <laughs> growth plans. I think that sure. we were, we were listing that as kind of like the maximum possible we could imagine <laughs> without breaking um, <laughs> as opposed to that, you know, for sure being what we're going to be at even though that'd be wonderful, obviously. Sure. And talk to me um, about your curriculum. Have you guys purchased a curriculum? Are you allowing parents to choose? I mean, I know it sounds like that there's this money set aside for supplemental curriculum, um, which again is, I think, innovative and awesome. But what about like the core content, your teacher of record, right? Like, so what, what do, are, will you offer one curriculum choice for, for the core content areas? Yes, we haven't purchased it, um, but we will have a main curriculum that our certified teachers are, are basing their instruction off of. And then each family will be able to supplement that and add to it by using that vendor account. Okay. And so for attendance purposes, for AOIs, I know it's tracked by minutes. You'll meet your minutes through that program, correct? Like through the actual core content program, only you'll meet your minimum through, minutes through that? Only through the instruction that the certified teachers are overseeing, correct? And not the supplement, like you won't need to use the supplements, uh, like the, you know, soccer club or whatever to meet those, correct? C correct. Okay. Well, we do have an independent study PE class option for the high school kids. You know, and so for independent study PE, there might be some of that cross pollination with the recreational sports, you, you know, which I think is a very normal thing for independent oh, study PE. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. But thank you for being transparent in that. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning mm -hmm. that. Oh. President Lee, if I may circle back to your question about enrollment, I just want to be very clear for um, the benefit of the applicant and the board. Um, the applicant, if you choose to limit the enrollment cap, that is something you are allowed to do per what Ashley said. Um, it is important to know that the applicant would become eligible to expand when they have reached received academic and financial dashboards that meet the board's expectations. So at that point, they would be able to submit something like an enrollment cap increase. Thank you for that clarification. And, and that's exactly what I would advocate for was um, was, would be to have the, the leadership team of CoLearn to come back and to present, present an update of how it's going, you know, pr have the data to present. Um, and, and we, you know, we can just take a, take another look, see how it's, you know, see if some of these concerns have been addressed. Um, that would be my preference. And we would be more than happy to provide that update and that follow-up definitely. Okay. All right. Board members, are there any any other questions or comments you'd like to say? President Lee, this is Hans. Yeah. I think I think the uh, presentation has been awesome. I just have a quick question for the superintendent. What type of enrollment enrollment cap is are you looking for, Superintendent Hoffman? Mm. <laughs> Good question. Um so it's 180 in the first year, which I said I think is very reasonable. Um, I guess. Um, so maybe I need some clarification on the technicalities of this. Um, so if we if we're projecting out, um, like if it, if we set it at at 300 or or so for year two and I don't know. I, I guess like I do want them to come back sooner than later. So what would what would be a good what would be the best way to have that cut off um, so that we do have that or, or is there a way to add that into this 
um, so that we do have the follow-up that I think is really, really important. So this is Rachel, and I don't want to influence your numbers in any way. I will provide some information that might help you guys in considering how this looks. Um, The applicant did provide a fairly conservative budget in their application package. Um, I believe it's budgeted between 80 to 83% in the first three years. So um, the numbers reflected were the cap that they were requesting, but it does look like their three-year budget, the first year is based on 150, the second year is based on 535, and the third year is based on 950. Um, Depending on how things go with State Board of Ed, um, opening dates, et cetera, and when letter grades are issued, Typically, an, a school will receive a letter grade at the conclusion of year two um, and would have financial and operational dashboard, sorry, financial and academic dashboards at that juncture. So I think it's just important to note those numbers of kind of 150, 535, and 950 as you just to enter into this conversation. Uh, Rachel and Hans and President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman. Um, <clears throat> Those still sound aggressive to me. When uh, the superintendent was talking about, you know, 300, you could go that 150, 300, maybe get them to 400 in year three, 450, um, something like that, gives them some bandwidth to, or some scale to test the model and an ability to come back, I would hope. I do like, this is very innovative and unique, but I think that there are so many questions that you guys are gonna be dealing with as you go forward. And I don't see actually going to a bigger number as a, as a success strategy. Uh, may I ask a clarifying question? Because we are K-12. Is it, is it okay to speak? Yeah, please. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> so because we are K-12, um, we, we at the high school level to have highly qualified credentialed teachers in year one with the expected um, enrollment numbers at the high school level, all of our high school teachers would be part-time. And most uh, most of us have experienced the desire when somebody is part-time, we, we expect they will want to grow into full-time. So when we look at CAPS, I, um, another thing maybe you want to be mindful of is how that would impact our growth at the high school level. In year one, we do not serve 11th and 12th graders right now. And in year two, we do serve 11th and 12th graders. And so part of the growth that is exponential in year two and three is the students from the lower grades moving up, as well as as word gets out the anticipated enrollment growth that just comes from adding new grade levels. This is um, President Lee, may I? I Yes. Thank you. I would say I think it was a very ambitious to have a K-8 or K-10 model to start and that, um, you know, I would love to, to see this have a more, um, you know, I think it, I think starting with either K-8 or high school would have actually, um, if you had designed it that way, I think would maybe give us a little bit more confidence, <laughs> um, but, the, but to have K-10 um, you guys are, are really, that, I mean, that's a lot to tackle for a, a brand new program. Um, and so I, so I, I, I have concerns about that as well, but, um, yeah, I understand sure. part of the logic just for, so everyone, um, on, on the board understands is that my program currently, which is a a very similar model to this, just with much less funding. So we can't do as much as we want to eventually do with CoLearn currently has 170 students and we're all in K-8. And the reason for expanding into the ninth and 10th grades is because my eighth graders don't want to lose this program. And so we needed somewhere for them to go. Um, I, we understand it's ambitious and, and, but we're doing this, I'm living this, I'm directing this program right now. And so I know that with this additional support, we can do it even better. Um, But on the same token, I don't wanna be foolish. And so we definitely appreciate your concerns and we are very open to adjusting our enrollment caps in order to be able to prove our model and its success with our Arizona students. We, um, We don't want to do anything that could potentially harm students in any way, shape or form. So um, 
we are definitely opening open to your recommendations, but I would ask um, if I can think of my families that are probably watching on YouTube right now with eighth graders to not cut that back for them mm -hmm. if possible. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, board members, I guess I, and maybe, and maybe it's just me and that's fine. I just, I guess I'm just still a little concerned that yes, one, the size to the capacity, you know, bringing on high school. Um, I, I feel more comfortable, you know, that, that you guys have been kind of running this as the K-8 model. I just, I really, that equity piece for, for, for parents and what's required of something that's maybe private that parents can opt into and you can say, Hey, here's the thing. And if it's not a fit, Oh, well, like, not that you would say that, but, um, but then when you, when you become a public school of really having to take every single student and having a super solid, I, I just, I don't feel like the, the, the coach piece um, is, is, is quite solid enough yet for the public school world. Um, but, and I could be the only one feeling that way. And if so, that's, that's fine. Um, I just, I just am thinking of all the parents that would want this or families that would want this or go to try it out and, and, and without kind of, Hey, here's the, you know, all the students have to be accepted, but then, okay, here's the requirement for the parent. Um, or not having a requirement for a parent or not having required training or just et cetera. I'm just, I don't know. I'm so a little nervous about, but, um, with that, I guess I'd feel more comfortable as well. It being small K eight and having a solid plan for, for, you know, the, the mentor piece. President Lee, if I may, um, something that we have done in the past is if, if you would like to, you could um, approve the grade levels for the first year to be, if, if you'd like to, you could do K-9 and then do a slow growth K-10 second year, K-11 third year, if you'd like to do that as well. Okay. And so the charter, um, it would be specific for each year. You'd have an enrollment cap and grade levels for each of the first three years. And you'd end um, what you approve for that third year would be what the charter is approved for. And then they could come back in year three Correct. Once we have additional data and they could come back um, and ask for an increase in grade levels or enrollment cap at that time if they wish. And, and if I may offer just any reassurance, the charter school I founded um, was in rural El Dorado County in Northern California. And people said there wouldn't be that kind of interest. Uh, and I had um, definitely much bigger interest. So I, I'm good with recruiting. And I also understand a lot at every level of the challenges of dealing with parents, uh, as well as uh, at the school I'm talking about, we implemented internships as a requirement for every ninth grader. Um, and then nine through 12. So just, just to re I'm not trying to influence your decision here. I just want to reassure you that um, I personally have done a, a brick and mortar version of this from scratch, from the ground up. And I have a, a comfortable confidence in my ability to support um, Denise's fantastic leadership to do it at the high school level here too. And President Lee, um, you know, also to assist, if you may, uh, you could do that slow growth um, and then approve the charter for K-12 if, if you'd want to do that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, board members, are there any other questions, comments that you'd like to make? President Lee, this is Hans. Yes, please. You know, I, I hear the comments of the other board members and I appreciate them. I'm thinking of making a motion uh, to approve uh, uh, K-10, go ahead and go K-10 with an enrollment cap of 150 in year one, and then serving gate grades K through 12 with an enrollment cap of 500, and just leaving the cap at that. Um, and understanding that they would come back, they could come back in year three you think that would be um, acceptable? Um, board members, is that what you guys were thinking as far as number numbers go? Superintendent Hoffman, I know that was your, you'd brought up the initial concern. 
I would like to see slower growth. I think that uh, Member Swanson and I were kind of on the same page around seeing slower growth. Um, you know, I think it's just, it's different having a brick and mortar school versus a statewide online school for any student in Arizona to be a part of your program. And then thinking about how are you providing those students with um, services and making sure you're doing all the million requirements that are necessary. Um, so I would just like to see slower growth. Yeah, I would, I, I would agree. So I'm fine with that. Are you thinking K-9 year one? Right, like maybe doing K-9, K-10, K-11 with a 300. I agree. With, that. Uh, with 300 for, um, you know, year three or what the, whatever the 300 number was for, for year, year three. So K-9 with maybe 150 in year one, then K-11. Or are you thinking? I would do K ten in year two and K eleven and nine and, ten, and then eleven in right. year three. Right. And then we'll just leave it at that, or should we go to K twelve in year four? President Lee and Vice President Close, you may want to approve the charter for K twelve and do a slow growth. So the first year you could do K nine, K ten, and the second year K. 11 in the third year and then the charter at that point would be able to submit a school specific change in grades to include that 12th grade but it would be a, a notification or amendment that the executive director could sign off at that time would not need to be an expansion request for grade levels okay so to, so to clarify that would be <laughs> charter is approved for a k-12 with a slow growth of K-9 year one, K-10 year two, and K-11 in year three with the requirement that the school submit a, an amendment request and to um, extend to grade 12 in that fourth year. Okay, Hans, were you able to write that down? Writing right now. <laughs> All right, board members, what are there about, any other um, questions? What oh. about caps? What are we looking at? 150 year one, 300 year two? Yeah, I think 300 is good. And then, you know, I, I don't I don't doubt the capacity of, of people choosing this model. I mean, especially right now. I know you guys have put years into this, so I know that this wasn't a result of the pandemic, but um, but it's definitely good timing for you. Um, I think I think lots of parents are, are looking for this. So I don't think it's a matter of them failing. I think it's a matter of, just requiring the slow growth with some data that the that the model is working before, um, you know, before the numbers increase. So I know I know for me a three hundred cap um, would be comfortable for me before they come back before us to you know to to get a an increase. So basically, three hundred year two and beyond. Yeah, that, that's my thoughts, unless, I mean, someone else can have other thoughts, but that's that's what I'm thinking. Uh, I'm fine with that. Can um, I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. If in year two, we get to 300 students with a, K a K-10, and in year three, we're able to open up a grade level, but we cannot enroll any more students, are we allowed to kick students out? Ugh. Or can we go to 350 or 330 or whatever that size just for the 11th grade in the third year? Right. So you can't, you can't kick students out. Right. Um, I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But so, so in other words, like you could offer K-10, you could offer, and if that's all you offer, then students would have to find another choice for 11th and 12th grade, which is obviously not ideal or makes sense. Um, so you'd need to be, I mean, we could lower it to say K-9, uh, 150 year one, 200 year two, and then 300 year three, I mean, or just tell you your, you know, your end goal is 300. And so you guys need to plan that appropriately. Um, and um, I, you know, you can have, I don't know how it works for online. So Ashley, maybe you can provide clarification. Like I know in brick and mortar, 
it's to our capacity, right? Like we have to accept everybody, but if we only have space in the classroom for, you know, our classroom limits of 25, then we go to wait list, right? So mm -hmm. I don't hundred percent know how that works in the online world. Like, do they have to fill to 300 if that's their, if that's their capacity or can they have classroom limits? Does that make sense? It does. Um, uh, presently, I, I, I actually do not know the question or the answer to that question. Rachel, do you know? Um, I think one thing to note that would be interesting, uh, that's interesting to know is that um, remember that this is an AOI. And so right. it's based off of ADM. So you have uh, many students that are going to be um, part time or and not meet that full time. So it, that would reduce the, the ADM for these students as well. Right. And your kindergartners right. are going to be a 0. 0.5 ADM. Mm -hmm. um, to your question, it's tricky because you're right, President Lee, that typically um, caps are set by buildings um, <laughs> in terms of, right. you know, you can say, oh, we're limiting our kindergarten enrollment because we only have three kindergarten classes, even though we have room in our cap. Um, I, I don't know that I've been asked that question in terms of AOI. Here's what I, I, I mean, we do have schools that under enroll due to limitations with teachers or um, funding abilities with being able to procure the appropriate amount of textbooks or whatnot. So I think there are some factors in place. Um, I, I don't know of any statutory limitation that would say you, you can't perhaps only enroll to 250 in year two so that you have that play for year three. I don't know of anything that would prohibit you from doing that. I would just be very transparent about your plan there. Okay. okay. I, I mean, or, or Hans just put 250 for, for year two, I guess. And then three, you know what I mean? 300. So that gives them the ability to grow. So they're not, so they're not coming before us. Like we've seen charters before that says, well, but we had 300, so we did it. Now we need more. And then we're tasked with, you know, telling them, nope, turn the students away that need to continue to graduate because we gave them 300 the second year. So maybe do 250 year two and then 300 year three. That's fine. Okay. And President Lee, really quick, out of respect for for the um, leadership team. Um, did you say that you already have 170 students in your program? I do. It's Cause I was, I think I would be fine with the first year being 180 as they requested. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that's what, yes. and that's, I appreciate that's, that's, that that's consideration. With no that's with no marketing and no budget. No marketing <laughs> and no budget, so. Yeah, no, thank you, Superintendent Hoffman. And um, yeah, we absolutely want to cover what they currently have, so. Thank you. Hans, are you able to get those those numbers? Yeah, I'm ready. We're ready okay. for a motion? I think so. Okay, based upon a review of the contents of the portfolio provided for CoLearn Club Incorporated and the information provided by representatives of CoLearn Club Incorporated during consideration and given it is within the discretion of the board to approve or deny a charter, I move to approve the application package and grant a charter to CoLearn Club Incorporated to establish CoLearn Academy Arizona to serve grades K through 12 using Arizona online instruction, serving grades K through nine with an enrollment cap of 180 in year one, serving grades K through 10 with an enrollment cap of 250 in year two and serving great serving grades K through 11 with an enrollment cap of 300 in year three and beyond with an extra requirement that CoLearn Club or CoLearn Academy Arizona submit an amendment request in year four to uh, go to K through 12. Um, is that, is that all right? Or? I, I, I don't think we need the last part. Ashley, is that, or should we? Is, you can we, just say as appropriate. Yeah, just say as appropriate. as appropriate. So we don't force them if they don't want to go to K-12, you know, to submit as, the amendment request. <laughs> uh, so this has a significant impact on our uh, ADM and our three-year budget projections. And this will significantly change 
our budget and our ability to um, purchase some of the curriculum, the online learning system, the enrichment materials and pay stipends. So I will need to entirely redo the budget. And I'm happy to do that, but I'll need to resubmit a whole new budget. Ashley, do they- President Lee, we're, we're currently, yeah. um, a motion was made. Sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Oh, um, oh, okay. I, can I table the motion? I mean, what, what do I do at this point? Because I think that she brings up a good point that I just want to make sure is clarified. I, I don't know that that changes the motion, but I guess I just want clarification on whether or not she has to submit a new, do they submit a new budget? You want me to table it? You want me to just do the motion? Okay, we'll do the motion. <laughs> All right, Vicky, sorry. What would, Vicki, do you have a recommendation? You could go ahead and table the motion for now if you'd feel like you need further discussion at this moment um, and continue your discussion and then have a motion after that, um, if that is what you're thinking, but you will need to have a motion to wrap up the, the matter before moving on. Okay. Um, or you could table the, yeah, you'll have to, if you wanna have further conversations right now, table your motion, have your conversation and then make another motion if that's what you wanna do. Um, if you prefer to go ahead with the motion already presented, you could choose to do that as well. Okay, I'm going to table the motion so we can have this conversation and it not be wrong. So table the motion. <laughs> do I? That's all I have to do to table it. Just say. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so just sorry, just just for clarifying question, are you saying that if if we only approve 300, that your model doesn't work? No, I'm no. saying I just have to reproduce the budget. I just have to fix. It's our understanding that you need to have a budget that's accurate. So we just need to know what paperwork you need from us to accommodate these changes. Got it. Ashley, I, can you? Ashley, yeah, do I'll you want me to take yeah. this? Okay. Sure. So yeah. it is actually very common that applicants end up actually not because of board action, but because of facilities and whatnot, that applicants often have to readjust their budgets in year one especially, um, due to not finding an appropriate facility, et cetera. Um, it has not been our practice to require an updated budget to be submitted. Um, that is done at your discretion and under your um, expertise, which I know does exist on your team. Um, if you wish to submit that documentation to us for transparency reasons, we can absolutely um, add it to your file, but it is not something that we would require of you. Thank you so much for that clarification. Just want to make sure okay. we check off all our boxes. <laughs> okay. No, and we cool. appreciate and I, sorry, that. And, I, and thank you, board. I just wanted to table that. I just wanted to be, make sure that I wasn't hearing that you couldn't do this model with the with the caps because that that could, yeah. Okay. But that's not what I heard. You just wanted to resubmit. All right. Um, so let's, if we could continue with the motion. Vicki, is that, can I just say that and then ask for a second? Could we just for clarification, um, could you restate the motion? I would love for Hans to restate the motion. Hans, if you could restate the motion. I would not love to restate it, but I will. <laughs> Let me find it here. Ready? All right. Based, can you all hear me? Based upon a yeah. review of the contents of the portfolio provided for Co Learn Club Incorporated and the information provided by representatives of Co Learn Club Incorporated during consideration, and given it is within the discretion of the, of the board to approve or deny a charter. I move to approve the application package and grant a charter to CoLearn Club Incorporated to establish CoLearn Academy Arizona to serve grades K through 12 using Arizona online instruction, serving grades K through nine with an enrollment cap of 180 in year one, serving grades K through 10 with an enrollment cap of 250 in year two, serving grades continue to serve grades K through 11 with an enrollment cap of 300 in year three and beyond with an additional requirement that the school submit an amendment request to um, go to K-12 in year four as appropriate. Is there a second? Second, this is Carol Crockett. 
Thank you, Dr. Crockett. And if we could do the roll call, please. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Mr. Mason. Aye. Ms. Rice. Aye. Mr. Swanson. Aye. Mr. Twist. Ms. Yana. Aye. President Lee. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank All right. So much, thank Lord. you, guys. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We're excited. All right. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, Intermountain Academy of Tucson, LLC, Rachel. And thank you for all of the charter holders that are still hanging on. I know it's 150, um, but shouldn't be too much longer now. So thanks for that, guys. All right. Two more new charter applications. Yep. Intermountain Academy of Tucson, LLC, has submitted a new charter application package to open Intermountain Academy of Tucson, serving grades K through 12. The TRP evaluated the application package and determined that the revised application package does not meet the minimum scoring requirements set by the board for the 2021-22 application cycle because the applicant's educational plan scored 94.17% and because two sections in two areas of the educational plan scored as approaches. The applicant did score 100% in the operational and business plans. After receiving the scoring rubric, the applicant requested to proceed to the capacity interview. Based on the responses and additional information provided by the applicant at the capacity interview, the TRP recommends that the revised application package for the applicant be denied. I'm available for questions if you have any. Board members, any questions for Ms. Rachel? Okay. If not, then is there a representative for the Intermountain Academy of Tucson LLC? If so, if you could unmute at this time, state your name for the record and any opening statement. Yes, my name is Rose Lopez. Uh, I am the president and CEO of Intermountain Academy of Tucson. Um, first off, uh, good afternoon, uh, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman and board members. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present to you today. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're coming to you to provide further clarification and approval of our charter application. I do have others in the room with me and uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and let them introduce themselves starting with Julie. Good afternoon, my name is Julie Shivananda. I am the current principal of Intermountain Academy of Tucson. Okay, and my background, I have 18 years in education, uh, two master's degrees and in education, one of which is in educational administration, and I am a certified K-12 principal in the state of Arizona. Uh, hi, my name is Jennifer Reese, and I'm on the governing board. Um, I'm licensed with the Arizona Board of Psychologists, Examiners, and Behavior Analysts as a licensed behavior analyst. Uh, additionally, I'm board certified as a behavior analyst with the National Behavior Analyst Certification Board. I have my master's degree in special education with an emphasis on cross-categorical uh, special education and low incidence disabilities. I have graduate certifications in positive behavior intervention support and early intervention from Northern Arizona University. And I have 20 uh, years of history of providing ADA treatment services to children and families impacted by an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. My name is Brett Rustand. I'm on the corporate board of Intermountain Centers for Human Development. Uh, for the past 12 years, I've been active in not-for-profits in the social services arena, servicing kids and disadvantaged populations. I also sit on the board of the Children's Action Alliance. Uh, I'd also like to say that our board chair, our, our corporate board chair and our, our uh, board chair for our governing uh, board uh, could not make it due to uh, the additional COVID precautions that they are taking. Uh, but I would like to note that our board chair for uh, our governing board, uh, Pat Treffel, uh, has 24 and a half years of experience with Tucson Unified School District. Uh, many of those years are within are in special education, uh, and she has a master's degree as well. Uh, Brad Hazen, who is our uh, chair of our corporate board, uh, has uh, 
uh, represented this community in many ways over the past uh, you know, 15 years, uh, serving on multiple nonprofit organizations and as a stakeholder uh, within this community. <clears throat> as I said, my name is Rose Lopez and I am the president and CEO of Intermountain Academy of Tucson. Uh, I have uh, over 15 years of uh, executive leadership experience uh, working in behavioral health and social services. The last six years, uh, specifically, uh, I have experience in uh, providing executive leadership uh, within a private uh, school. <clears throat> Intermountain Academy has been operating as a nationally, nationally accredited private school for the past six years. The mission of Inter Intermountain Academy is to assist youth diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders in grades K through 12 to attain measurable academic achievement by integrating applied behavioral analysis supports within the classroom. The need to educate this population is great. In presenting to you today, we would like to provide clarification for consideration of our charter approval. Our final scores in our application were 94.17% for the educational plan, 100% for the operational plan, and 100% for the business plan. We continue to improve in student achievement and efficacy of our model. Since the fall of 2018, Intermountain Academy students that access the standard academic programs of instruction have taken benchmark tests of academic growth through NWEA. This test demonstrated that on average, all students achieved projected one grade level of growth in both reading and math. NWAA data suggests that in 2019, 15% of Intermountain Academy students would have passed the reading portion of the AC Merit and 12% would have passed the math portion. Many are also catching up as indicated by grade level growth measures. While more longitudinal evaluation is necessary, Intermountain Academy students are demonstrating that with the use of ABA, re ABA research-based instructional strategies, curriculum using AC standards, and, <clears throat> and providing highly qualified staff, Intermountain Academy will improve student achievement for our, for our identified population and all students enrolling at Intermountain Academy. Not only is the academic model promising, but the experience for students, staff, and parents is, is a positive experience. 100% of parents completing the Intermountain Academy Climate Survey in 2019 indicated that they enjoyed bringing their students to Intermountain Academy. Roughly 95% of students that completed the Climate Survey indicated that Intermountain Academy was a safe school for them to attend. 100% of the staff said that they enjoyed their job. The qualitative experience of Intermountain Academy stakeholders is clear that the educational philosophy is successful for most, if not all students, parents, and staff. <clears throat> After reviewing the TRP summary of our interview, we feel that the summary did not accurately reflect Intermountain Academy Intermountain Academy and our ability to operate a school and understand our model. Thus, we would like to provide clarification in the following areas. <clears throat> One, the relationship between Intermountain Academy of Tucson and Intermountain Centers for Human Development. Two, the enrollment process. Three, compliance and monitoring specifically around special education. And four, budget management. First and foremost, the number one goal of the corporate and governing boards is academic performance and mainstreaming students into a traditional school. We, we, believe that, we believe that supporting students with the principles of applied behavior analysis supports students in academic progress and achievement. <clears throat> so in addressing the relationship between Intermountain Academy and, and Intermountain Centers for Human Development, Intermountain Academy of Tucson is a subsidiary of Intermountain Centers for Human Development, which has been operating for 47 years here in Arizona. In this structure, Intermountain Academy will have its own site-based leadership and governing board. 
the governing board per the charter application submitted will have authority over academic operations and contracted services. Intermountain Centers for Human Development will look to provide contract services to Intermountain Academy for administrative support services such as information technology, facilities maintenance, finance and accounting, marketing, quality management, et cetera. I am the authorized representative for Intermountain Academy of Tucson, but I am not a voting member of the governing board. Per the charter application, the governing board of Intermountain Academy, as well as the school principal, will be responsible for monitoring the performance of any contract. The application submitted provides a standard for accountability of these contracts. <clears throat> Currently, we are recruiting three governing board members. Specifically, we are recruiting board members who have experience in education, compliance, and monitoring, and a community stakeholder. At this time, I will, I will ask our principal, Julie, to provide clarification on the enrollment and compliance processes and systems of Intermountain Academy. Thank you. Good afternoon, governing board members, Superintendent Hoffman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am here today to provide clarification in two key areas, our enrollment processes and compliance and monitor monitoring. I'd first like to just share that there are many charter schools that focus their efforts on special populations, including a charter school for students with autism in Phoenix, a network of public charter schools in Phoenix that provide a specific focus on providing classical education to children with special needs, special education needs, and currently there is nothing public or free to our students in Southern Arizona. We have been motivated learners during this charter process and feel that we have clarity in the steps we need to take to strengthen our weaknesses. Rose has already shared the school's mission with you, but I also want to highlight our vision. The vision of Intermount Academy is to provide supportive educational environments that motivate children to love learning, make friends, and grow in their independence. We truly believe that our approach would support all types of students in their educational career and provide rigorous opportunities for students to make academic growth. To support our enrollment processes, to ensure, ensure fair and equitable procedures, Intermountain Academy will follow procedures in compliance with ARS 15-184. The school shall enroll all eligible students who submit a timely application unless the number of applications exceeds the capacity of a program, class, grade level, or building. All students will have an equal opportunity to attend Intermountain Academy. Intermountain Academy will use a lottery system if needed. Open enrollment is advertised each year with a set closing date and time. Interested families will complete an intent to enroll form for their students to apply. According to HB 2494 enacted in 2013 and which amended the ARS 15184, Enrollment preference will be given to students returning to Intermount Academy in year two or afterwards, siblings of currently enrolled students, children of employees of Intermount Academy, and children of members of the governing board of Intermount Academy. Our educational model is grounded in instructional practices based on Arizona state standards. We have developed curricula maps and a scope and sequence that outlines the Arizona state standards to be taught at the level of rigor needed to master the content. What is unique about our approach is that we utilize a variety of data points to drive instruction and differentiate for the vast educational needs of our students. Our students in the standard program of instruction with special education needs are accessing high level material that is found in typical general education classrooms in Arizona. Our approach is so individualized that we can cater to the need of any student. Our supportive environments and small class sizes would benefit any typical student accepting grade level Arizona state standards. Our modified classrooms are instructionally IEP modified for behavior and or academically designed to support student learning to reach academic potential. We believe that all students should be in the least restrictive environment needed to permit them access to a quality, free, and appropriate public education. Our educational approach would benefit any student as we focus on meeting the academic needs of all 
including those with identified special education needs, as well as those who may gift, be gifted and in need of extension opportunities. We have an academic assessment plan to measure student progress over time that includes monitoring and analyzing data, including the use of screeners and diagnostic assessments. We utilize the NWBA assessment three times per year to measure student progress, regular common formative assessments to monitor progress, and we review data on a weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis during professional learning communities. These PLCs focus on developing rigorous instructional plans, utilizing a variety of research-based instructional strategies that supports promoting academic growth for all students. We currently utilize many research-based approaches to our curricular program, as noted in our new charter application, that supports learning, and development of any student who may struggle to access grade level academic standards. We also utilize a multi tiered system of support process to strategically address supports needed when students are not making progress in academic or behavior. We focus on providing interventions where needed to reduce the barriers some students might have in adequately accessing the academic standards. As a charter school, we will ensure that we are meeting all compliance and monitoring requirements as set forth by the Arizona Department of Education. Specifically for special education, we currently follow the guidelines and requirements for individualized education plans by meeting deadlines of yearly IEP meetings, appropriate services allotted as provided by the school, and ensuring regular data and assessment practices are withheld to identify progress in each identified goal for students. When students are not making adequate progress, we convene as a team and identify alternative accommodations or supports to ensure an educational environment that allows for students to learn and make academic progress. While Intermountain Academy currently addresses some of the required elements of individualized education plan, we understand that the transition from private to public school, a, a public charter, will require that we be compliant in the areas of providing special education and related services. We have allocated $92,000 in funds in our budget to utilize contractors for these services to ensure we are meeting all of these special education needs of all of our students. Currently, through ongoing professional development, we are providing robust training on the compliance of special education policies as set forth by the state of Arizona. We regularly train teachers and staff on identifying present levels of educational performance, goals and objectives, reporting of progress, accommodations and modifications as necessary, and writing robust goals that address supporting students so that they are able to access the state standards to make academic growth and achievement. Our professional development also provides learning opportunities for our teachers to continuously understand how to analyze data, to monitor and adjust instructional strategies to ensure academic achievement for all students. As a current private school, we engage in the balanced assessment framework as outlined by the Arizona Department of Education to drive our instruction. We use the PEAK assessment as a screener and diagnostic tool for our modified academic program. For our traditional academic program, we use the NWEA assessment and the iReady program. For screening and diagnostic tools to identify present levels of performance and to drive our instruction and remediation plans. Through our instructional model, we focus on learning goals and objectives, continuously check for understanding and monitoring learning. We currently use the NWEA assessment to monitor growth, identify present levels according to grade level expectations, and projected proficiency on the Arizona Merit Test. As a charter school, we will continue to be in compliance with assessment practices and monitoring student achievement through the use of our assessment framework and administering the AP Merit Test yearly. We also have been an accredited private school for the past six years, and we continue to provide full high school diplomas to our students so that they are well equipped to move beyond their 12th grade year and be successful citizens in our society. I also wanted to highlight our staffing model. We currently have a mix of highly qualified special ed teachers and content area teachers. Plus each classroom has at least two teaching assistants who are thoroughly trained in PBIS and behavior support 
to help support a positive and safe learning environment that is conducive to rigorous instruction. Between our special ed teachers and our content area teachers, we are well equipped to provide a strong instructional program that supports high academic achievement that is differentiated to meet the needs of all students. We also have two education support coaches who support instructional staff in instructional planning that is based on data and follows each student's IEP. One of our support coaches is also our IEP compliance coordinator and transition specialist who holds a master's degree in special ed and has over 10 years of experience in special ed and transition planning. She also provides ongoing training to teachers in the areas of IEP compliance and transition programs for students in grades 6 through 12. When we become a charter school, these positions will be integral in ensuring we are meeting compliance and regulate regulation requirements for special education, instructional practices, as well as all testing requirements. We have identified a gap in education services within the public and charter school arena for students who have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. While there was a concern raised that we will not take all students regardless of diagnosis, our expertise in differentiating, individualizing, individualizing, making database decisions, teaching to splinter skills, and approaching each student with a lens that reveals their unique strengths and challenges, makes us prepared to take on any student regardless of their accelerated, typical, or remedial education needs. Rarely do our students get to be in the majority of any school setting, and often in charter schools and public schools, their needs are met with part-time itinerant teachers. We have trained, studied, and advocated to ensure that our students get the best education that can be found in Tucson, Pima County, and the state of Arizona. A public school with our focus is desperately needed in Tucson, and we hope with, that, with your support, we are the team that will stand up to help Tucson fill this education gap. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, we have one more concern to address, I'm sorry. Uh, a concern was mentioned with our budget if we were to enroll typical students who did not have the additional revenue add-on. I would agree that our revenue would, would decrease if we enroll students without additional revenue add-ons. I do not agree that we would operate in a deficit. Should this situation occur, the principal and governing board would work to realign expenses. Expenses such as personnel costs, benefits, contracted services for special education, contracted administrative support services, and facility costs would decrease. In some cases, there may be significant decreases. For example, in year one, we have 92,000 allotted for uh, contract services for special education, uh, for psych psych psychology, speech therapists, um, occupational therapists, and so forth. That would significantly decrease if we did not, if we were to enroll our typical students within our, our school. Additionally, we would work with the governing board and principal to increase fund fundraising for the school. We have managed a school budget currently three and a half million dollar budget for the past six years and have been in the, in the black for the past four years. I would ask that the Arizona State Board of Charter Schools consider Intermountain Academy of Tucson for an approved charter school. Albeit small, our school provides a quality education to students as evidenced by outcomes. <clears throat> Intermountain Academy has experienced leadership, staff, and a plan to hire additional staff to fulfill all compliance and reporting requirements. If awarded a charter, Intermountain Academy will comply with the contract terms for administering student admission in compliance with laws, rules, and regulations, charter written application, and provisions of the charter contract. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to present to you today, and at this time, we'll take any questions that you have. Great, thank you guys um, for that and for just kind of addressing the major concerns of the TRP. Um, board members, I'll open it up to you guys first. Are there any questions or comments? This okay. is, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, President Lee, do you mind? No, please go for it. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, one question that I had for the team is that, um, I mean, my understanding is that you're a, 
private autism uh, church, uh, private autism school that is looking to now transition to a charter. Can you talk to me a little bit about why, why that and why now? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, our board has made the decision to move to a charter school, uh, in the hopes of moving to a charter school, uh, because we support the public school system. Uh, a large part of Intermountain Centers for Human Development serves um, over 5,000 kids currently in Arizona, who, in which the majority of them attend the public school system. So we support the public, and, and we also work with various public uh, schools in providing services within the school. So we support the public school system. What we have uh, recently encountered over the past three years is that we have 48% uh, of our students who have come to us with um, empowerment funds. And uh, we feel like as a result of that, we are, we are taking money from the public school system into a private school. Um, and again, as an organization, we support the public school system. And we feel like uh, to provide better continuity across our mission alignment across our entire organization, that we are, we would be better off as a um, as a charter school. Would you like anything to add, Jessica? Um, I also just wanted to add that um, here in Pima County, a significant um, number of individuals, twenty four percent, live below the poverty line, and in our school currently, we exceed that with thirty seven percent of our students being below the poverty line. And the ability to access the private school system, um, the steps that are needed to be able to navigate, to get empowerment grants, scholarships, to navigate the, the student tuition organization um, are relatively sophisticated. And we feel like that's also blocking access to some of our families that meet the demographic needs of our community, um, as well as the demographic needs of the students that we're serving. And so, uh, the ability to offer a public school education to our kids um, here in Southern Arizona is critical, um, especially for the population that we're serving uh, and kind of the barriers that they're facing. Thank right, you. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Um, board members, any other questions? I, yes, go for it. Um, I was wondering, I had some questions around how do you ensure that your school can provide the entire spectrum of least restrictive environment for students, including students without disabilities? So the LRE part is more for the students with disabilities, but how are you, um, since you, you know, would have to um, open your doors to any student, how do you have a, a, a spectrum of of learning environments for all students is a better way to put that, including thinking about least restrictive environment. Absolutely, thank you for that question. So we currently are providing an educational model that supports all of our students. So just within the students that we currently have on the autism spectrum, there is a spectrum of varying um, abilities. We have students that are are well exceeding the Arizona state standards. And we have this year started a partnership with Pima Community College for dual enrollment courses for our students who are um, well beyond the, the typical math or reading or high school courses that we offer. Whereas we also focus on utilizing our staffing model to also really hone in on utilizing small group instruction, one-to-one -one instruction when needed within that classroom and utilizing our, our teaching assistants to also support and utilizing all of our curriculum resources. So utilizing our, our applied behavior analysis resources and curricular um, approaches that really look at how do we break down this information to be able to provide direct instructional support to our students and then looking at how do we then support a conducive environment within that classroom 
to be able to have a learning environment that is consistent for learning. And so looking at removing any of the, the behavioral barriers that we, we tend to see with some of our students that are on the autism spectrum, where we really focus on utilizing our skills to have plans in place that address their social emotional needs, their behavioral needs, as well as their academic needs, and really looking at how do we support the whole spectrum. We use a variety of screeners and diagnostic tools that are met based on their individual um, abilities and their needs. So for our modified academic program, we utilize a peak assessment and monitor that growth and then make sure that we're also providing opportunities for those students to also access uh, Arizona State standards based on their level, based on their IEP, but also those students that we have some students that have an IEP but don't have very many goals because they are further along in their educational um, path where we're also extending and providing those extension opportunities and providing opportunities for students to learn from one another and have higher level peer models. So also looking at our traditional, utilizing our assessment framework, utilizing training our teachers and our professional learning communities, highlighting all of those data points and really driving our individualized instructional plan to support and differentiate the vast needs of all of our students. And just really quick follow up and then um... How are you, because I know you mentioned the dual enrollment at Pima Community College, but um, how are you making sure that all of your students also have, have access to being around students without disabilities? So that's another reason why we want to move towards the charter um, is one of the components of being a charter school. If we do have students that are 100% with disabilities, we are not providing that opportunity. So being able to move more towards a charter school and having other students that might not have the same disability or any disability, but they need more of a smaller class size, they need more of a differentiated approach that also then provides that opportunity for our, our students with disabilities to also have opportunities for peer models that don't have disabilities. Okay. Um, I have a question. I, I just, um, and schools do this all the time. I just, it's odd for a school, or it seems odd for a school that, you know, essentially plans on their population either being 100% or close to 100% students with disabilities to be contracting speech, OT, PT. Um, wh what was the reasoning for the choice in that versus having full-time, you know, staff on, on your site? Intermount Centers uh, for Human Development has provided some of these services in the past. Um, and uh, currently we provide some of those services, but within the school, we really want our school to truly focus on academic achievement and on the curriculum. And uh, we have great partners within the community who we work with who are uh, of high quality who uh, we currently either contract with, we work with directly, and in some cases, some of our students currently go to these uh, various professionals within our community who provide these services. Uh, and so we, we feel at this point that that is a best fit for us as a school. Okay. And I know you guys are currently doing IEPs in your private model. Do, do, do those IEPs include related services that you're testing for related services um, and, and including those minutes? So currently as a private school, we do not offer those compensatory um, services due to our model. And that's again, another reason moving towards charter to be able to really look at the individual child and provide all of those services in house for what's needed. And so right now we, we do follow the IEP model. We do not currently um, utilize the, the three-year reavow or the MEP. We look towards um, having students go to their home districts for that. And so that's another reason for moving to charter is for being having the opportunity to have contracted services to be able to do that testing in-house and do those three-year three reavows and do the MEP process 
so that way we are adequately identifying all of the supports and services that our students need. Okay, and you may have mentioned this, and I, I apologize if you have. Um, who who on your team is going to oversee Arizona compliance? And, and, and what background, I guess, more so do they have in Arizona, you know, kind of that oversight of Arizona, like, like charter school or public school compliance? Um, so this is Jessica, and I'm on our governing board. Um, so in partnership with Julie, who's our principal, uh, Pat, who is on our governing board, Pat Treeple, who's on our governing board as well, um, has 24 and a half years with the public school system, where she was actually the director of exceptional education. Um, and so between my experience with special education, Julie's experience with special education, um, and Pat Creeple, we will work together. Um, we do have a position in our budget currently uh, to hire somebody who would actually be working on specific compliance areas. Um, Julie, in the opening statement, brought up a position that we have that oversees the current IEP. That position, um, that individual has 10 years of special education experience a master's degree in special education. Um, so they would be overseeing the IEP portion of compliance. Um, in partnership with Julie as the principal, we would be partnering in overseeing compliance of the educational testing. Um, and then we also would be very carefully selecting um, the partners as Rose spoke about earlier, uh, about who we would bring in to do the MEP testing, who we would bring in uh, to do any of the diagnostic testing, um, our speech pathology partners, our occupational therapy partners. Um, and Intermountain is an agency that's recognized as the, the front door to autism services um, currently in Pima County. Um, there was a wait prior to, to Intermountain's participation and involvement in diagnostic testing um, of anywhere from six months to 18 months to receive an autism evaluation diagnosis. Um, and following the identification of that gap, we've been able to shorten uh, diagnostic testing for children on the autism spectrum down to about six weeks um, from referral to diagnosis. And so um, in the partnerships that we have on our other side of services, um, we already have a lot of these relationships solidified um, and are very you know, comfortable with contracting these services even outside of our organization with other community partner agencies um, who are really seen as the best in Pima County. Um, and so I feel highly confident between uh, Pat Treeple's experience, my experience, Julie's experience, our curriculum specialists who are on board, our highly certified teachers, um, that, that we make a very strong team around compliance um, and that we will make a, a very conscious um, selection of the staff who would be joining our team uh, to oversee the compliance. Uh, areas of compliance. And, and I would also add that, um, you know, our governing board is, is ultimately is, is responsible for the oversight of compliance. Uh, our, our governing board is, and staff, Julie and her staff, would certainly reach out to the, uh, to the Arizona Charter Board for guidance and for um, assistance when needed. Um, trust me, we are an organization who is uh, you know, certainly going to reach out and ask for that assistance uh, if, if needed. And I will say currently for the special ed support and resources, even as a private school, we don't necessarily have a support person in the Arizona Department of Education's office. However, my uh, education support coach who oversees our IEP compliance and transition has an ongoing partnership where she's consistently reaching out to the, the helpline for with Arizona Department of Education, and we currently have a partnership with um, Arizona USED um, to expand our transition program for supporting our high school students after college as well. So we definitely look at building on our community partners, um, communicating with the Arizona Department of Education to ensure that we are meeting all of our compliance support requirements. Okay, thank you guys. Board members, any other questions or comments? President Lee, this is Justin Rice. Yes. Um, my question is this, um, as a private school, you have a lot of leeway and a lot of freedom to essentially do whatever it is that you would like to do, as opposed to being part of um, a public school program. The 
question that I'm asking myself is, as a private school, this entity always had the opportunity to open their doors to typical students, to act as peer models. Um, this private entity also had the opportunity to conduct their own Mets and IEP and provide those IEP services. Now you don't have to, I understand that, but it was always a choice. And so I guess my question is, why now? Why, when those options are available to you as a private school, why move to a charter in order to implement those very important things? Uh, I'll, I'll take uh, I'll take some of this question. Um, you know, our our ultimate goal is to grow our school, uh, and we have a lot of reach within the state of Arizona. Um, and you know. Our, our idea is to grow. We have we know that there's a need uh, for this population in, in various counties uh, across the state. And so our goal would be to grow and, and potentially even uh, not in this application. So I don't I don't want to confuse it with this application, but you know, there may be opportunities for us to extend uh, into uh, virtual learning into some of these rural areas specific to this population. In addition, uh, opening uh, smaller classrooms uh, in various uh, counties in potentially rural areas. Um, and and we the resources to do this, uh, to uh, fund that growth uh, and build this, this need, uh, may not potentially be there as a private school and so i think our our you know in addition to our current reach into the public school system and our current current uh need to really align ourselves across the organization with our mission of working with public schools um it's really you know the growth aspect of, of this uh, charter and this this type of school across the the organization and the resources needed to do that um, and I think the other piece of it is uh, the credibility of, you know, being a charter school and, you know, communicating to the public. Uh, there's, there's a nice marketing aspect of that and being able to help the community understand that uh, we are a charter school who is held to high standards. Uh, and certainly we're, we're accredited at this point, but, you know, certainly the, um, the, the, the current Arizona State uh, regulations hold, you know, their high standard and to the community that means something. And I will say part of it too is the, the opportunity for our families and our community. Um, we serve underrepresented um, children and, and students and families in our community and oftentimes having a student with a, a high level disability also comes with some other financial burden. And so one of the components of being able to offer high rigorous um, instructional opportunities for these students within a charter is that now we would alleviate, you know, that, that, op that obstacle of having to have a tuition based um, program. And so many of our families are, are struggling as it is and then adding in the other component of either a student Christian organization that you know you need to have a specific diagnosis to qualify for those funds or the empowerment scholarship or you need to have a diagnosis to qualify for funds it just hasn't necessarily lended itself to being able to open to have some non-diagnosed peers we have started as we learn more and we grow Again, you stated we don't necessarily have to follow the, all the IEP requirements as a, as a uh, private school. However, as we learn more, we're bringing more of those components in because we realize the necessity of having those on our campus and supporting our students. And so the more that we learn and the more that we grow, we are reaching out and providing those opportunities for our students and building those connections within our community to be able to provide those wraparound services for our students. So becoming a charter will give us the opportunity to reach and support more students who economically may not have been able to access us while we are a charter school or while we are a private school. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Board members, any other questions or comments? This is member Rice again. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, so my, I do have another question, um, and a, a bit hypothetical perhaps, but, but we'll see where this goes. Um, I know one thing that uh, during the review of your application that was brought up um, by the team was a concern that um, with bringing in uh, typical students into your school, um, that that would place your budget at a, a great risk. Um, and I understand that you address that um, in part of your presentation. However, my concern is this. Um, if a restructuring, a complete restructuring of that budget were to occur, and as you mentioned, um, you would have to look at staff positions and support positions and things like that. In my mind, part of what you're, you're selling as a part of the package of this school is a small group environment with a lot of individualized attention, a lot of small group support, small classrooms, and those types of things. My concern is that if your budget ends up being tanked it, and you have to go back and restructure, how do you choose, say, which staff members or which cuts are made in order to maintain the heart of this program, which is individualized instruction, highly focused on the student, um, least restrictive environment. There's a, there's a whole lot that goes into that. And I feel like one of the strengths would be to be able to offer all the individualized attention and individualized instruction, but without a budget to maintain appropriate staffing levels in order to maintain that level of service, um, I, I'm just concerned about that. Can, can you address some of those concerns? Um, yeah, I'll address some, and of course the principal <laughs> will have to address uh, some of the other hypothetical ones with the staff. Um, you know, in, in going to the budget, um, first off, we currently have 107 students within our school, okay? Uh, and we would see the, uh, a large number, about 95% of those students returning Okay, our first year budget is uh, max is 112 students. Uh, so, you know, that's really a, a gain of, of five, a net gain of five, um, maybe even up to 10 uh, if some students don't come back. Um, but we also have a waiting list. So we know that there is a, a need for uh, this type of school. And yes, uh, we may have a sibling of a current student who would uh, want to come to our school. Uh, certainly, we would we would definitely uh, take that that child into the school. Um, and so, I, I you know I don't believe that um, a, that we would have a very high number of typical students within this school that would impact this budget. Uh, but secondly, I'm going to go back to the expenses. There are a lot of expenses built into this budget that are specific to the needs of, of, of a kid who's on the spectrum. And easily, uh, if, if we were to have a classroom of 10 uh, students uh, with who were typical students and did not have, or 10 students across the organization who did not uh, did not have the add-ons, uh, there are there are potentially automatic cuts uh, in expenses that relate to that student um, that would be cut in our budget. Um, some of that it might be staff, may not be staff. Uh, but I think when it goes to staff, I'm going to turn that over to Julie. I mean, I, I believe there's there's a she would work with HR in addressing uh, what staff would potentially uh, be not needed or maybe look to move them somewhere else. Yes, absolutely. So we definitely would work with human resources and then really identify how we're going to allocate and look at our staffing model based on our number of students and our, our budgetary constraints. And one of the um, big components of our model as well 
is that, you know, looking at the individual needs of our students. So we do have our modified academic uh, programs and our more traditional academic programs. And so we would definitely look at our staffing ratio to support the modified academic for those students that need more of that hands-on support that um, is typically not provided in many of our uh, public education um, counterparts where they're really needing some more of that support. We would definitely continue to look at that staffing model. However, currently um, we've already been looking at increasing our, our number of students in a classroom in our secondary and high school students for those students that are more um, self-sufficient and a little bit more independent. And so we can also allocate and look at the specific staffing model and see if we're overstaffed in some areas and other capacities. Part of our staffing model currently also includes more of our transition program for those students who are able to stay with us until they are 22 as they're still working on their academic components learning their job skills and their life skills. Again, we do have partnerships with other entities um, in the community and looking at what other components we can utilize in our staffing model and possibly be overstaffed in terms of that. And so really looking at how we will strategically allocate and utilize our resources wisely and then utilize our professional development model to ensure that we're training teachers and the, the teaching staff in case we do need to reduce the number of staffing on campus, but we would look at it as a whole school-wide approach. And like um, Rose said, looking very strategically at our budget and cutting in other areas prior to cutting staff um, and looking for other opportunities um, within our community to support and in definitely increasing our fundraising opportunities. One of the great things about Intermountain Centers and Intermountain Academy is that we already currently have many community partners who want to jump in and support autism is definitely um, something near and dear to the heart and so we've already been fundraising to build a new um, community park that is autism certified and sensory friendly and we have a multitude of community partners that are wanting to jump in and support and so really honing in and support and working with our community partners to identifying the support needed um, and it will be definitely a team approach. And, and I think, you know, Intermountain Centers for Human Development um, is, is very committed to the communities that they work in. And Intermountain uh, Centers for Human Development is very committed to Intermountain uh, Academy of Tucson. And, um, you know, we, you know, as, as, you know, as an organization, we understand that we need to provide the resources for in order for this school to be successful. And again, you know, we have plans to grow this, this school eventually down the line. And so Intermountain Centers for Human Development is a support to Intermountain Academy of Tucson. Okay, um, I just have one more budget question, and, and not to not to maybe ask a question that's already been answered. But you'd mentioned, you know, if you have 10, 10 students who you know don't qualify for SPED, then you're fine. You can create your like maybe a classroom for them. But what if it's only two or three? I mean, you, right? So because at some point, you know, you have to have so many special ed teachers, and just having one or two students um, not needing those services, you don't lose a special ed teacher. So so kind of the theory of you know, if you have a student that doesn't need services, then your costs go down, so you stay in the black. Um, but that, if you only have one or two students who, which is my guess, I mean, I don't know for sure, for certain, you know, you only have a, a handful of students that um, don't need special ed services. It's just concerning that the budget might go red, um, or it appears that the budget would go red because what you would save in not providing them services would just be those con that contracting piece. Does that make sense? I mean, can you just address th that scenario? Um, you know, there. Um, so, if I'm understanding your 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 hypothetical situation, if we had two typical students coming into our school, that we would have a uh, a a deficit budget. Is, is Cor that that's what it appears, right? Okay. All right. So yes, there would be some contracted services that would be cut. Um, 
There also, we would potentially look at other services being cut. You know, there are special additional items within our, uh, our uh, supplies and educational supplies that we purchase that are specific to uh, this population, this population that would also potentially not be there. In addition, you know, there is flexibility within this budget with with Intermountain Centers for Human Development. Intermountain Centers for Human Development is providing a loan to Intermountain Academy. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, certainly it's the startup loan, but we were very uh, conservative in our, well, probably a little more excessive in our approach in that, and we provided more funding than what was initially needed. An easy step we could take was to extend that loan period from 18 months to 36 months, uh, which would significantly uh, assist the school with, with their budget. So there are items in addition, uh, if we could go out and renegotiate the contract services uh, for uh, administrative support and cut those and, and, and cut costs there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be cost uh, uh, direct costs related to the classrooms that are cut or to students, but there are I other items within the budget that could be cut and to help make up for that loss in revenue. Okay. And that, and, and, and thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I mean, those are the things, at least for me as a board member, that's what I want to hear you're going to cut. You know, if, if things are going to get cut, it's not staff. It's not, you know, the curriculum. It's looking at where do you cut administrative costs? How do you extend out a loan? That's maybe more of the creativity that I was, you know, hoping to hear um, when it talks about needing to balance a budget. Because obviously we could throw a million different hypothetical scenarios at you. And I don't necessarily expect you to have a complete answer to every single one. But, but the idea of cutting you know, if you're looking to restructure and go lighter on admin versus, you know, support in the classroom, that that's at least what I want to hear, you know, as a, as a board member, getting creative with loan extensions, things like that. Um, so thank you for it. That's maybe kind of what I was trying to get at without providing that answer for you. So, so I, I appreciate that. So, thank you. okay. All right. Board members, is there, if there, if, is there any more discussion? Or are we ready for a motion? Incidentally, I've just had a comment. Yeah. Um, Please still have concerns um you know compared to what what we read what we what we've already been presented with and the um, information we, re we received from the tdp and um you know I, it just sounds like a very specialized school which like a private school and and thinking about um special education services for especially for this population I, I think I, um, you know, I, I would like to see having full-time staff specifically for special education services as a part of the plan. Um, but just generally, you know, after listening to the conversation, that's just, I just wanted to share where I'm at that it just sounds very specialized. Whereas if, if we were to approve um, this to be a charter school, it would need to be for all, all students, any student, uh, but this just still sounds very, very specialized. So if I could address that just a little bit, we, we are definitely focusing on, you know, being a specialized school. However, we're more specialized in our approach. And so I can actually speak as a parent of a student with a disability who we had, you know, in, in growing up, we tried charter schools, we tried public schools, um, and it just really was a struggle for him. He got lost in the shuffle of the 30 plus students in the classroom um, and didn't necessarily have teachers that were well equipped to understand his needs with you know, his ADHD, he has a learning disability. And so our specialized approach really takes into account who these individualized students are. So taking in students that might have ADHD, some students that just social emotionally might not fit in, you know, in their in their general education setting. And so our specialized approach really hones in on our, our knowledge of how we can support these students, how we break down these standards, how we provide this individualized support and approach, how we utilize our small group functions, how we remediate, how we extend. And so really looking at our data analysis practices and knowing exactly who these students are by having a smaller school. 
is definitely what's going to provide that level of support to any student in our school. And that's one of our main reasons why we want to move harder is to be able to expand our approach to support other students who may not be meeting and getting their needs met in other other schools and other community resources that that could be getting their met their needs met with us. Thank you. Board members, any other comments? Presently, this is Hans. Yes. Um, I really appreciate the direction Intermountain Academy of Tucson's going. I think I'm still leaning toward the recommendation of the of staff though. I, I just don't know if I want to waste one's time by making that motion. Okay, go ahead and Hans, I think um, just it's appropriate to make the motion and then okay. the board, you know, the board can can vote. Yep. Thank one you. One way or the other. Yep. Okay. Um, based upon a review of the contents of the portfolio provided for Intermountain Academy of Tucson LLC and the information provided by representatives of Intermountain Academy of Tucson LLC during consideration and given it is within the discretion of the board to approve or deny a charter. I move to reject the application package and deny Intermountain Academy of Tucson LLC's request for a charter for the following reasons. A demonstrated lack of understanding of the compliance and reporting requirements of a public charter school, and more specifically of a school serving a significantly higher than average population of students with disabilities. A demonstrated lack of understanding of statutory open enrollment requirements in Arizona. The lack of a plan for serving typical students without disabilities and concerns related to the applicant's budget due to the open enrollment requirements not being considered in the submitted budgets. Is there a second? Second, second, Carol. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. And roll call, please. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Mr. Mason. Aye. Ms. Rice. Aye. Mr. Swanson. Aye. Mr. Twist. Ms. Yana. Aye. President Lee. Um, aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, last one. Um, online School of Arizona. And I believe Rachel, sorry, I don't have my notes up. Yes, Rachel. You're, you're right. It's me. <laughs> All right. Online School of Arizona has submitted a new charter application package to open Online School of Arizona, serving grades 9 through 12 in an online program. The TRP evaluated the application package and determined that the revised application package does not meet the minimum scoring requirements set by the board for the 2021-22 application cycle because the applicant's educational plan scored 94.96% and the business plan scored 88.68%. The applicant scored a 98.97% in the operational plan, which does meet the 95% threshold. After receiving the scoring rubric, the applicant requested to proceed to the capacity interview. Based on the responses and additional information provided by the applicant at the capacity interview, the TRP recommends that the revised application package for the applicant be approved. Additionally, the applicant proposes to open an online school. Therefore, it was required to submit an Arizona online instruction additional information package as a component of its written application package, which met the criteria based on the Rio Salado review. I'm available for questions. Board members, any questions for Rachel? Okay. If not, then can we, do we have a representative who has made it through for, to online school, from online school of Arizona, if you could state your name for the record and um, any statements. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Erin Albert. I'm the president of the board for online school of Arizona. I have several other members with us as well. So we all hung, hung in today. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman and board members all of you for for this long day <laughs> um, but we're very excited to be here 
So first I wanna take some time to introduce um, all of our team. We have our Arizona board members and as well as um, our management team. So um, first myself, so I currently um, am the executive director for marketing services at Grand Canyon Education, servicing Grand Canyon University. I hold an MBA and I have experience across all marketing areas, including brand strategy, comprehensive planning and budgeting, creative direction, marketing automation, social media marketing, just to name a few. I live here in Phoenix. And in addition to myself, I want to introduce the rest of the OSA Arizona team. So we have Laura Hatton, who's a board member, also lives in the Phoenix area. She has several years of experience as an online instructor at the university and charter school level. Laura holds an MBA in finance, a master's in human nutrition, and is in the process of finishing her PhD. Additionally, we have Paul Mendoza, um, who is a board member. He resides in Tucson and is the co-founder of Vibin and Micro Venture Launchpad based here in Arizona. Vibin has worked with a variety of local and national organizations, including Santa Cruz County Superintendent's Office, Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, TV Azteca America Tucson, as well as many others. And he was just recently this morning named uh, top 40 under 40 in Tucson by T Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So we're very proud of him for that. Um, additionally, we have Mitch Horlick. So Mitch is our executive director. He lives in the Phoenix area as well. He's currently an online charter school board president and the former founder and owner of an Arizona healthcare information technology business with extensive leadership, customer service, sales, and partnership experience. And now representing our management team, we have Dr. Tim Wood. He has previously served as a high school principal, district superintendent, college professor at Grand Valley State University. And for the, the eight years prior to joining Next Level, he was the vice president for charter school at GVSU, the state's top academic authorizer, as well as the largest with 74 schools serving 34,000 students. Additionally, he was appointed by Michigan Governor Schneider to the, the state school reform district board, as well as serving on the Michigan Charter Association Board. Um, and last but not least, we have Brooke Druger. So she led Michigan's first nonprofit management company and also started three charter schools, one of which is high poverty and rural in location in West Michigan. She also started a statewide cyber school. Additionally, Brooke has worked in the traditional public school environment as a teacher, curriculum director, and principal. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Brooke to go through um, a few details about OSA. Yes, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for allowing us this time. Um, if you remember correctly, we were before you last year and were asked um, for a charter, and you denied us, and while we were sad about that, you gave us some very, um, specific um, recommendations and advice on how what things to work on and how to move forward if we wanted to um, to apply for another charter. And so we took that advice and um, we now have three Arizona residents who have a passion for at-risk students who are on our governing board. Um, we have boots on the ground. Um, so we now have Mitch Horlick who is our executive director and he is going to oversee all the organizational and compliance aspects of OSA, as well as student retention, recruitment, community partnerships, workforce development, and the professional development. We've retained Lynn Adams um, so that we make sure all our legal um, compliance requirements are met. We are also in discussions with Diamond Financial Solutions, Michelle Diamond, um, who specializes in Arizona um, finance, because we wanna make sure all of our fiduciary responsibilities are met with the utmost transparency. Um, and over the past year, we've really enlisted um, the advice of other experts. So we've been in touch and working with the Charter School Association. Charles Tack has been very helpful to us, as well as other AOI schools. And they've helped us to understand AOIs and the funding that goes along with those, um, compliance, and just the educational landscape here in Arizona. We have two specified locations, Tucson and Phoenix. And we've done, and Mitch will talk about those in just a little bit, but also we've done extensive community engagement over the past year, but specifically since we hired Mitch over the last year. And he has spent um, that time really engaging the community, meeting community partners, 
local schools, and just trying to understand the organizations and communities around us that we will need to wrap our arms around the at-risk students that we really hope to serve. Um, we've added a CT component, and um, Dr. Woods will talk about that in just um, a few moments as well. But we wanted to address those concerns and let you know that we heard those last year, and we worked really hard um, over this past year to really remedy those. So we hope that you saw those in our application, and we appreciate the opportunity to come before you again. Um, Mitch? Thanks, Brooke. Good afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate both the TRP team's uh, uh, review as well as their recommendations uh, as we've moved through this process. As we reviewed our uh, capacity interview, there's a need for me to provide a little clarity and detail about my role as executive director. So a little bit about my background. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've been CEO of Inspire. Uh, we're a technology company that provides web-based incentive motivation and behavioral change solutions. And uh, overall, I have more than 25 years of national sales and management experience in IT and distribution-based distribution businesses. Uh, I've been a member of the Board of Directors for the Blueprint Education Charter School since 2013, and I currently serve as its board chairman. Also, I'm a board member for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, Southwest Chapter. I'm responsible for our, physical, uh, phys uh, our physician partnerships, excuse me, as well as fundraising to help find a cure. Uh, before Inspire, I founded Aztec Consulting Group, which provided recruiting and payroll services for our clients, as well as career counseling and mentoring for uh, job seekers. And I have a bachelor's of business administration with uh, a concentration in economics and public policy from George Washington University. As executive director, I'm gonna be responsible for the organizational and compliance aspects of OSA student retention and recruitment, uh, community partnerships and uh, relationships with CTEs, both in Phoenix and in Tucson, uh, overseeing our professional development, uh, the startup of our current and future uh, learning centers, and basically uh, building the infrastructure to, to make our school successful. So in summary, I'd just like to say, uh, as board chairman of two high school mm -hmm. charter schools, I've learned from the teachers and the principals, management and the students, how a well-run school can affect change to the population we serve. And as a businessman, I understand what it takes to make an organization run effectively uh, and efficiently. And uh, as a leader who's built effective teams that have performed, I'm really excited to bring my knowledge and talents to lead Online School of Arizona, along with our principals, uh, which we call center directors, to create an outstanding school that serves the underserved. And to the extent that I might not have all the knowledge on the academic side, you can be sure that I'm gonna seek it, get it, and team up with other leaders that have it. Thank you. Dr. Wood? Thank you, Mitch. Uh, nice job. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Tim Wood. And thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today. We're very excited about this. In the technical review panel report, they mentioned that one of our schools in Michigan had a failing grade. And this is true. And fortunately, it was not our data. We took over a failing school in 2019. It's Uplift Michigan Online Academy. And after working with the school for a little over a year, we're very pleased with this year's NWA fall data. 88% of our students are within the standard deviation of grade level in reading and 85% in math. So that school is, is, is doing well and trending in the right direction. I'd like to briefly discuss with you our academic program at the Online School of Arizona. As Mitch mentioned, we serve the underserved. Our target population are students who have dropped out, who have been expelled, are homeless, and students who have left the system. Our curriculum is designed to help at-risk students. At OSA, our students will receive a high school diploma and a career and technical education pathway. Our CTE coursework will be presented online. And this is what's unique about our program. We have a, a work-study internship every Friday with industry, labor unions, organizations, guilds, associations, 
And those will all be arranged and managed by our relationship managers at our learning centers that Laura will speak about very shortly. We will provide a clear path for graduation for our kids. Paul? Thank you, Dr. Wood, and thank you for uh, allowing us to be here today. So, and OSA, we understand uh, the need to be able to develop those skills, uh, to be able to have those trade workers that the, every single state needs and wants to develop. So at OSA, we're focused on be able to provide that type of knowledge and curriculum that is gonna be able to elaborate and develop leadership skills, soft skills, and employability skills that are gonna be able to use in the workforce and they can be able to use in the classroom as well. Laura? Thank you. Coursework is available online 24 seven for students to have the flexibility of learning anywhere, anytime and at the student's own individual pace. Regardless of whether students have to work or what their living situation is, they can be successful in school with this flexibility. But it isn't just online. As an online educator for 15 years, I've often found it challenging with some of my students who really needed one-on-one -on -one or even face-to-face -face attention, but I couldn't give it to them. But I knew that if college-age students needed this option, high school-age students would need it even more. At OSA, certified teachers are available online or in person as students require. The advantage to OSA is that they have the best of both worlds, online or in person, at learning centers, one-on-one -on -one learning. Dr. Wood? Thanks, Laura. As Laura mentioned, our learning centers are staffed with Arizona certified teachers who advise, tutor, assist with projects, assignments, tests, daily work, etc. But the most unique component of our model are the relationships we build with our students. Mm -hmm. We tell them something that they haven't heard very often, and that is, we want you to be successful. It's our goal to stop the school to prison pipeline that many of our kids will be heading without a diploma or a skilled trade. Without a diploma or a skilled trade, think about their options. There aren't many. Lastly, each student will receive a computer, a hotspot, and the necessary uh, printed material, and we offer a free summer school to our kids. Thank you. Back to you, Mitch. Thanks, Dr. Wood. Uh, with the help of charter school facility and financing experts, we've identified two learning centers uh, uh, in Phoenix and Tucson. Uh, our centers are going to have a, an open college-like feel with computer workstations and printers, but most importantly, uh, they're going to be a safe study area staffed with Arizona certified teachers, relationship managers, and a center director. Our Phoenix Learning Center will be strategically placed in the Phoenix Union High School District, which serves over 28,000 students, has a dropout rate of 18%. The Tucson Unified School District will be the home to our second learning center. This district serves 47,000 students and has a dropout rate of 15%. Both locations are located near where our prospective students live. They have good accessibility to bus routes and will be available to students that need extra help. Although we are an online school, over the past two years, OSA has been reaching out to the Phoenix and Tucson community extensively. I've been on board executive, as executive director uh, over the past year and uh, have left led our, our, our effort to share our school vision and develop partnerships. Uh, we've made contact with superintendents at career and technical education programs like WestMEC and EVIT. Uh, we made contacts with trade unions such as IBEW, the, uh, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and uh, UA of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. And uh, several of these, uh, these unions have uh, apprenticeship programs that are looking for new workers. Uh, some programs that really help uh, young people connect to uh, local companies are uh, that we've, uh, such as Arizona at Work, Seedspot, and Build.org, we've also met with, and uh, they teach the power of entrepreneurship to students. Finally, uh, we've, we've reached out to area high schools just to let them know that we want to partner, and uh, if they have students that are looking for an alternative, we're there. Brooke? We also wanted to just take a minute to speak to special education and we wanted to um, give you assurance that we plan to follow the rules, the regulations and the guidelines that are outlined under the Individuals with Disabilities Act. 
Um, we plan to hire highly qualified Arizona special education teachers, but also additional necessary personnel to ensure that students receive that pre free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment possible. We know that we need to make sure that METS, IEPs, evaluation, reevaluations, those timelines, those deadlines, and the, the correct process and procedures are followed in accordance not only with IDEA, EA, but Arizona state law. Additionally, we want to make sure that our special education staff is trained to develop and implement those secondary transition plans because we are a 9 through 12th um, grade um, school. We want to make sure that they can implement those once the student reaches the age of eight, or excuse me, 16 or sooner if that's appropriate. Um, but by design, our program is really individualized. So our program works so well with these exceptional students and the implementation of not only their IEPs, but their outcomes and their post-secondary plans. Thank you so much, Erin. Yeah, and lastly, we just wanted to cover um, some details around enrollment and marketing. So as mentioned earlier, the plan is to launch with two locations, one in Phoenix and one in Tucson. Our team has worked to evaluate these two markets and thoughtfully place these locations where we saw the largest need. So our Phoenix location um, at 36th Street Indian School is very well placed. There are no other schools within one mile of this location. Within three miles of this site, there are over 9,700 high school age students. We recognize that there are four high schools, including two traditional high schools and two charters within this vicinity. These four schools have a total of 4,238 students, of which 2.9% go to charters. Our school will have 110 students for this location, which is 1.12% of the possible students in this area. And then to move to our Tucson location, um, we, it will be located just north of Speedway on Elm, which is just east of the U of A campus, which is a very ideal location within the Tucson area. So within one mile, there is one high school with 96 students and a total of 1,000 high school age, age students in that vicinity. Within two miles, there are over 8,800 high school age students and there are a total of six high schools, including one traditional high school with 700 students and five charters with a total of 500 students. Within this two mile radius, charters account for about 5.6% of high school students and our 110 students would account for 1.24% of the total possible high school population um, for this location. So uh, to move on, our marketing and enrollment plan will focus on meeting students where they are. So working with our marketing partners, our plan will focus on grassroots outreach, multiple digital marketing channels, including social media, and work to engage prospective students looking for an alternative high school option. We understand that in our current environment with COVID, there's currently an increase in online participation and that may change. So we built our budget based on a per student ratio in a very conservative way and did not include additional state or federal funding sources. We're prepared to scale back our, our budget expenses if during our enrollment period, we do not hit our budget enrollment goals. And vice versa, if we have, if we have a high level of interest, we have the ability to scale up. Um, and, and just lastly, in closing, we really wanna thank you for allowing us to share this information with you today. The greater team has worked, been working very hard for the past two years to make Online School of Arizona a reality. We took the feedback and suggestions from the board and the TRP very seriously and made substantial changes for this year's application. We feel that we are at a low risk for the board to grant a charter. We have boots on the ground with online school experience and a strong founding board. We are ready to go day one with both of our locations, with staffing and our marketing and enrollment efforts. We have our executive director and community partners such as labor unions, as well as a strong management team backing us in order to ensure success. I can honestly say I've not been part of a more passionate team. We all come from very different backgrounds, but truly share a passion to serve this population of students. Um, our varying backgrounds really do allow for amazing collaboration to ensure we're making smart decisions that will ultimately benefit our students as well as our faculty and staff. So thank you again uh, for your time. I know, I know it's late, um, but let us know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And just in reviewing the board packet um, and just the responses, it, I agree. It, it looks like you guys really kind of took to heart 
just the feedback that we gave you last year. And so I just really appreciate that. You know, a lot of people can get discouraged and um, just kind of throw in the towel, but I appreciate that you guys, you know, I think it was represented in your scores and with the recommendation from the TRP that you really, you know, made those adjust adjustments and are, and um, in my opinion, ready for, for an Arizona, an Arizona school, you know, you, yeah, I appreciate that the name change, the online school of Arizona, right? That's a good note to that. But um, no, I, I think that that's great. Um, board members, are there any um, additional questions or comments? Okay. And if not, is there a motion? Presently, this is Hans. Yep, go for it. Based upon a review of the contents of the portfolio provided for Online School of Arizona and the information provided by representatives of Online School of Arizona during consideration. And given it is within the discretion of the board to approve or deny a charter, I move to approve the application package and grant a charter to Online School of Arizona to establish Online School of Arizona to serve grades nine through 12 using Arizona online instruction with an enrollment cap of 800 in year one, 1,600 in year two, and 2,000 in year three and beyond. Is there a second? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Crockett. <laughs> All right, with the roll call, please. Did we lose? Okay, yeah, thanks, Ashley. I'll do the roll call really quickly. Um, Vice President Close? Aye. Superintendent Hoffman? Aye. Thank you. Dr. Crockett? Aye. Mr. Mason? Justin Rice? Aye. Ms. Yanov? Aye. President Lee? Aye. Uh, board motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Thank, thank you so much. much. Yes. Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate it. We're going to go get something to eat. That's right. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> Bye, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank All you. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. All right. Um, item M and board members, thank you for hanging on. Um, we're going to get through this. Um, item M, Andrea. Good afternoon, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and members of the board. In July 2019, the board implemented its new financial performance framework with the fiscal year 2019 audits. Charter holders assigned an intervention rating under the framework must submit additional information to the board regarding their financial performance, including a June 30 quarterly financial report. Based on the June 30 quarterly report and other available information, staff determines each intervention charter holder's probation status which is either not on probation or on probation. A charter holder that receives an on probation determination does not meet the board's minimum financial performance expectation and is subject to further submission requirements. No further submissions are required for a charter holder that receives a not on probation determination pending staff's review of the charter holder's next audit. Based on the fiscal year 2019 audits, 84 charter holders completed the intervention process. Following the review of the June 30 quarterly reports, 23 charter holders received on probation determinations and were identified as not meeting the board's financial expectations. The board's administrative rules require staff to report to the board at a public meeting the fiscal year 2019 audit performance, and June 30, 2020 quarterly report performance by measure for each of the 23 charters. The meeting materials included the information required by rule for these charters. Because COVID-19 pushed back the fiscal year 2019 single audit and fiscal year 2020 financial statement audit submission deadlines, staff is providing this update today to not further delay the administrative rule requirement. At a subsequent meeting, staff will provide updated information on these charters' financial performance, including the fiscal year 2020 audit performance, if available. Since this is an update to the board, a motion is not required. I am available for questions. Thank you, Andrea. Um, board members, are there any questions? Okay, yeah, none. Thank you, Andrea, for, for your hard work on this. It's, it's much appreciated. You're welcome. Um, okay, going on to item N. Serena. 
Yes, I give me one moment. I'm so sorry. My uh, my camera gets really finicky. So one moment. That's okay. Okay, so sorry about the wait. Um, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, members of the board. The first opportunity for public comment ended on October 21st, 2020 for the proposed rule revisions to update the current complaint policy for more efficient processing of complaints, improve transparency regarding the complaint process for charter holders, complainants, and the general public, and remove references to ASBCS online and as applicable, replace them with more generic references due to possible restructuring of the board's online interface. During the public comment period, the board received six written comments, which have been included with the meeting materials. Board staff is seeking board approval to finalize the proposed rules found in the notice of final exempt rulemaking included with the mater meeting materials. I'm available for any questions. Board members, are there any questions? Um, I just, I really appreciate your guys' work on this. It's always exciting too when we get response from the, you know, just the community partners and, and you guys really took that in and made adjustments um, quickly. Um, so thank you, Serena, for, for spearheading that and, and getting that done. So we appreciate that. Um, and I believe we need to take a motion to adopt this. Is that is that correct, Ashley? Yes, and yes, thank you, Serena. <laughs> yep, okay, so Hans, are you ready? And I didn't hear any questions. So Hans, are you ready with a motion? I'm ready. Go for it. I move I move to approve the notice of final exempt rulemaking hereafter, hereafter referred to as the notice found in the board materials and presented today and direct staff to update paragraph 11 of the notices preamble to reflect today's second opportunity for public comment and to file the notice with the Secretary of State's office for publication. To ensure it's timely publication, the, the board authorizes staff to make any technical or, or formatting changes to the notice as required by the Secretary of State's office. Second. Thank you, Dr. Crockett with a second and roll call, please. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yano? Aye. President Lee? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item, oh, Ashley. Uh, President Lee, Superintendent Hoffman, and board members, uh, the change in charter control amendment request is a new amendment request being considered by the board. This request will be used to change the majority of the individuals with an interest or in or control of the charter contract. The charter contract will transfer to the new ownership leadership as is the existing charter holders history of accountability determinations, non-compliance records and corrective actions will continue with the successor and will be held accountable for all past performance. To offer some additional clarification, the entity in which holds a contract is not changing with this request, but rather the entity is being transferred to new ownership or leadership. Because of this type of change being made to the contract, the change in charter control amendment request requires similar documentation as the board's new charter application. And with that, President Lee, I'm open for any questions. Board members, do you have any questions for Ashley? Okay. Um, 
No, I'm just actually, you know, thank you. I'm, I'm excited for this. I think we've needed this for quite some time. Um, and so I know that this was a lot of work done very quickly. So thank you so much. Um, it looked, looked really, uh, gr great, you know, thorough, but not too, um, not too much. I feel like not too much of a burden for our charter. So thanks for doing that. Okay. And so with that, is there a motion? President Levis Hans. Thanks. I move to approve the creation of a change in charter control amendment as presented in the board materials and presented today and authorize board staff to make any technical or formatting changes to documentation to affect the board's action at this meeting. Second. Thank you. And roll call, please. Vice President Close. Aye. Superintendent Hoffman. Aye. Dr. Crockett. Aye. Ms. Rice. Aye. Ms. Yana. Aye. President Lee. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. All right, guys, we made it. Ashley, if you could sum us up and uh, any future meeting dates. Yeah, so the uh, future meeting dates that we have are, let me just double check, sorry. Um, they are January 11th and February 8th. Perfect. Okay, well, with that, guys, we're going to go ahead and adjourn. Thank you again, board members, for hanging on the whole day. And it was a long one, but, um, but good work. Thanks so much. Thank you.